Toronto, Canada. We are taking our arts to a new people, the Americans. The faces ranged around the large conference table expressed surprise and confusion. To anyone outside that room, this was the annual stockholder meeting of the Shuey Films and Arts Corporation. But it was something else entirely to those present. It was the bid for ultimate power that Lao Shui had been planning for years. His proclamation afforded any of the present members in the Kong Lok Chinese triad the opportunity to dispute his claims. No one did because no one was that foolish. Ying Kao Chu, leader of the Scarlet Dragons, broke the taut silence. <clears throat> we are not artists now. We are warriors, like our ancestors. That is true, and you are our prized possession, our front line of defense and enforcement. Nonetheless, we have monopolized the entertainment industry in Hong Kong, Vancouver, and Toronto. There is nothing left to be had here. We are compelled to seek new forms of revenue, because we are also men of business. Like any business, we must continue to show profits, all kinds of profits. Nobody protested Shuey's observations. As a matter of fact, they were nodding in agreement with him, looking to one another for support and unity. That excited Shuey, because he was speaking the truth. They knew it and believed it. Unity was their most important asset. Without it, the Kung Lok triad had little real power. While the triad controlled the politicians in China, a move that was ostensibly simple after the reversion of urban ownership to the Chinese by the British, there were still issues to be addressed. The Kung Lok influence spread far and wide throughout the world, but the Americans had managed to keep large parts of the triad at arm's length. It was time to change that relationship. We must become more intimate with American money. And why is that so important? It took Shui only a moment to recognize the wary features of Dim Mai, head of the Asian Pacific Arms Theater. Mai had served with the Kung Lok as the major supplier of guns from Mongolia to New Guinea. His operation was one of the largest in the world, and very few guns sold couldn't be traced to Mai as their source. It is important because American money is spent freely, frivolously, and without thought of consequence, particularly in the area I think we should focus. Lights, please. The lights were dimmed by one of Shui's Scarlet Dragon enforcers and bodyguards, on loan from Ying Kao Chu. The screen behind Shui filled with a map of the United States, and the entire southwest region was shaded in red. Major cities from Los Angeles to San Antonio were highlighted with red and yellow dots, the primary colors of the Kung Lok. There were black stars situated on San Diego, Las Vegas, and El Paso. Two things prevail in the American Southwest like nowhere else in the country. Sex and drugs. Both are plentiful, cheap, and popular enough that we can control them with ease. And how do you propose to do this? That is the beauty of this plan and the art. You see, my friends, it has already been done for us. By whom? By the Americans themselves. Chewie raised his finger to signal for attention. We have discovered through our political contacts that a major pipeline has recently opened with an increased demand for heroin and the drug ecstasy has come an increase in profit. The money is already being made. We must simply implement measures to transfer it from the pockets of those making it into our own. And we must do it without their knowing about it. Your plan sounds profitable, but I'm not convinced it is practical in theory. How do you propose to do this? I am glad you asked, my esteemed colleague. The ability to control this situation is dependent on mutual cooperation. We already have the cooperation of our own people in China, namely our political friends, who have solicited cooperation from certain officials within the American government. This will provide culpability of others should anything go wrong. And then? The drugs are already present, or at least the raw materials. With the assistance of Ying and, of course, yourself, Mai, we should have no trouble protecting our assets. We must ensure that our involvement is swift, decisive, and ultimately ambiguous enough to escape detection. The Kong Lok is well known by American law enforcement for gang-related activities, but this is something I do not think on which they will count. The American police are many. We are few. 
And that is precisely how we will accomplish our goals with invisibility. Your people must be like shadows, something that is already within the realm of your specialization. You do not foresee this to be a burden on my resources? Of course not. That is because your task is strictly administrative. There will be little need for open violence. Of this, I am certain. The suppliers and distributors in America are known for their history of eliminating competition for the sake of self-preservation. When this is done, we will simply move in at an appropriate time and acquire the goods. As I have alluded, you see, the work has already been done. You have discussed your angle on the drug products. You have not described the angle on sex. Sex is for sale where drugs are for sale. We have already reaped tremendous profits from our export sales to both the legitimate and underworld American markets. The demand for films and DVDs is at an all-time high, regardless of the sexual content. The mixture of drugs and sex has proven to be profitable before, and it will once again. Whites, blacks, and Hispanics in the southwestern U.S. will pay heavy prices for such graphic and explicit material. The addition of drugs creates a parity of astounding magnitude and will prove more than equitable to our overhead. Shui paused a moment to let his words have effect. He had always prided himself on his eloquence. His ability to woo others with his words and grandiose speeches was renowned throughout the Kong Lok society. Yet at the same moment, he could be obtusely brutal toward the competition. It was these traits that had elevated him to his present stature as self-proclaimed leader of the Kong Lok Triad in the West. No one on this side of the world would have dared oppose his authority. The others seated in the room were influential and extremely powerful in their own right, to be sure. But none of them wielded the power in North America like Shui. He knew that, and so did they. His plan would have sounded preposterous and been taken as an insult anywhere else. Not here and not in this setting. All members of the Kong Lok Triad considered such behavior unethical. It was truly an organization that believed in honor and heritage over personal gain, and Shui was proud to be part of it. All of these sounds good. However, I find myself skeptical about your methods now. I would like to hear more about how exactly you plan to do this. Of course. Allow me to explain how we shall take our art to the Americans. Brownsville, Texas. Mac Bolin was rigged for war. He lay in the weeds on top of a small hill that overlooked an abandoned parking lot, dressed in his black suit, his face smeared by combat cosmetics. An LBE harness supported several tools of his trade, including M26 grenades. A Beretta 93R was holstered in shoulder leather, and a 44 Magnum Desert Eagle hung in leather at his right hip. A Heckler & Koch PSG-1 was set up on a bipod, locked and loaded. The highly precise bolt-action sniper rifle came with a 6x42 scope and was chambered in 7.62mm NATO ammunition. The soldier loved this rifle for its versatility and accuracy, an invaluable combination in his line of work. It also used an illuminated graticule in the scope, which made it perfect for this operation. One thing had brought the executioner to Brownsville drugs. He had fought many battles to keep them off the streets of America, but this particular mission held importance because it was affecting kids. They called it ecstasy, a.k.a. Adam, or XTC, and it was taking American youth by storm. Intelligence had it that Brownsville was one of the major entry ports for 3,4-MDMA, the major synthetic ingredient used by meth labs to manufacture the stuff. Once it was cooked and distributed, it brought many of the risks of cocaine or amphetamines, an epidemic quickly finding its way into schools and gangs across the nation. The executioner was going to close this pipeline by utilizing a tried-and-true weapon in America's arsenal, the Bolin Blitz. Up to this point, both the DEA and Border Patrol had been helpless against the onslaught of ecstasy. It didn't just bring death to America. It also brought pornography, white slavery, guns, and violence. The profit the drug generated was high enough that the dealers would go to considerable lengths to get 3-4 MDMA into the states and even further to protect their investment. Well, they were in for a surprise tonight. 
Bolin lowered the night vision goggles as truck headlights swung into the parking lot and winked off. The soldier set the NVDs aside and drew up closer to the PSG-1. He put his cheek to the stock and removed the lens caps from the scope. A flick of the switch, and the night was lit in a brilliant gray-green through the viewfinder. Bolin could see two men seated in the cab of the truck, one of them smoking a cigarette. The pinpoint glow increased in intensity as the passenger inhaled deeply. After a few moments, the smoker climbed from the cab and left his compadre behind the wheel. He was dark-haired, probably Hispanic, although it was difficult for Bolin to tell from his position almost 100 yards away. The sound of additional car engines reached the executioner's ears and he lifted his head just above the scope to view the arrivals. A pair of light gray BMWs. It looked as if all of the players were in the game and Bolin returned to the scope to get a better view of the other half of this transaction. Two hard cases dressed in suits and toting machine pistols emerged from the first sedan and approached the truck passenger. The guy raised his arms for a quick frisk. Bolin took a moment to study the hardware. Finnish made Jatimatics. They fired 9mm parabellum rounds, weighed less than 5 pounds, and had folding forward grips and 30 round magazines. They were the perfect weapons for those in the business of dealing death. Bolin took a deep breath and let out half as he sighted on the first gunman. He'd take out the guys with the grease guns first, the truck driver, and then the passenger. That way, the drugs wouldn't go anywhere before he had a chance to neutralize the vehicle. Any additional troops in the BMWs he could deal with on a first-come, first-served basis. The few seconds of panic allowed him to align his sights on the second hard case. The guy took the round high in the chest before lights suddenly flooded the parking lot. Bolin pulled away from the night scope, closing the eye that had been flooded with a bright haze and opening the other. A massive agent's gladdened body armor rushed the meeting area, the back of their vests adorned with bright yellow letters that read DEA. Eight more gunners poured from the BMWs, rushing from the vehicles like cockroaches and taking up firing position. Fuck. The executioner killed the infrared scope and then sighted on the passenger who was trying to climb into the truck while obviously yelling at his cohort that they should get the hell out of there. The passenger now turned to look through the windshield, seemingly uncertain from where the offending rounds had come. Bolin used the momentary lapse to take down the drug pusher. With that finished, Bolin abandoned his weapon, drew the Desert Eagle, and burst from cover. He sprinted down the hill to join the melee, already well in progress. Take cover! Take cover! Agent Lisa Riero dropped to the asphalt and rolled away from the gunfire directed at her. She brought her MP5 submachine gun to bear and returned the fire of one of the bodyguards protecting the real target. The strangest thing was that it didn't appear as if their quarry were attempting to escape. They were actually standing, making a fight, and that surprised Rayero. Perhaps they had more to lose than she had originally thought. Rayero also wondered if the drug dealers actually had a fighting chance. Despite the body armor, two more of her men fell under headshots. Rayero grimaced as she jumped to her feet and raced for the cover of the truck that was supposedly carrying several hundred pounds of 3,4-methylene-dioxymethamphetamine, the primary ingredient in ecstasy. She was just nearly diving for cover when a large hand grabbed her and pulled her off track. Her body continued in a circle and she was slammed against the back of the truck. It wasn't hard enough to harm, and it was certainly better than the alternative. Rayero turned and glanced at the profile of her saving angel. He still had one hand on her shoulder, his own back pressed to the tailgate of the two-and-a-half-ton truck. She shrugged away his hand. Who the hell are you? No time to explain. Bolin risked a glance around the corner, then jumped onto the tailgate and took a quick look inside. He got down, his face a mere shadow in the lights of the parking lot, and yanked one of the grenades from his web belt. He gestured at a fence generator and a stack of pallets. On my count, you head for the back of that store. Who do you think you are? I'm the agent in charge of this operation. You were in charge. Your move should draw enough fire from the others and still provide good cover. Now go before you lose every man you've got out here. Rayero bent her lip, fighting further protests as she nodded her understanding. The man yanked the pin. Take off! The agent burst from the back of the truck, 
firing the MP5 one-handed as she ran for the stacked pallet. Even as she reached the pallet, auto fire raked the area around her. She dived behind cover and then turned to look for her benefactor, but he was no longer behind the truck. The vehicle erupted into a fireball as the highly explosive chemicals went up in flames. The exploding truck created the brief moment of surprise and pandemonium for which he had hoped. The executioner risked exposure just long enough to kneel and draw a solid bead on the closest enemy gunman. Boland took the next gunman in a similar fashion, then rolled away from a hail of bullets triggered by two others. One of the DEA agents apparently felt he had a chance. He burst from the cover of a steel garbage dumpster and returned fire. The last two hard cases jumped into the rearmost BMW. The sedan backed away from the carnage, gaining about 100 feet before the driver put it into a J-turn and rocketed away from the scene. The driver of the other sedan leaped from his vehicle and put his hands in the air. On the ground! Hands behind your head! Now! Several DEA agents rose from the pavement and rushed forward to take the wheelman into custody. They were seemingly ignorant of the executioner, who decided it was time to split. Poland made a quick estimate as he retreated and realized that many of the DEA agents had fallen under enemy fire. If they had just let him handle this, it wouldn't have gone sour. The soldier could only assume that they had been on to this deal from the start, probably having spent months to gather the same intelligence he'd solicited with one phone call. That was the most important element in Boland's war. It was what separated him from law enforcement. The executioner had resources that the DEA and FBI couldn't even begin to comprehend, much less more covert agencies such as the CIA or NSA. He also didn't have to operate within the rules of fair play. Members of sanctioned groups couldn't just shoot first and ask questions later. He didn't have to operate within the parameters of the law, and so much the better. Nonetheless, Bolin understood the reason for rules, and he respected anyone who could operate under those rules. That didn't mean he had license to just go out and waste everyone who looked at him sideways. He wouldn't have done that even if he was able. And that was the difference between any psychopath with a gun and the executioner. Bolin did what he did out of duty. And the way he saw it, he had a new duty. To find out who had been on the receiving end of the shipment and left nearly a half dozen good men lying dead in that parking lot. At about 10 a.m. the following morning, Lisa Rayero was leaving the Brownsville, Texas DEA office when she encountered the tall stranger on the steps leading from the building. I ought to arrest you. Good to see you, too. She turned away and continued down the steps onto the sidewalk. The executioner had to take longer than normal strides to keep up with her. It was much easier to appreciate her good looks in contrast to the body armor and fatigue she'd been wearing last night. She had long brown hair with eyes to match. She wore a pink blouse and a white denim skirt that rode just above shapely calves. I'd like to explain, if you'd slow it down a minute. Yes, well, you're about 20 minutes late. What do you mean? She stopped in the middle of the sidewalk and whirled to face him. I mean that I just barely got out with a three-day suspension and part of my ass missing. No thanks to the fact that you couldn't even bother to show up and verify my story. If it hadn't been for a couple of my own guys doing the stand-up thing, I probably would have lost my job. The chief here is just looking for a reason to get rid of me. It wouldn't have been a good idea for me to do that. Oh, really? Really. Where's your utility belt with all the hardware, Batman? I left it in the Batcave. Listen, I'd like to talk to you. You're talking to me now. No, let's find someplace quieter. I'll buy you breakfast. She turned from him and continued down the sidewalk. I don't eat breakfast, but I know where you can get a hell of a good cup of coffee. Where's that? To his surprise, the executioner found her place, a spacious studio apartment, quite comfortable, and only a 15-minute walk from where she worked, which was convenient. She put on a pot of coffee and then sat down with him at the small table in the dinette. All right, you got 15 minutes. Is that the going price for the life of a DEA agent? Hey, let's get something straight. I did my job the best I knew how, and it wasn't my damn fault anyway. Metzger promised me backup, and then he didn't come through. Then the dumbass threatens to lock me up because he thinks I'm making up this whole thing about you showing up and ruining the gig. Not to mention the fact that the whole damn shipment went up. 
A ton of evidence gone, no thanks to you. I needed a diversion. At the cost of helping us make our case? Those guys were only the tip of the iceberg, and you know it. Well, maybe so, but they could have led us to... Nowhere. So let's put it to rest. The only reason any of you are alive is because it was more important for them to give whoever was behind this deal a chance to split. If they'd wanted to, they could have brought plenty more guns down on us than they did. How do you know? Because it's my business to know. Just like I know who you are. Lisa Marie Rajero, age 36. You joined the USMC at 17 and did six years as an MP before resigning and attending college. You hold a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry which led you to biochemical consultation with the DEA, then eventually a position as a field agent. Your specialties are heroin and amphetamines of any kind. You've blown some major drug labs wide open posing as a chemist, and your work in the field has earned you several high marks, as well as a handful of commendations. Rayero didn't say anything, but stared hard at Bolin for some time. She finally rose and poured each of them a cup of coffee. The stuff was mud, to say the least. But Bolin wasn't about to complain. He'd had a lot worse, some of which he'd made himself. So you know a lot about me. I still don't know anything about you. And we should keep it that way. Can you at least tell me if you're with the DEA? Not exactly. You're part of the Internal Affairs Division then, right? Damn it, I knew they were looking at me. <laughs> no. No one from DEA is looking at you. I'm on my own. Freelancer? Of a sort. So how is it you got turned on to my operation? I used to work for the government, once. On occasion, I still do favors. But this one is strictly freelance. Yeah. Any idea who was behind that shipment? Maybe. Why do you want to know? Uh, the same reason you do. There's entirely too much ecstasy on the streets lately. It's filling the morgues faster than we can count the bodies. I'm tired of watching others make money from the death of our youth. American kids have enough to worry about today without adding drugs to the equation. My intelligence tells me there's a pipeline coming through Brownsville. I'm here to close the valve. <laughs> In that case, you're up for a fight. What do you mean? We're not just up against the drugs. We're also up against people who will go to any lengths to protect their product. The one behind the dope itself is a man named Jose Carrillo. Have you ever heard of him? The one they call Ponchos? Uh-huh. Yeah, I've heard of him. I've even tangled with some of his people on occasion. So he's the one pushing this stuff through? Oh, yes. But he's not doing it alone. Our informants tell us that he's operating in conjunction with several other parties. We know one of the parties is south of the border and supplying Cadrillo with the weapons and manpower necessary to protect the shipments. Mexican mafia? Possibly. Although they've managed to latch on to some pretty heavy hardware. Did you notice anything unusual about the weapons carried by our friends last night? Yeah, they look like automatics. Exactly. Weapons made in Finland, and yet here, in bulk. We've made other busts in the recent past along this area of the border, and there have been some strange similarities in the weapons department. Everything from Styres to FMKs, and even AR-15s and M-16s. Which means someone bought them on the black market. That usually means large cash deals. With the risks to get that kind of hardware into the country, it's not going to be for a few bucks here and there. These arms dealers will only risk large shipments because there's no money in piecemeal sales. Ooh, looks like you've done your homework. I try to keep up. Several team members who are in my corner promised they would begin a concerted effort to trace those firearms recovered at the busts. I don't know if we'll get anywhere with them, but it'll be a start. And possibly bring you one step closer to finding out who else is involved. Precisely. It did seem strange to the executioner that there was such a variance in the weaponry. He began to consider the fact that Rayero might actually be on to something. So many different weapons caches could only suggest one of two things, terrorists or a paramilitary group. That left countless groups in Central and South America that might stand something to gain by assisting Carrillo. But there was still a piece of the puzzle missing. You mentioned some other parties that might be working with Carrillo. Yes, we think that he has someone on the inside of the DEA or the Border Patrol. I'd like to think the latter, but one can only hope. If there's someone dirty inside my organization, they're higher up than me and they're damn good at covering their tracks. Time will tell. Yeah. Already? Okay, that sounds real good, Pete. No. She looked at Bolin. No, don't do anything with the information right now. That's right, you heard me. Just sit on it. 
I'll get back to you when I know something. Don't worry about it, Pete. You know, you worry too much. It's less likely they'll be watching me now that Metzger suspended me. Just hang tight, and I'll be back in touch. Oh, and Pete, don't talk to anyone else about this. Got it? Yeah, thanks. She smiled at the executioner triumphantly. I dig it you got a break. You bet your ass we did. One of my people managed to trace that gun off a ballistics match for a murder committed less than three weeks ago. You'll never guess where the hit went down. Where? El Paso. The executioner nodded. El Paso was as good a place to start as any. Chihuahua, Mexico. Jose Pancho's Carrillo gently set the antique telephone receiver into its cradle and then slammed his fist on the table. He tried to contain his anger, but he simply couldn't suppress the quiver of hatred and loathing that ran through his lithe, athletic figure. Beads of sweat formed on his face and soaked the collar of his yellow polo shirt. He took several deep breaths, shoved his hands into the pockets of his tailored khaki slacks, then turned and left his study. He crossed the room and walked through the open double doors onto the veranda of his home. The Hacienda-style mansion overlooked the deep Rio Grande Valley surrounding the city of Ciudad Juarez. This was his city. The fact that it bordered El Paso, an Americanized version of the gorgeous metropolis, was a small price to pay. After all, this unusual relationship had profited him so greatly. Ciudad Juarez sat more than 3,500 feet above sea level at the intersection of three major highways. Known as the twin cities of the border, the two urban sprawls shared an equal affinity for transportation as a main source of revenue. Whether it was by truck, rail, or waterway, the economy prospered on both sides of the border from the transport of goods and services. Sometimes those goods and services weren't wholly legal, if at all. But Carillo had founded his empire on this fact. Carillo had begun his career as a mule, slipping unmolested between the two cities, first carrying marijuana and other items of smaller value, and eventually graduating to cocaine and heroin. Born and orphaned in Chihuahua, and raised by Ciudad Juarez's mean streets, Carrillo learned how to survive and prosper. Searching for a better life in the U.S. had never been one of his aspirations. He'd never considered crossing the Rio Grande and not returning. Part of the thrill had been the chase itself, evading dope-sniffing dogs and border patrol agents. He'd been caught once and deported back to Mexico, although not before making his delivery. It was actually an easy process. The INS had made it so, to pose as a poor Mexican alien searching for a better life. It was a role to which he was well suited. And now he stood on the brink of an unprecedented alliance with the Colombian revolutionaries. Carrillo took another deep breath of the humid air, and it made him feel only a little better. A quarter million in street value had gone up in smoke, the reason for the phone call. And now he was left without even a trace return on his investment in the stuff that had gone into Brownsville. It seemed his contacts in the DEA hadn't been privy to the fact he was making the shipment, and now he didn't have so much as a dime in profit for what had proved a very profitable area in the past. So what the hell was he paying Zapatas all of that money for? To sit on his sorry ass while hundreds upon thousands of dollars of his profit went up in flame? Not to mention the loss of two of his most reputable and trusted mules. In some sense, Carrillo was equally puzzled by the events in Brownsville. His contacts had spoken of a sniper and the use of heavy explosives to destroy the shipment. That didn't sound like typical DEA tactics especially considering that the destruction of the shipment was also a loss of hard evidence. Yes, that had him very disturbed, but he couldn't let on to his guest, whose arrival was pending, what had taken place. He had to keep quiet long enough to find out who had betrayed him. He had to discover where the leak was at and plug it once and for all. It wouldn't do for Nevas to find out. Carrillo observed the arrival of an inconspicuous wreck of a car that had stopped at the front gate and was awaiting permission to enter. Carrillo smiled with satisfaction. It was good to let the new arrivals wait. He didn't want to seem anxious, but the truth of the matter was that he was very excited. This newly formed alliance with the Colombians was already turning out as one of the best things he'd ever contrived, not to mention what it would do for his reputation. None of the other dons would dare oppose him now. 
It was as if the rich aristocrats of 19th century California had returned. The beater car began to make its way up the long circular drive, which was flanked by gardens. Carrillo whirled and walked purposefully but unhurried through the house. As he descended the wide spiral staircase of his mansion, three of his bodyguards snapped to attention at his appearance, two toting machine pistols on shoulder slings. His chief enforcer and personal assistant, Conrado Diaz, wore a 40 caliber semi-auto pistol in shoulder leather. Carrillo still carried a pistol himself, a little Taurus 380 in an ankle holster. He'd learned at a very young age that one couldn't be too careful. He was considered a dangerous man, but he was also a wanted man, and it was his money and reputation for hard-nosed business that kept the Mexican police and U.S. federal agents at bay, thus the nickname Panchos. He had no false sense of security or invulnerability. Carrillo had survived this long by being careful and seizing the advantage when it seemed easy for the taking. He wasn't about to let his guard down by thinking that 20 or 30 men on the grounds were adequate protection. Anybody could be hit if the hitters wanted it badly enough. Diaz opened the door and stood aside to let his men accompany Carrillo onto the porch, the roof of which served as the base of the veranda Carrillo had stood on a minute earlier. Carrillo threw up his hands in welcome as the visitor emerged from the old rust bucket. It was the first time that Carrillo had ever set eyes on the man in the flesh. His name was Colonel Amado Nilas, and he was the leader of one of the most powerful insurgent organizations ever assembled against a South American government. The Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, FARC, was perhaps one of the best equipped and trained fighting forces ever established. It had begun as a pro-Soviet army in 1964, growing exponentially to a force that now exceeded 15,000 active members. In addition to its attacks against foreign and domestic Colombian targets, primarily dignitaries and politicians, it was extensively involved with narcotics traffickers. It provided protection, cultivation, manufacture and transport of drugs. It worked cheap, thrived on spreading terror, and was in need of continuous financial support from outside sources. Seeing an opportunity, Carrillo had moved on that need. Colonel Nieves, welcome to this, my humble abode in a jungle paradise. Mine is yours, mi casa su casa. Nieves stepped forward and studied Carrillo a moment in a stiff, perfunctory manner. The Mexican had only seen pictures of the man in uniform, and he looked taller and more astute in these. In actuality, however, he was much shorter than Carrillo had imagined. But there was no mistaking the tough, leathery skin and dark, piercing eyes. He had a clipped mustache that dipped past the corners of his mouth, and wrinkles lined his eyes and forehead. A pert nose jutted from his dark skin, but his chin was square and strong. Carrillo could see Nivas had a mind and body hardened by fighting in the harshest, most inhospitable, and most unforgiving environment on earth, the jungle. After a long and stern appraisal, a faint smile broke Nivas's granite-like features. It is indeed a pleasure to meet you face to face at last, comrade. Nivas reached out and grabbed Carrillo by the neck, touching either cheek to his new ally before anyone knew what was happening. The guards stepped forward immediately, reaching for their machine pistols, and the driver came out of the car, SMG in hand, rushing to get in front of Nivas to protect his own master. What is wrong with you? Put down your weapons. Colonel Nielas is my guest, and you will treat him with the respect you treat me, or you will not live to see sunset. I am very afraid it was my fault. I should have warned you of the custom of my people. You have nothing to apologize for, Colonel. Carrillo stared daggers at Diaz and the other guards. Trust is the foundation on which we should and must build our partnership. I am completely in agreement. I would like to show you the rest of the estate, and then we may enjoy some refreshment and discuss our business. Nivas whispered something to his assistant, who perfunctorily saluted, and then he followed Carrillo into the mansion. Carrillo ushered Nivas into a dining area that looked onto the rear grounds. Levels of gardens, fed by stone-lined fountains, terminated at a central rock-bottom pond. Multicolored fish swam there, fed by insects, worms, and other morsels dredged from the continuous flow of water. A steamy haze covered the entire area, but not so much that the brilliant oranges, reds, and purples of exotic flowers didn't come through crisp and bright under the noonday sun. Ah, veritable paradise, just as you described it. I was born to live here. 
I will die here. A seemingly macabre statement, Don Carrillo. Under the circumstances, of course. Please, you may call me Jose. And me, Amado. It is truly a pleasure to have you here, Amado. I have so longed to meet you. Word of your exploits reaches even this part of the world. Really? I was under the distinct impression that our struggle against the Colombian government was an old story. Old, true, but not forgotten. Your struggle represents everything that is right about the quest for freedom, and everything that is upside down about democracy and politics. Hey, you take a strange viewpoint for a man who is brought up in a democratic bureaucracy. Yes, a bureaucracy that has brought nothing but hatred and dissension among its people. Do you know why my country is so poor, Colonel? It is because of the crass democracy in which we live. The government taxes everything, steals everything, in other words, from the people who most rightly deserve it. What I do in my work tends to return some of that wealth to the people. I want to restore the glory of Mexico when it was at the height of its potential. I want freedom from repressive laws and governmental interference, just as you do from yours. Thus, there are parts of my struggle that could be paralleled with those of your own. And there are parts that I feel are just as important. My dear Jose, you will compare the struggles of the Carrillo family with those of the People's Revolutionary Forces? Only as an allegory, never out of disrespect. Carrillo sat forward. That is why I called you here. I know that you need more support, particularly in the area of weapons and demolitions. I, on the other hand, need support from a more practical aspect. I need protection for my shipments. That is why I think we could help each other, Amado. I have a plan that will astound you. When you have heard what I have to say, you will find it very hard to turn me down. Then perhaps you should indulge me. When my former employer was eliminated by competing families, without reason or justification, I made the realization that one does not survive in my world without friends and allies. Powerful allies, to be certain. I am persuaded you have come to understand this as well. I do. It occurred to me that the single most important factor in profitability falls back on the laws of supply and demand. The demand in America for drugs is higher than it has ever been. The very fabric of economics in my business is built on who can efficiently supply the highest quality product in a fast and inexpensive manner. In the past, various competitors have cornered this market because of their ability to distribute large quantities through multiple channels. I, my friend, am now in the position to do such a thing. With your assistance, I can control the entire pipeline between America and my own country. And if I were to supply you with this assistance, what is my reward? You are in desperate need of firepower to continue your struggle, Jace. Of course. I can supply you with that as well. America is a veritable gold mine of weapons. There are numerous military suppliers in the market, not to mention those weapons that come from the outside by other means. The idea of guns for drugs and vice versa is not a new concept. In controlling the borders, I can just as easily pipeline weapons into Mexico as I can the drugs into America. Do you see? Nivas took a long sip of his tea and set the glass gently on the table. He looked outside onto the rich, colorful foliage and fauna spreading across the grounds. Carrillo could tell the wheels were turning inside of the head of his Colombian ally. It was a tremendous deal, and the very concept sold the idea itself. The magnitude of such an operation might have seemed spurious to most, but not to a great man like Nivas, and certainly not to an ambitious builder of fortune such as Carrillo. What you propose is not. However, it is a much riskier venture for my people than for yours. Nor if you look at the bigger picture, Amado. What do you mean? Let us pretend you do not wish to take me up on my offer, for which I would not begrudge you this even a moment. You would still be tasked with protecting your own investment, irrespective of the source of the guns. The beauty of what I'm proposing lies in the fact that I have already gone to great lengths to protect my investment. A considerable amount of funds has already been put into the hands of those in the American government who have conspired with me for the sole purpose of finding their own fortune. How much money? Two and a half billion dollars. Niva sat in stony silence. They are blinded by greed. And that, Jose, is what makes them so dangerous. Perhaps. But I would remind you that it is also what makes them beholden to us. We smuggle drugs, and I pay the American authorities to look the other way. In return, they get what they wish, and I bring back firearms while they continue to look the other way. The other half of the money is being supplied by the arms dealers and distributors. It requires nothing more from you than the support and manpower to do it. And to deter any competition? That might be part of the game, but it will still hold true in any respect. 
the difference here, my friend, is that you will control your own destiny and that of your cause. I control it now. Ah, but you are still faced with a crisis. You are being shorted and ripped off by those who have gained your trust. They continue to skyrocket the price for your freedom. Ivas glanced at Carillo out of a corner of his eye. I have done my homework, you see. I know that you continue to pay more and get less. Here too can pay nothing and I can still give you everything. More supplies and munitions than you will ever know what to do with. It is a tempting offer. <laughs> you are a forked tongue devil, I think. You know it is true what I say. Nivas rose to signify that the meeting had ended. I must consult with my advisors. I will require a telephone and complete privacy. Of course. The grounds and facilities here are at your disposal. Excellent. As he turned to leave, he stopped and looked at Carillo. You would not violate my trust by listening to my conversations, would you? As I have said before, Amaro, trust is the foundation on which we must build our partnership. <laughs> then I would take that as a no. Border Patrol Chief Ramon Cepedas was walking on air. The deal was being finalized today, and before anybody knew what had happened, he would be sunning himself on some forgotten tropical beach, sipping champagne and toasting his own ingenuity. That was if he could get rid of the dark-haired stranger who now sat across from his desk and watched him with cold blue eyes. There was something frightening about this man. He carried himself with an air of calm authority that was rare in men. Sapedas didn't like him the moment they shook hands, and now the big guy who called himself Mike Belasco of the DEA was asking some very pointed questions that the Border Patrol chief didn't really feel like answering. Perhaps the air this guy carried wasn't authoritative as much as it was impertinent. Well, whatever the hell it was, Sapedas didn't like it. Who was it that you said sent you here again, Belasco? Charlie Metzger. He's head of the DEA office in Brownsville. Ah, no, Charlie. As a matter of fact, he's a friend of mine. I'm just a little surprised he didn't call ahead of time to let me know you'd be here. He had to go to Washington at the last minute. I see. Well, the guy seemed harmless enough, but Poncho's was paying him quite a bit of money to keep the DEA from nosing around. There was something that Cepedas didn't quite understand about this whole deal, though. Some of the cash he'd seen was being funneled to other officials in different areas. He was certain someone higher up in the DEA was on the payroll, definitely higher than Metzger or this Belasco clown. He'd have to let Carrillo know what was what and get some of the heat out of his backyard. So, what brings you to my neck of the woods? Guns, primarily. What about them? Sapedas tried to maintain a nonchalant expression and not squirm in his chair. It was those damn eyes, and if this guy would just quit scrutinizing him like a specimen under a microscope, he might be able to lie his way out of this one. There was a murder committed here two weeks ago. Somebody hit a known drug pusher and then disappeared. This is El Paso, guy. Drug pushers get whacked on a daily basis here. You want to try and be more specific? Bolin pulled out a small pad of paper, glanced at it briefly, then put it away. The victim was Randy Lovato, age 29. He was a member of the Rosara's crime organization. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. But my people didn't have anything to do with that. You need to talk to the FBI on that one, Belasco. We're strictly in the business of nab them and ship them back, if you know what I'm saying. We don't get involved too much in the organized crime part of this game. No, but your team was the first to arrive there and take possession of the murder weapon. It was a drive-by shooting, and the reports say you checked the weapon into evidence. What's your point? My point is that the weapon turned up in a major drug bust that went sour the night before last. It was a machine pistol, Finnish made, and not legal for import. It killed quite a few of our people before we brought down the user. Since your guys checked it into evidence, we'd like to know how you could explain it being back on the streets. As far as I know, it's still in evidence. Unless the FBI came and got it later, I don't keep track of everything that goes into and out of my station, Belasco. I don't have time. Now, if you're accusing me of something, perhaps we should take this up with Metzger. Otherwise, I would suggest you talk to the boys in Washington about this and keep the Border Patrol out of it. You guys are always trying to make us take a bite out of the shit sandwich. Well, you ain't gonna do it in my jurisdiction. You got that? The big man stood up and leaned forward on Cepedas' desk. Last time I looked, we were all on the same team. Keep that in mind the next time someone comes and asks for a little cooperation. 
Otherwise, those people you're calling an enemy may not be there to scratch your back when you need them. Go talk to the FBI, Belasco, and stay out of my face, will you? Don't bet on it. Bolin turned and left the office. Zepeda sat in contemplation for a minute or two, then picked up the phone and dialed an unlisted number in Mexico. Tell the man I need a meeting. ASAP. Mac Bolin was at a payphone, a half block from the Border Patrol building, watching the front doors as he talked with Lisa Rayero. It's me. How did it go? About the way I figured. Do you think he knows something about the guns? Of course. But he's not about to tell me anything. What did he say? Bolin paused a moment, trying to decide if it was a good idea to tell her. From one perspective, he still didn't have any real reason to trust her. It was entirely possible she was on Jose Carrillo's payroll and doing everything she could to throw him off track. Somehow, though, his instincts were telling him differently. He couldn't buy Rayero being in bed with the Mexican mob. Something about that idea just didn't wash. He's blaming the FBI, of course. Claims because it was an OC hit that they're the ones in charge of this thing. That's very possible. You want me to look into it? No. I don't want you to make a move on that for the same reason I wouldn't let you tag along. I'm suspicious someone's watching you. Then that means someone's watching you. I can handle myself. Just stay cool and I'll be in touch again when I need something more. <laughs> like to keep your women at home, barefoot and pregnant, eh? Aha. Uh -huh. No, I like to keep them alive. Bye. Brugnola. Stryker. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Where are you? In Texas. I've got something serious cooking down here. Something that started out simple and got a lot more complicated. <laughs> That's usually the way it goes with you. I suppose. Look, I need you to give me some information. I may be out of touch for a while, but you can expect a callback for this. Talk to me. First, I need all of the intelligence you can get on Jose Pancho's Carrillo. Carrillo of the Mexican drug cartel? If what I was told recently is true, he practically is the cartel now, Hal. I took down a shipment last night that had Carrillo's paw prints all over it, according to the DEA. Which brings me to another little favor. Pull what you can on Ramon Cepitas, chief of the Border Patrol troop in El Paso. How does a Border Patrol figure into this? I don't know yet. Bolin glanced at the front of the building. Zapatas was descending the stairs. The executioner watched him as he crossed the busy street, maneuvering between the cars of angry drivers and then disappeared inside an underground parking garage. I'm going to have to see how this plays out. Just have Barb and Bear get on it, and I'll touch base again. Will do. Anything else you need, you call me, Striker. Bet on it. Out. Olin trotted quickly to a convertible he had parked in an empty space across from the Border Patrol building. He climbed behind the wheel, then adjusted his rearview mirror so he could see the exit ramp of the parking garage. A BP sedan appeared a moment later and the executioner caught a clear glimpse of Zapatas behind the wheel. He waited for the guy to drive past, ducking in his seat to make sure he wasn't seen, then shifted gears and edged into traffic a few car lengths back. Bolin knew he would have to be cautious. After all, the guy was a cop and could probably pick out a tail with relative ease. Underestimating an opponent was something the executioner learned could be fatal. He followed Zapatas as he headed south, watching his side and rearview mirrors for anyone who might pose a threat. The Border Patrol chief got on the I-25 interchange that would take him to Mexico 45. He was probably bound for Ciudad Juarez. Bolin began to consider this new turn of events. There was no question in his mind now that Zapatas was headed to meet whoever it was that pulled the strings. If his theory proved correct, and the lawman was dirty, then he'd apparently apply just enough pressure to cause Zapatos to panic. That was what he was hoping for. The thing that had Bolin most puzzled was the connection between the illegal guns and drugs. Dope running was Carrillo's line of business, and Bolin couldn't figure where the guns came into that deal. It was feasible that Carrillo was trading drugs for guns, but the hardware used by the guys in his last encounter wasn't there in quantity for a trade. Maybe the money from the drugs was being used to purchase the weapons. Although that didn't make any more sense than the first theory. There was no shortage of black market arms in Mexico. If Carrillo was trading drugs for guns, why not do it in his own territory instead of risking the transaction in the States? Was Carrillo doing it to prevent any connection between him and the guns? 
That was possible, but not probable, and Bolin was frustrated that he couldn't find a reasonable answer. He was certain of one thing, though. There was more to this than met the eye, and the executioner couldn't help but wonder just how big this thing was. As they passed through the border checkpoint and entered Ciudad Juarez city limits, the hair stood on the back of his neck. Something in the warrior's sixth sense, something elusive and dark, began to tingle in his subconscious. He focused on every nuance of his immediate surroundings, even while he kept one thought on Cepeda's vehicle ahead of him. They were still on Mexico 45, a divided four-lane highway, maybe two miles from the checkpoint. Bolin realized there was trouble a moment before he actually spotted the two Plymouth Reliance rapidly approaching from the rear. One occupied the left-hand lane visible in his side mirror. The other was on the shoulder and skirting a sports car that was tailgating him. The front seat passenger of the vehicle in the fast lane held a sawed-off shotgun. Bolin took a calculated risk, slamming on his brakes before jerking the wheel hard left. The driver of the sports car did the only thing he could, stomping on his own brakes and swerving to the right to avoid a rear-end collision. The Plymouth on the shoulder skidded to avoid hitting the sports car. Bolin continued across the left lane, cutting off the other Reliant before power sliding his convertible into the grassy medium. The executioner unleathered the Beretta 93R into play and snap aimed at the driver of the Plymouth as it sped past him. Selector switch set to three round bursts. Bolin double clutched and threw the gear shift into reverse, his vehicle never coming to a full stop as he stomped on the accelerator. He yanked the wheel and backed the car onto the highway again, bringing it to a stop on the backside of the Plymouth that had nearly hit the sports car. He holstered the Beretta and reached under the front seat to grasp the cold butt of the Desert Eagle. Drive! Get out of here, now! The executioner aimed the command at the sports car driver. He didn't want innocent civilians getting wasted during a shootout with the enemy. The guy didn't need to be told twice, putting his car into gear and taking off as several gunners poured from the Plymouth and took up firing positions. The remaining three gunmen from the sedan dived for cover, opening fire simultaneously and riddling Boland's convertible with high-velocity rounds. The firing ceased for a moment as all three of the enemy troops paused to reload. The executioner reached under the console and ripped away an M26 he taped beneath the steering column. He yanked the pin and tossed the explosive charge overhead. The grenade bounced off the trunk of the Plymouth. Two were caught in the immediate wave of the blast, razor-sharp shrapnel shredding their flesh. The concussion disoriented the survivor long enough for Bolin to seize the advantage. The executioner crossed the expanse in three long strides and raised the Desert Eagle. No! Bolin reached down and scooped up the Model 12S. He trotted past the frightened but curious onlookers who were slowly driving past and continued on to the second Plymouth. Nobody moved inside the crunched vehicle. Bolin walked to the passenger side and looked in the front window. The guy he'd seen in his mirror carrying the shotgun was barely alive, his face mangled by broken glass and razor-sharp metal. Bolin raised the Desert Eagle. Who are you working for? There was something about the guy's ramblings that sounded all too familiar to the executioner. It was hard to tell. But there was something about the facial structure, or what remained of it, that marked him as Asian. His words were unintelligible, but the accent left no doubt. The man was Chinese. Blood bubbled up from between the guy's teeth, and a moment later, he was dead. Olin knew he had only a few minutes to split. He reached into the dead man's coat pocket and found a wallet there. He opened it and noted the ID. It was a Nevada driver's license listed to a Danny Chang and an ID card in a clear casing above the license identified him as security for a Las Vegas casino. None of this was making any sense, but Bolin knew he would have to sort it out later. The most aggravating thing was that Cepedas had escaped, and he didn't have a clue where the guy was headed. He was right back where he started. But at least he'd acquired something out of the deal. He had a name, and he had a location. It looked as if it was time to pay a visit to the Sunset Strip.
Brownsville, Texas. After Lisa Riero hung up with Belasco, she turned her attention to other important matters. Her primary concern was for her safety and that of her team. Riero hadn't told Belasco of her real feelings about Charlie Metzger and the possibility that he was one of the players who had thrown in with Carrillo. There was a rumor that internal agents of the DEA had Metzger under investigation, but rumors ran far and wide in the organization. But that didn't bother her nearly as much as keeping her team alive. Most agents wouldn't have been so skittish, but Rayero had been involved in just such an undercover operation against another officer three years earlier. She'd done things she wasn't proud to admit during that time, but they were things for what she wasn't about to apologize either. For her actions, Rayero received a commendation, promotion to lieutenant, and her choice of a new duty assignment location. The daughter of career police officers, Rayero wanted to be where the action was. And for the DEA, Brownsville was the biggest drug smuggling hotspot next to Miami. Now, after almost five years here, Rayero could tell she was close to cracking this case wide open. Just as soon as she could figure out who was involved in helping Jose Carrillo maintain his hold on the Brownsville pipeline, and whether Charlie Metzger had anything to do with it or not. Besides, Metzger was her problem, not Velasco's. She wasn't sure yet that she completely trusted the dark-haired stranger who fought like a demon and could freeze someone in his or her tracks with one glance of those blue eyes. Well, that wasn't completely fair. He had pulled her out of a scrape that might have cost her her life. Not to mention the fact he seemed genuinely interested in helping her figure out where the heavy doses of brief or MDMA were coming from. She couldn't fault the guy for that. After a shower and coffee, Rayero drove across town and rendezvoused with one of her team members, Peter Williams. He was one of those guys who could be trusted with just about anything, and he'd been with Rayero since her first steps with the Brownsville office. Williams had even stood up for her against Metzger after their bust went bad. During the fighting, he'd been winged by an enemy bullet, so now he was playing desk jockey for a couple of weeks while recuperating. It provided them the perfect opportunity to dig further into the case without Metzger being the wiser. The meeting place was a nondescript, out-of-the-way diner, about a half mile off the interstate leading out of Brownsville and heading northwest to El Paso. After she ordered a bagel with cream cheese, Rajero watched Williams wolf down half of his deluxe cheeseburger while she waited. So what else did you find out about those guns? Nothing, really. The gun was allegedly signed out by somebody from the FBI, but when I called to confirm the identity of the agent, the EPIC office said they had never heard of him. So, we now have another piece to this mystery puzzle. William shook his head and drank from a large glass of milk. I don't know what the hell's going on, Lisa, but I know I don't like it. Me and me both. What about the information I already gave you? What did you do with that? Rayero paused for a moment trying to decide if she should spill the beans about Velasco. She'd promised the guy she'd keep quiet about his involvement, but that was under the assumption she was going to go on living. If something happened to her, she couldn't justify at least not letting someone else know about a new player in the game. And she didn't want to see him gunned down because he didn't know the play. <sighs> Can I trust you, Petey? What kind of question is that? I know, I know, but just humor me. Can I trust you? You know it. Okay, then here it is. After I left the office yesterday morning, that guy I said I had seen at the bust made a second appearance. His name is Mike Belasco. He claims he's a former government agent, although I'm not sure who he worked for. Now he's freelancing, and he was onto that bust before we broke in and screwed things up for him. God, Lisa, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you at least have him come back and explain himself to Metzger? I almost did, but he asked me not to. And there's something about the guy I trusted. I think you're letting the fact that he pulled us out of a scrape cloud your judgment. Maybe, but just listen to me for a minute. He knew about that transfer going down the other night, Pete. He knew everything about me and Carrillo, and he even seemed to buy my theory that someone higher than us inside the DEA is offering cooperation to the Mexican Mafia. Well, you know how I feel about that theory. I know you think it's bullshit, but what if it is true, Petey? What if I'm right, and Metzger, or God forbid, somebody higher, is playing footsies with the Carrillo crime cartel? Can you imagine what would happen if this kind of information went public? 
Nobody in this country would ever trust the DEA or U.S. Border Patrol again. Why don't trust us now? Oh, come on, Pete. You don't really believe that any more than I do. Maybe. Well, let's just look at this a minute. Carrillo has doubled his activity in shipping drugs across the borders. There are reports coming in all over the place and have been for the past month. Ecstasy use and sales are higher than ever, and the stuff just keeps turning up. We shut down one pipeline in Miami, another one opens in El Paso. We shut that down, another opens in Mexicali. We close that down, and the one in Miami is open again. It seems like there's no end to this story. Welcome to the DEA, Lisa. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that the stuff just keeps coming through, no matter how much pressure we put on the Mexicans or Colombians or whoever. They get it in, the gangs and pushers get it out on the street, and the criminals continue to make money while we continue to watch our efforts turned into profit for death. <sighs> well, sometimes I get tired of this war. Me too. She smiled, then reached out and grabbed his hand. <sighs> Listen. I know how cynical you are, but you have to trust me. I think this Belasco is on our side. I just wanted you to know about him in case something happens to me. Why? What do you think is going to happen? I don't know. I just wanted to protect this guy. I don't want him caught in the crossfire. Jeez, Lisa, what the hell has come over you? You're like some schoolgirl with butterflies over this dick. Is he that important? I think he's more than that. I think he could be the answer to this problem. There's something about Belasco that, well, it's just damn frightening. I mean, you saw the way he fought those guys that night. Yeah, I have to admit he's good, and I'm damn sure glad he's on our side. Yeah, so am I. Las Vegas, Nevada. When Mac Bolan entered his suite on the ninth floor of the Windfall Hotel and Casino, he immediately sensed another presence in the room. He didn't turn on the lights, realizing that if he wasn't alone, then his attackers would be less effective in the dark. The first assailant approached his rear flank, trying so hard to be silent that his footfalls were like elephant steps to the executioner's attuned senses. Massive biceps encircled the soldier in a futile attempt to pin his arms to his sides. Twisting his body, the soldier executed a hip toss before his attacker could recover. The guy landed on the carpeted floor hard and went unconscious. Bolin reached into his suit coat and withdrew the Beretta 93R, thumbing the selector switch to single shot as he reached behind him and flicked on the lights. Two more Asian attackers appeared from the master bedroom. This round put one of the pair in the face, depositing the guy on the floor in a crumpled heap. The second gunner had unleathered a 9mm pistol and dived for cover behind a padded chair. The executioner feline for a nearby wall as the guy started firing wildly in his direction. He made it to cover alive, but not without cost. One of the would-be assassin's stray rounds found its mark, tearing a furrow in the executioner's left shoulder. He ground his teeth at the pain, then raised his weapon, selected burst fire mode and squeezed the trigger. A fourth attacker emerged from the closet behind Bolin, the door striking him in his wounded arm as the guy raced out of the hotel room. Bolin pushed the door away and rushed after the hood. The chase continued down a long hallway that terminated at a set of stairs. Bolin could see this guy was smaller than his comrades, but he was live and extremely fast. He pumped his arms and legs, willing his body to go more quickly. By the time he'd reached the door and began to descend the stairs three at a time, his quarry had a one-flight lead. Bolin could feel his heart pounding, and they reached the bottom floor within a couple of minutes. He pushed through the closing exit door and emerged in the crowded hotel room. Bolin scanned the crowd for his runner. He spotted the man pushing impatiently through the crowd and lurched onward, intent on bringing the guy to his knees. He noted that security was also headed into the game, and he cursed himself for the mistake. It hadn't been his intention to involve any innocents, even armed security, but he wasn't about to lose his prey. Bolin circumvented the crowd, carefully ducking and dodging waitresses with trays. His maneuver paid off, and he met the runner on the other side of the crowd as the guy was pushing his way through. The executioner had holstered his Beretta a moment earlier, not wishing to attract further attention. His quarry had no such conscience. As he sprinted to the exit, he reached into his jacket and produced a 38 caliber S&W Model 60. The executioner was forced to dive out of the way and drag down a woman with him. Undaunted, Bolin was quickly on his feet and through the revolving glass doors. 
He burst onto the sidewalk of the Las Vegas Strip, looked both ways, and then spotted the guy directly across the street. He'd been joined by several more Asian hoodlums, dressed completely in black except for scarlet headbands with Chinese characters, all having just emerged from a sedan. There was no mistaking the intent behind the Model 12S SMGs in their hands. Get out of the way! They've got guns! Poland got to his feet on the right flank, heading across the strip full of log-jammed automobiles. Poland had changed out the subsonic cartridges for 158 grain hardballs. He took down two of the five attackers before they could realign their sights. The remaining Chinese gunners attempted to cut him in two, but Boland had already secured cover behind a large delivery truck. Boland dropped another SMG toting hood, who foolishly tried to charge him, ventilating the man's chest moments after the gunner left cover. The pistol-carrying hood Boland had chased onto the strip and his remaining partner apparently decided it was a hopeless effort. They abandoned the sedan and raced from the scene, pushing aside fleeing citizens who got in their way. Boland opted to give up the chase. He was already winded, pumped on his nine-floor descent and evasion of death by only a fraction of a second. He quickly glanced at the dispersing or hiding people and realized that nobody had been hurt. Boland quickly frisked the guy who had tried to charge him but found no identification. He studied the characters on the headband a moment, then pulled away the man's collar. Three odd marks were tattooed on the dead man's neck. Chinese writing, certainly but it was the location and the type of characters that had Boland's primary interest. He quickly memorized them, then rose and headed for the nearest alleyway. The executioner had been in Las Vegas less than an hour, and people had already tried to kill him. As he holstered his pistol and trotted away, Boland realized that he had finally identified his mysterious Asian enemies. Mac Boland was up against a Chinese triad. In his many travels, the executioner had made acquaintances and established connections all over the world. He knew of an FBI safe house in a residential section of Las Vegas, and it was still in operation. The place was a brick ranch-style home maintained by a retired U.S. Marshal named Vittorio Rossetti. An ex-undercover agent for the Justice Department's O.C. task force, Rossetti had penetrated the Marconi crime family an organizational part of the Chicago Four that ran the numbers racket in the late 1970s. For six years, Rossetti lived the life of a mobster, but ultimately put away a dozen or more of the heavy hitters who made up the Marconi hierarchy. Unlike most agents who spent that much time undercover, Rossetti never let the glamour and money blind him from his goal. He did what they told him when they told him, and he'd watched many of the Marconi's criminal competitors turn up dead in trunks or as permanent parts of the aquatic life in Lake Michigan. But he never wavered, and it eventually paid off. He was as hard as they came, and was willing to lend a hand any time an ally was in need. He was Mac Boland's kind of guy, and one of the toughest sons of bitches Boland knew. He'd never changed his name or identity after putting the Marconis into federal penitentiaries throughout the country. So, how goes it, brother? It goes hard, Vito. I'm on to something that's bigger than I first thought. Care to talk about it? No. You put your neck out far enough. I made sure I wasn't followed, but that doesn't mean anything if I'm right about those behind my little welcoming reception. Fair enough. I won't push it. A long silence fell between them. The two men looked at each other, then looked away, and were lost in their individual thoughts for a time. The executioner was still trying to put it all together. If he was up against a Chinese triad, he needed to find out which one. He also couldn't put his finger on why they would have any association with the Mexican mob. There seemed to be an extraordinary amount of drugs floating around, not to mention the hardware he'd seen used by all of the parties involved to date. And then there was the issue of perhaps one or more of Ramon Cepedes' men being involved in covering the tracks of a nameless enemy. Olin knew enough to realize that Cepedes might have arranged to meet with Jose Carrillo, it was no secret Carrillo ran his empire from Ciudad Juarez, since he owned a dozen or more legitimate companies that actually served as fronts so he could peddle his junk. Could it have been an alliance formed between the Chinese and Mexicans? Boland found that very hard to believe. There was no real benefit he could see in the two groups merging, and no credible reason for them to work together. 
Yet it had seemed that the Chinese he'd encountered near the border were actually trying to protect Zapeas. That was assuming, of course, that they hadn't been watching him before he'd ever contacted Zapeas. And since Bolin was freelancing this one, a government leak couldn't be part of the answer. The more he thought about it, the stranger it became. He checked his watch and realized it was time to contact the farm. Rossetti pointed him to a phone in his office where he could have privacy. The guy obviously realized that Bolin really didn't want him to know what was happening in this latest episode in the Executioner's War. It seemed to be enough for Rossetti that he could simply help his longtime friend. Barbara Price. It's me. Hi. What did you guys pull on Ramon Zapitas? Hold on a moment. Hal's here, too, so I'm going to put you on speaker. Stryker, we pulled everything we could find on your man. Zapitas was born here in the U.S. after his parents emigrated from Spain. Fairly normal childhood, although his family didn't live high off the hog. He enlisted in the Marine Corps at 18, served six years, and was honorably discharged. He immediately entered college under the G.I. Bill, majored in criminal justice and law enforcement, and then joined the Border Patrol after graduating. They were happy to have him. This guy speaks four languages and knows six Spanish dialects. His primary job in the Corps was as a linguistics expert in cryptoanalysis. He has a military background? Yes, and get this. His entire tour was done stateside, part of the time at Fort Hood and the remainder at Fort Huachuca. So he's been around that area his entire life. Exactly. Plenty of time to strike up various acquaintances on the other side of the border. That was my thinking exactly. Was there anything else? Not really, no. This guy's background seems pretty straightforward. He's never been under investigation for any kind of criminal activity and never known to take a bribe. The people of his command hold him in the highest regard, and he's a highly decorated officer with the Border Patrol. I know I'm not barking up the wrong tree here, Hal. This guy is definitely connected with someone on the other side of the border. And you suspect it's Jose Carrillo? That I don't know. I don't have much more right now than a strong suspicion. Frankly, Stryker, I'd trust your hunches before those of most. Does Sepitas have any family? His mother's in a nursing facility in El Paso. Her health is apparently failing. His father died of a heart attack six years ago. Listen, I had a little encounter here in Las Vegas. Barb, what do you know about the Chinese triad and their activities here? Well, they definitely have an active role there, but I wouldn't say it's a large one. Would it be large enough that they might feel some need to protect it with automatic weapons and trained soldiers? It would depend on which group you were talking about. The Chinese primary involvement in Las Vegas has been money laundering and check fraud. For the past few years, several groups across the country have been sending mules from all over to kite or cash forged checks. Then they take the money and pull their people out before any action can be taken. The police have caught maybe a few offenders over the years, and those who talk say they were put up to it by known members of local Chinese criminal organizations. But if a Chinese triad does have a major operation running there, it's probably a relatively new one. Well, I managed to get an SMG I took off a hit team in Mexico and sent it to Cowboy. He's next on my list to call. I'm hoping he'll have some answers. John Cowboy Kissinger was the farm's resident weapons expert. Most firearms of this nature were modified in one way or another to make them untraceable. Many times, special acids were used, or polymer fills to alter serial numbers, while others were reworked with generic bolts and special reloads. Kissinger knew many signature techniques well. Yeah, perhaps Cowboy will be able to figure out where these weapons are coming from. Or at least what group would potentially have access to them. Yeah, so far none of this makes any sense. I can't find any sensible link that would connect Carrillo's organization with the Chinese, or vice versa. You got your work cut out for you on this one, Stryker. Tell me about it. Is there anything else we can help you with? Not right at the moment. Well, you know we're here if you need us. Thanks. You guys take care of yourselves. Out. Boland disconnected the call and sat for a moment in silent contemplation. Stony Man had come through with the information and he didn't really know much more than he had before. Rognola had hit the nail on the head when he'd remarked about Zapatas having time and opportunity to create allies in the Mexican drug trade. The pieces to the puzzle were starting to fall in place, but Bolin wasn't wholly convinced all the players had shown their hand. If he were going to put it together, he'd have to wait for them to make their next move. And when they did, the executioner would make his. Toronto, Canada 
Lao Shui sat in stony silence and listened carefully as Ying Kao Chu reported their failure. An unknown party had interfered with the observation team they put on the border patrol officer. This mysterious American had single-handedly dealt a crippling blow to Ying Kao Chu's Scarlet Dragon enforcers in Mexico, and subsequently foiled attempts by a second team to capture him alive in Las Vegas. As Kao Chu concluded his report, Lao Shui maintained his silence, opting to stare at the head of the Kong Lok soldiers with a mixture of disappointment and distaste. What do you make of this man, Ying? I do not know what to make of him, and I do not know who he is. Obviously, he is proving to be a formidable opponent. From what you've told me thus far, I would have to conclude he is quite well trained. It is possible he works for the American government, perhaps the CIA or DEA. Hmm. It is possible, but highly unlikely. American agents are not so bold. They do not engage in open firefights in such a manner, and they most certainly are not trained in military tactics of this kind. This man fights like a soldier. Then you think he is military? I think he is on his own, perhaps receiving intelligence from a more unorthodox source. Let us consider this logically a moment, Ying. Lao Shui rose and began to walk around the room, his arms folded and a finger touching his lips in contemplation. He operates independently, with apparently little or no outside support. He is proficient with both firearms and with his bare hands, and he will avoid any encounters with law enforcement when possible. What makes you think that, Lao? Shui stopped in his tracks, turned on his heel, and smiled at his longtime associate and friend. If he was operating under sanctions, then why not wait for the American police to arrive? What does he have to fear? Why does he run away? Come now, Ying. You of all people should know that in order to defeat a strong enemy, you must understand him. You must know his strengths and weaknesses, and you must manipulate the situation to your advantage. Only then will your knowledge allow you to leverage against an opponent and facilitate your victory over him. As always, I am shamed by your wisdom. One day, I will be the head of the entire Kung Lok organization. I intend for your authority to become second only to my own. Perhaps you may even step up to take my place. I am honored by your confidence in my abilities. Do you wish me to handle the elimination of this man personally? No. I need you for other things more worthy of your talents. For the time being, we should watch this man and nothing more. You will know when the time is right. It shall be as you wish. What do you want me to do? My sources tell me that Jose Carrillo has enlisted the help of the Colombians, namely the leader of the FARC, Colonel Amado Nieves. I do not need to remind you, Ing, that this man is competent and very dangerous. He has as many as 10,000 men at his command and could do considerable damage to our plans for the U.S. However, we have one advantage. And that is? The majority of his people have their hands full of problems. Between fighting the Colombian government, battling various international law enforcement agencies, and protecting the drug product, Nieves will only have limited resources. Nonetheless, Nieves poses the greater threat. Do you understand? Of course. Therefore, if our plans to dominate the drug and sex trade in America are to succeed, this alliance can never come to its full potential. We need Carrillo, of course, because he supplies the product that will make us wealthy beyond our wildest imagination. But Nievas is interested only in guns. He cares little for Carrillo's profit, and that could become rather detrimental to our investment. But we have arranged for our people to supply the guns. Those are only tools of convenience. I am certain that Dim Mai is still somewhat resistant to increasing the supply demands necessary to fill these outlandish orders for firepower. It's too risky for him right now, and he stands to lose a considerable amount of profit if our plan doesn't work. I don't completely have his support, and I'm certain he has gone back to Hong Kong to run me down to the council. I have to prove that this can work to our mutual benefit. Are you saying that we should not supply the weapons for Carrillo in order that we may squash this alliance? Not exactly. I am simply suggesting that we do not fill the orders in the quantity that they are asking. It's too risky, and we should make them understand this. Carrillo is not a foolish man, mind you, 
and we would both be prudent to keep that in mind. He does not realize that we are actually on the receiving end of profit from both sides of this. But he's also intelligent enough to realize that his ability to move his drugs across the border is dependent upon two things. First, that he can find ways of keeping the American officials looking the other way. Second, that he is able to keep the competition to a minimum. But as you have said, he does not know that we are both friend and foe. But he could find out. And that is why upon securing the full trust and dependence of Nevis, you will be the one to do the honors. I believe that time may come sooner than either of us would believe. What are you saying? I'm saying that when we have complete control of the situation, I want you to kill Colonel Nievas. And eventually we will eliminate those involved in the American government as well. Then, and only then, we will truly have complete control of every major city in the United States. And then, the Kung Lok will be all powerful. Las Vegas, Nevada. Within a few hours of talking with Stony Man, Bolin had his answers. He'd reached John Cowboy Kissinger and discovered the gun had signature reworks that pointed toward the Kong Lok Triad. That explained a lot to the executioner and brought him one step closer to discovering what the connections were between the Kong Lok and Jose Carrillo. To Bolin's way of thinking, the answer was that there really wasn't a connection between the two groups, at least none other than a coincidental one. Kissinger was convinced that the weapon was the handiwork of the Kong Lok, and that could only mean one thing. Zim Maie was involved. Everyone who was anyone in intelligence circles across the globe knew that Zim Maie controlled every firearm imported by the Kong Lok and those supplied or traded in the Asian Pacific. For this very reason, there was no arms dealer or supplier in Southeast Asia more powerful than Zim Maie. From southern Russia to Indonesia, Weapons were in high demand, and Mai was one of the select few capable of meeting that demand. Almost all suppliers, regardless of nationality, location, or creed, got their guns and munitions from Zim Mai in one way or another. That made him a very dangerous man. It also made him a most likely candidate behind this new and seemingly endless cache of weapons mysteriously appearing in drug smuggling and dealing. Nonetheless, something told the executioner that Mai wasn't the only one behind the Kong Lok initiative. Bolin knew enough about the Kong Lok to know that it was highly irregular for the triad to operate so openly as he'd seen here. The Kong Lok was run by a group of wealthy politicians in what most were calling the New Hong Kong. These men were actually controlled by the underbosses who allowed the politicians to think they were running the show. Two others had major operations the eastern and western underbosses. Frankly, Poland found it hard to believe that the underboss of the eastern triad, Yi Chang Shen, would have dared attempt to muscle into the U.S. or any of its neighboring territories. That left only one possibility, and Poland was betting it was a strong one. Lao Ming Shui, sometimes known derogatorily by his competitors as Merciless Ming, was just the kind of triad gangster who might actually try to insert himself into the American drug scene. After all, where there was gambling, there were vices. And where there were vices, there were drugs. Popular designer drugs just like 3-4-MDMA, PCP, and the date rape drugs. There was also the standard stock of cocaine and heroin, bought with sex, hot merchandise, or by any other means that could be dreamed by man. Like the Jamaicans had done in the late 1980s, much to the dismay of the Italian and Latino crime families, Shuey might possibly envision a ripe market just there for the taking. This wouldn't sit well with Mexican Mafia, and Bolin knew it. So did Shuey, if his reputation was anything like the intelligence community gossiped it was, and he would definitely have a need to protect his newfound interests. So it seemed more than feasible that they would start such an operation here in the sex and drug capital of the American Southwest. They take all the peddlers and competition off the streets, they insert Danny Tang's men instead, then they have Mai supply weapons to the Scarlet Dragons. That could mean only one thing. War was coming to America in a way no one could have foreseen. 
a war that would take an unimaginable toll if someone didn't step in before things got worse. Mac Bolan was just the one to do the stepping, and he was going to start by stepping on the neck of Danny Tang. He lowered the miniature night vision goggles, stowing them in his satchel. He was attired in the skin-tight black suit, the special woolen material insulating him against the cold evening rain that was falling softly on the roof where he was keeping his vigil. The street lights below reflected off the rain-swept streets and sidewalks, separating the two buildings, gleaming like an oily sheen. The Beretta and 44 Magnum Desert Eagle were both in place, but the satchel took the place of the LBE suspenders he normally wore. There was an HK-53 submachine gun slung across his right shoulder. One of the most versatile and accurate SMGs in the world, the HK-53 was perfect for a soft probe like this. While some argued that this compact version of the HK-33E didn't really qualify as an SMG because it was chambered for the 5.56mm NATO cartridge, Poland disagreed. He'd used the weapon many times before, and aside from the Fabrique Nationale FNC, it was one of the most reliable. The executioner knew that given the amount of resistance so far, there was a good chance things could go hard in a hurry. He was hoping the sound suppressor, customized by Kissinger, would buy him some time before the shots alerted the police while not compromising firepower. He had a specific target in mind. Through some of Vito Rossetti's contacts, Bolin knew that the particular house he was watching, a veritable mansion in a neighborhood like this, was owned by Ling Hup Danny Tang. Tang was a major player in the Asian bride game, which was still in demand in places like Las Vegas. It was open season for American men seeking Little China Doll to keep house happy and bed warm. Oh yes, it was still big business, and Tang had the contacts to keep it profitable. But a small part of the cut had to be going into Lao Shui's pocket. Bolin wanted to know exactly how much and where it was going. The executioner stepped onto the slippery parapet and raised his sub-gun into position. The weapon had been modified by Kissinger. Attached by rings around the barrel and muzzle was an aluminum tube that contained a single propellant charge. Protruding from the tube was a sharp five-hooked steel claw attached to a length of thin galvanized aircraft cable coated by foam rubber. Bolin extended his arm, took careful aim, then tapped another hook attached to the back of the tube and just in front of the trigger guard. The special climbing cable arced gracefully across the chasm and attached itself to the eaves on the far side of the house. Bolin then detached the tube, wrapped the cable twice around the chimney of the roof, and snared the hook against the cable. Without hesitation, he ventured out and shimmied hand over hand 20 feet above the rain-slick pavement. He reached the other side in less than 30 seconds and dropped almost soundlessly onto the roof. Between the pitch and shingle material, the roof was very slippery, and the executioner had to hold on to the cable with one hand while he ascended one side and came down the other on his belly. Bolin reached the deck and slowly lowered himself onto it. It extended halfway around the house, and the room beyond the sliding glass doors was dark. Billowy curtains whipped inward under the gentle wind. The executioner was surprised to find that only the screen door was attached. He yanked his Colt combat knife from the sheath at the small of his back and quickly cut away the thin screening material. He pushed it aside, creating an opening large enough to crawl through. The room, which looked like an officer's study, was vacant. The hallway door stood slightly ajar, letting just enough light into the room that Bolin could make out the shapes of a desk, some chairs, and a rather large bookcase that took up one wall. He allowed himself another moment of orientation before moving to the door. He unslung the HK-53 before cat-footing to the door and peering into the hallway. Everything seemed quiet, a little too quiet to suit the executioner's tastes. The soldier stepped into the hallway and walked its length until he reached stairs descending to the first floor. He backtracked, quietly opening the door of each room, checking for Tang's gunners before moving on to the next one. He didn't want to get outflanked by enemy troops because he'd been too lazy to check for their presence. The last room held a surprise. The woman was tall. He could tell even though she was lying beneath bright white linen sheets. Dark hair cascaded to her shoulders, as silky smooth as the cleavage into which it dipped. She had brown eyes, not quite almond-shaped in contrast to the high cheekbones, 
with creamy shoulders and ruby red lips heavily coated with lip gloss. There was some sort of strange aroma in the room, maybe jasmine or cinnamon, but definitely a spice. There was also something attached to her wrists, and Boland quickly recognized they were leather restraints manacled to the bedposts with thick ropes. He closed the door and moved rapidly to the bed. The soldier jammed a rough palm against her mouth and shook his head. She nodded her understanding. Boland didn't release his hand from her mouth immediately, waiting a moment or two until he felt something wet on his hand. She was crying. Keep quiet and keep breathing, understood? She nodded, and he finally released her. <sighs> Thank God. Who are you? Boland pulled his knife and cut the leather restraints from her wrists. You first. Uh, Noreen Zahn. I'm an agent with the DEA, assigned with undercover operations three months ago to penetrate Danny Tang's outfit. Olin eyed her suspiciously as he replaced his knife. The muzzle of the HK-53 hadn't moved from being trained dead center on her chest. One wrong move and he could trigger a sustained burst with hardly a sound. His mission could still be accomplished with her alive or dead, and until she provided a more reasonable explanation for being tied up and naked in what was obviously the master bedroom, Bolin wasn't taking any chances. Get into your work? She rubbed her wrists self-consciously. Two nights ago he came in here and started to ask a lot of strange questions. I knew just by the way he was acting that my cover was blown. The only thing I couldn't figure was who he'd talk to. Tang has a lot of friends. No one in his right mind would have put you into a cover role like this. Especially not as a supposed girlfriend. What do you mean? I'll explain later. You have clothes? Uh-huh. In the dresser. Get into them quickly and quietly. And if you play any games with me, I'll figure you for one of them and take care of business. She indicated she understood as she got off the bed and went quickly to the dresser. The executioner took an appreciative look and then returned his attention to the door. He kept one eye on it, the other on his new discovery. Her story sounded legit anyway, and he didn't bother to get into any of the details with her. God only knew what she might have suffered at the hands of a maniac like Danny Tang. It wasn't his place, and it wasn't his problem. He needed to complete his mission and get the hell out of there before things became even more complicated. Zahn was dressed in less than two minutes. She didn't have any shoes, but a pair of flip-flops in the bathroom did the trick. She was rather lithe and agile-looking in her loose-fitting blue jeans and red sweater. Well, it wouldn't do much good keeping to the shadows now. They were alone on the second floor, which meant Tang and his men were on the first floor and apparently preoccupied with something more important. Within five minutes, the executioner knew what that something was. There was an indoor pool, actually more like a very large jacuzzi whirlpool, on the first floor off the kitchen. The lights were on, and it appeared Danny Tang was entertaining some lady friends. There were also several other men in the Olympic-sized hot tub, and these gentlemen were also being swarmed by topless Asian and American escorts. Bolin let his eyes rove over the scene, more concerned with the numerous hard cases ranged around the whirlpool, pistols and machine pistols within easy reach. He took a brief count, the numbers running in his head, and he realized that he would have less than 30 seconds to neutralize any resistance. Longer than that could result in disastrous consequences. So he would just have to do it in under that. Zahn, find a way out and wait for me by my rental car. Two blocks south, Gray Ford Taurus. She nodded, stopped to give him a brief expression of thanks, and then disappeared around the corner. With the woman out of the way, Mac Bolin knew it was time to get down to business. He needed to talk to Tang. The executioner was like a ghostly wraith as he pulled a flash-bang grenade from his satchel and slid across the steam-covered floor. No one immediately looked toward the entrance or took notice of him as the music was loud enough to mask the sound of his entrance. By the time the first few pairs of eyes realized someone had entered the room, the flashbang was already sailing through the air and descending toward the middle of the hot tub. The flash bang made short work of most of the world through his occupants, and even took a few of Tang's gunmen by surprise. The women clawed at the men who were either stunned by the blast of the concussion grenade, or scrambling to get clear of the steaming water. One gunner tried to angle for a better shot as Bowen was now behind the cover of the above-ground hot tub, 
but the guy was a moment too late. Bolin leaned back against the hot tub and turned in time to see another gunner appear. There was no time to bring the SMG to bear. He unleathered the Beretta and squeezed the trigger at the moment he had target acquisition. The executioner jumped to his feet and lurched around the tub, heading in Tang's direction. He needed to get the high-priced pimp in a vulnerable position. Had it been an actual soldier from the Kong Lok Triad, or a member of the Scarlet Dragons, things might have been different. But Tang was soft and westernized, and the executioner planned to use that to his advantage. Only two remained standing from Tang's protection team. The pair of goons tried to split up, giving Bolin two separate targets to worry about, but the soldier wasn't buying it. Bolin calmly walked to where Tang was still trying to leave the hot tub. He was obviously stunned by the ferocity of the executioner's surprise attack. His eyes moved fast as he tried to recover from the blinding light of the flashbang grenade. Bolin slung the subgun, then dragged Tang's body from the water by a handful of hair. The pimp stumbled from the hot tub and fell onto his knees. Water soaked the floor around the executioner's combat boots. Who the fuck are you? Judgment. Bolin's eyes narrowed as he drew the 44 Desert Eagle. The hood's eyes rolled to look at the large gun, and the executioner knew immediately he was having the desired effect. You've been riding the free train for entirely too long, Danny boy. I'm here to punch your ticket. Who sent you? Did Rosara send you? If you're referring to drug-running slime Benny Rosara's, then the answer's no. I'm done answering questions. Now you're going to answer mine. Uh, and if I refuse? I see your point. What do you want to know? Who keeps tabs on you, Tang? What do you mean? Just what I asked. You don't expect me to believe you're on your own. Members of the Scarlet Dragons paid me a visit this morning. I think you sent them. No, I swear, I don't even know you. Wrong answer. Wait, wait. I swear to God, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Then if you didn't send them, who did? They were Chinese triad goons, and that has your fingerprints all over it. Everyone knows you control the porn action in Vegas, but someone gets a cut of the action, don't they? You're going to tell me who, and if I believe you, I'm going to let you live. It's a good deal, Tang. Don't pass up a good deal. Who says I made you in the action here, pal? You must think I'm stupid, Danny boy. A few minutes ago, this place looked like a Bangkok bathhouse. Not to mention, the woman you had tied up was ratted out by someone within the DEA. You honestly think I don't know what you're into? Okay, okay. You promise to let me live? I promise, zip. But you have nothing to lose, either. Okay. It's a guy named Ng Kao He heads up the Scarlet Dragons, and they pick up the cut once a month. I used to pay some of Rosara's guys to mule for me, but that's all changed. Someone pushed him out. That's all I know. That explained why Randy Lobato, a major pusher for Rosarez, left Las Vegas and got killed in El Paso. Now Rosarez was out of the action, too. Compared to the Carrillo crime cartel, Rosarez was small-timed, and it probably hadn't been hard for a group the size of the Kung Lok to bring him down. It was all starting to make sense. Does this Cao Chu work for Lao Ming Shui? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, let's face it, everyone in the trade works for Shui. No dice. Vegas has always been owned and operated by the mob, and I don't think the Kung Lok Triad has enough guts to muscle into their territory. Oh, you fool. The mob's about gambling here, nothing else. They leave the other shit to us. They keep their hands clean while we work the streets for the sex and the dope. That way, if it hits the fan, it's the yellow man who goes down and not them. Then why are the Scarlet Dragons here in force? Rumor has it Merciless Ming is making a play for the big time. Gambling? No, but all of the drug and skin action. We've been paying him protection, and now he's actually turning on us. We could start a war, you know. There's some who just won't take it. Right, like the Mexican drug cartels. There was a flash in Tang's eyes, and Bolin recognized it. It was the information he'd been looking for, and it confirmed beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Kung Lok Triad was involved. Moreover, it told him they were making a play for stuff that had primarily been controlled by Carrillo and others within the Mexican Mafia groups. That could only mean trouble down the line. You tell Cal Chu to take a message back to his master. You tell him that nobody is going to poison American kids, not while I'm alive. You hear me? Hey, I hear you. Get out of this business, Tang, while you still can. Bolin mulled over the information he had. There was a very serious situation brewing, and he knew it was about to go sour. 
Time was against him, but he had enough information now to act. With the Kong Lok Triad obviously vying for a solid position in Las Vegas, and probably other hot spots, war was imminent. Bola knew there was only one way to slow it down, and that was to take out one side of the conflict first. He would have to concentrate on the Triad, since it was the more immediate threat. What had been going on with the Carrillo cartel had been going on for some time. For the moment, he would have to let the DEA and Border Patrol handle that, which brought the executioner to Lisa Rayero and her people. Bolin was betting whoever had blown the whistle on Zahn was also playing two ends against the middle with Rayero and the Kung Lok. The executioner couldn't do much more at the moment than warn her. He'd seen what information Zahn had and maybe it helped Rogero come one step closer to finding out who in the DEA, be it Metzger or someone else, was friendly with the enemy. The more he thought about it, the more Bolin realized he was going to have to fight a war on two fronts. A war that was going to get very hot. You need to drive for a while. What's wrong? I'm bleeding. The executioner hadn't detected it at first, but he had to have pulled enough skin away to foul up Rossetti's stitch job. Nonetheless, the middle of the desert in the late afternoon, even on a road as busy as U.S. Highway 95, was neither the place nor the time to bleed to death. Olin was an accomplished medic in his own right, so he would have to just deal with it here and now. Zahn got behind the wheel, quickly adjusted her seat, and then turned to look at him and cleared her throat. <clears throat> you know, I didn't properly thank you back there for pulling my bacon out of the fire. Forget it. Maybe you'll get to repay the favor sometime. I can think of many ways I'd like to repay it now. <laughs> I'm sure you could. But I need to keep my mind on business, and you need to keep your own on the road. We have to get back to Brownsville before something else goes wrong. Zahn nodded her understanding, although she didn't hide the disappointment in her expression. Wouldn't it have just been faster to fly? Yeah, and it would have made it ten times easier for the Scarlet Dragons to track us. Did you say the Scarlet Dragons? Uh, I mean, are we talking the Scarlet Dragons of the Kung Lok Triad? Olin had to admit he was impressed with Zahn's insight. As a matter of fact, he was beginning to wonder if she weren't a little too insightful. The Drug Enforcement Administration was thorough in its training, but unless things had changed in recent times, he wasn't aware that training went extensively into Chinese triads and tongs. Ostensibly, local law enforcement agencies and federal groups like the FBI and BATF were more likely to encounter Chinese triad activity than the DEA. On the other hand, it was quite possible Zahn had acquired the knowledge on her own. He wasn't sure he bought that story, but it wasn't enough to think she was a mole that the enemy had put purposely in his path. Even if members of the Kung Lok were on to him, they wouldn't have had any reason to think the executioner would hit Danny Tang. Everyone knew about the Scarlet Dragons, but not many people were up to snuff on Chinese organized crime factions like the Kung Lok. For Zahn to immediately tie the two together was a clear sign of her training, or perhaps her allegiance. In either case, Bolin would have to keep an eye on her. It took him only a few minutes to redress the wound. The bleeding was minimal, as only two of Rossetti's stitches had pulled loose. Bolin gritted his teeth as he managed to pull the silk thread tight to close the wound then dressed it with fresh bandages he'd bought at a grocery store on the outskirts of Vegas. Looks like that's going to leave a scar. It won't be the first. So, you think the Kung Lok has something to do with Danny Tang? For some reason, she had abruptly changed the subject again. Bolin had noticed in his previous conversations with her that Zahn did this frequently. Some people would have said it was a sign of high intelligence, but the executioner couldn't help but be a bit annoyed by it. Still, she'd proved herself an insightful companion, so he could overlook the little personality quirks. When he'd completed his patch job, Bolin removed the Beretta from his shoulder holster and quickly set to the task of cleaning the weapon. He retrieved a military cleaning kit from the glove compartment, keeping the Desert Eagle close at hand beneath the pull-down console of the rental. It wouldn't do to have an attack come with his only means of defense sitting in pieces on the dashboard. The entire process took less than five minutes, and, after a light coat of oil, the Beretta was back in place and ready for action. Zahn broke the silence in which she'd left him to his work. You mentioned something before that piqued my interest. What's that? You said that nobody in their right mind would have put me into Tang's operation in an undercover role. What did you mean by that? Bolin didn't answer immediately, wondering if he should bring up Lisa Rayero. 
It was still too early for him to completely trust Zahn, but he was convinced she was definitely a legit member of the DEA. He just wasn't sure if that was the only place she was collecting her pay. He didn't want to be paranoid, but he didn't want to compromise innocence either. Then it occurred to him that Zahn had been one of the victims of whoever was trying to sabotage DEA efforts against the Mexican drug cartel. You said you were sent out of the Brownsville office to penetrate Tang's operation? Right. We had informants who told us Tang was getting into the drug scene in Las Vegas. The local office there was concerned that with Tang's connections, one of their people would get their cover blown the minute we made contact. So my superiors asked for a volunteer, and I stepped up. Then somebody tried to blow your cover. I don't understand, Mike. What would anyone within the DEA in Brownsville have to gain by blowing my cover in Las Vegas? I don't have the answer to that question. Yet. I'm not even sure it's someone in the DEA. Then what were you doing in Vegas? Following a hunch. There's a definite connection between the U.S. Border Patrol in El Paso and the Kung Lok Triad. I don't know what that connection is, but it could be related to something Tang told me. The Scarlet Dragons are basically in Vegas to stomp out competition and prepare for a large movement by the Kung Lok organization. I don't know which cities they plan to hit, but I do know they're cutting into major holdings of the Mexican crime cartel. Well, that could get damn ugly. Maybe we should let our people know when we get back. No dice. If someone in your department was trying to get you out of the way, you'll be safer if they think Tank killed you. Do you know Agent Rajero? Yeah. Lisa and I worked together on a sting operation once before. I have nothing but respect for her. Her boss suspended her after a bust they had set up went sour. I think the only one set up was Rajero. She's convinced he had something to do with it. Are we talking about Charlie Metzger? Yeah. He was the one who assigned me to Tang. You have any reason to think he's dirty? Or to think that possibly he's the one who blew your cover? No. I like Charlie. Always have. He's a pain in the ass at times, like most bosses can be. But on the whole, he likes his people. He doesn't seem to have much like for Rajero. Well, you probably wouldn't either if you knew what Metzger does. A few years ago, Lisa took down a corrupt lieutenant who was sexually harassing female members of his staff. That was the sting she involved me in, because I worked for this jerk and put up with his sick advances. I was glad when they finally brought him down. So Metzger knows Rajero was involved. He's got nothing to worry about if he's on the level, so why hold it against her? You don't understand much about the DEA. It's like any law enforcement agency. People get close. These people watch out for your ass, and you watch out for theirs. I understand loyalty and friendship much better than you might think. Something flashed in Zahn's eyes, something that alternated between surprise and hurt, but then it disappeared as quickly as it had come. Bolin was watching for a further reaction, but it never came. You're right. Of, of course, I'm sorry. No need to be. What we need to do now is get back to Brownsville and contact Rajero before the Scarlet Dragons figure out where we went and give chase. Do you think they'll come after us? They'll certainly try after the message I left with Tang to give to his superiors. That's pretty brave of you, Mike, considering what you're up against. Are you crazy or just suicidal? I'm just setting the bait. And what if they decide to take it? I'll be ready. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. Hal Brognola, director of the Sensitive Operations Group and head of the ultra-covert agency known as Stony Man Farm, was angry. Mac Bolin, friend and ally, was out there on his own and risking his life to clean up the streets of America. Brognola owed more than just his life to the executioner. He owed the man the lives of his family as well. So when he knew that his longtime friend and ally could be in trouble, he would pull out all of the stops and do whatever was necessary to help him. Except in this case, Brognola had been given a direct order from the President of the United States just 15 minutes earlier that he was not to interfere. Not under any circumstances, Hal. Am I being clear? But sir, Stryker needs support on this one. There's a very strong possibility that members of our own government could be involved in this. Members high up in the Border Patrol. Or possibly even in justice. The federal agencies under the DOJ are your domain, Hal. If you have some strong evidence to support such an accusation, then I'm willing to grant carte blanche and open a full investigation. But Stony Man's tactics are just too radical on such premature assumptions. I'd like to put Able Team on standby. You can run your outfit however you think is best, Hal. You know I won't interfere in that respect. However, 
I will caution you that no activation is to occur unless you have my express permission. Your men have been in this position before. I understand your concern, but I'm not sure I understand the level of it. The reason I'm concerned about this situation is because Stryker hasn't been able to clearly identify the enemy. From what you've told me so far, it sounds like he may have more than one. And then again, there may be none at all. I'm sorry, Hal, but I just don't see enough evidence there to give the go-ahead to move. If you can bring me something more tangible, then I'm willing to get the ball rolling. Now I have to meet with the Joint Chiefs. I understand, sir. Thank you for your time. I'll be in touch. You do that, Hal. Rognola thought he knew why the President was hedging on this one, but he wasn't sure he understood it. Mac Bolan had saved the country more times than anyone cared to count. To ask that Stony Man support him now, even when the guy was on his own, on an unsanctioned mission, wasn't too much to ask. At least not as far as the head Fed was concerned. In fact, Brognola couldn't believe the Oval Office was taking this stance. Well, the President was at least willing to look at any new or solid evidence that could prove Boland's theory of operation between the Mexican drug cartel and officials in the Border Patrol. It was an old story, sure, but it wasn't as common as it had been in the early 1980s. The scandals surrounding the Noriega Syndicate, not to mention the Iran-Contra arms affair and other such incidents, had certainly turned America on its ear. The number of investigations into corruption in American politics during this hotbed of activity had been equaled only by those of the McCarthy era. Rognola just couldn't stand by and do nothing. He had opted against putting Able Team on full alert. They could be called up if needed when that time came, but this wasn't that time. Not that they wouldn't have raced to Vegas, Brownsville, or halfway across the globe, for that matter, to assist Mac Bolan if called upon to do so, and in a pinch, Rognola wouldn't hesitate. Nonetheless, it wouldn't improve the executioner's situation to act impulsively or to waste the resources of a valuable team without first having something more solid to go on. The best they could offer Bolin right now was support and intelligence, and Stony Man had plenty of resources to handle that job. Barbara Price entered the war room. What do we know? Not a lot. She sat and crossed her shapely legs. The Stony Man mission controller was the kind of woman who could do just about anything and look good doing it. But beyond her fashion model looks was a depth and intelligence unrivaled by any woman he'd ever known, except perhaps his wife. A former member of the NSA SIG Int Group, Price had many contacts in the intelligence community. This, coupled with the fact she was hardworking, respected by the others, and efficient to a fault, made Price an invaluable member of the Stony Man team. We have narrowed down who we believe may be working with the Mexican drug cartel. She opened a file folder and took out a color still that was sharply defined. A CIA agent in Ciudad Juarez took this photograph three days ago. Aaron's people had to really clean it up before we could make heads or tails, but we've positively identified him as Colonel Amado Nievas. Ragnola looked up from the picture with total surprise, hardly able to believe his ears. The head of the FARC? Well, he's one of them. His primary position is military commander of the FARC Joint Forces, which involves factions from several different arenas within Colombian territory. He's a formidable opponent, and the Colombian government admits that all efforts to apprehend him have been unsuccessful. He's very well protected, and we were a bit troubled to find him operating so close to U.S. borders. Operating in what way? He's considering formation of alliances with Jose Carrillo. Good God. And that's not all. They turned to see Aaron the Bear Kurtzman wheel himself into the war room. The expression on Kurtzman's face left little to guess that he didn't have any more good news for them than Price had. We think that Carrillo is looking for a lot more than friendship. We think he's looking to strike a deal with Nieves for protection. Both sides stand to benefit tremendously if the Carrillo crime cartel can seize control of the drug trafficking between Mexico and the states. Kurtzman rolled himself to a nearby terminal credit card transactions, banking and funds movements, corporate NASDAQ ratings and other financial information all went through Stony Man Farm. The information was processed, batched and stored by a program designed specifically by Kurtzman. Kurtzman's job was one that went 24-7, and he never let them down. There were other important features in his database program. Information on every known terrorist organization, past and present, was available at the push of a button as well as technical schematics on everything from firearms to bicycles. 
The supercomputers at the farm's annex were technological marvels, processing, sorting, and even, in some cases, disseminating information in impressive quantities. What else have you come up with, Bear? This might get uglier than we had originally thought, and a whole lot deeper. How so? Two weeks ago, members of the BATF intercepted a weapons cache being smuggled in aboard a Chinese freighter. Most of them were standard-issue variants of Kalashnikovs, but a small number were Finnish-made Jatomatics and some other easily concealed machine pistols. Do you remember when Stryker said that he'd sent one of the guns he'd lifted off that Asian hit team to Cowboy? Kurtzman tapped on a computer key to dim the lights, and then another to project an image on a large screen integrated into the wall. This is an image of the weapon that he sent to me less than an hour ago. It's a Model 12S 9mm submachine gun manufactured by Beretta. We stock some in the armory. According to Cowboy, this has signature machining on it that would suggest the work of Dim Mai's people. Head of the Kung Lok's arms supply. Exactly. That's why Stryker had asked us about the Chinese operating in Las Vegas. They're trying to smuggle arms into the country to help subsidize whatever major operation they're preparing to undertake. Okay, let's say you're right. What does that have to do with any alliance formed between the Colombian FARC and Mexican drug cartel? I'm not sure. But I think Mac was onto something here. All other things being equal, he mentioned he couldn't find any logical reason for Carrillo and the Chinese to be connected. All three of them now sat in silence and pondered the issue. Rognola was troubled by the new turn of events. There was some connection here, and it was going to be up to them to figure it out and get the information to the president so he could act. Or at least get it to Mac Boland so he could act. Wait a minute. The two main seats of power in the Kung Lok have always been in China and Canada. They literally control the entertainment industry from a power base in Toronto. Intelligence reports indicate the Western underboss is Lao Ming Shui. Head of the Shui Films and Arts Corporation. Are you proposing that they might be thinking of breaking new ground here in the States? That's exactly what I'm proposing. That's all well and good in supporting Stryker's theory, Barb. But how does it tie into the Colombian-Mexican connection? Now hold on, Bear. I'm beginning to understand this. Kung Lok decides it wants to hit the Vegas scene. Now, in order to gain control, the Triad's going to have to take some things by force. That means eliminating the competition. The Mexican drug cartel. I see where you're going now, Barb. They smuggle in weapons and use them to take by force what they can't take by attrition. Naturally. And when Carrillo starts losing his foothold, he calls in Nievas to help him. In return for what? Guns. Oh my god. War between the FARC and the Kung Lok Triad here in America? Ramifications of something as heavy as that are astounding, Hal. We're talking untold loss of lives, property damage in the millions, and full-scale chaos for law enforcement agencies all across the U.S. Lord knows about the only ones prepared for that kind of conflict would be the National Guard. It's unthinkable, Hal. We're talking war in our streets. Martial law would have to be declared in the larger cities. And Phoenix Force and Able Team couldn't be everywhere at once, even if we knew where to start. Rognola turned to pick up the phone. I'm going to let the President know what we think we could be up against. What do you need from us? Find Stryker. Pronto. Brownsville, Texas. Bolin and Zahn arrived without incident, then drove straight to Lisa Rayero's place. It was early afternoon. Nearly 24 hours since Poland had hit Danny Tang's place, so he was counting on the fact that the high-priced pimp had passed on his message to his masters. It was only a matter of time before the Scarlet Dragons took another shot at him. In the meantime, however, it was important that he get this information to Rayero. He didn't have the connections in the DEA that she did, and he was going to need her help whether or not he liked it. With his discovery of the connection between the Mexican Mafia and the Kung Lok, Poland didn't have time to pursue the connection between the guns and border patrol chief Ramon Zapetas. He would have to let Rajero handle that. There just wasn't enough time. Poland pulled into the parking lot of a small apartment complex one block over and crossed through a backyard with San to reach Rajero's place. He'd already contacted Rajero to tell her they would be arriving, but she was the only one who knew. Unless the enemy had the phones or interior of the house bugged, which Poland seriously doubted. Rajero wasn't a big enough player to be a threat to those inside the DEA who might be corrupt, and she definitely wasn't a threat to the Kong Lok. 
As far as the executioner was aware, they didn't even know she existed. Poland hoped to keep it that way. He approached the back door of Rajero's house. Come in. They entered, and the two women glanced at each other just a moment before embracing. <gasps> My God, I thought you were dead! So did I, until this guy showed up. If it hadn't been for Mike, Danny Tang probably would have raped or beat me to death by now. Or both. Thanks again, Belasco. Forget it. Sorry to break up your little reunion, but we've got a serious problem. Well, come on into the kitchen and I'll pour some coffee. You guys hungry? I'm famished. I could use something. And the bathroom. Rajero nodded, gesturing for Boland to take a place at the kitchen table and ushering Zahn to the bathroom. She returned a few minutes later and poured both of them some coffee. Noreen's going to take a few minutes to clean up. So, uh, what's the story with Las Vegas, and how did her cover get blown? I don't know. Somebody in your agency probably ratted her out to Tang, maybe one of the locals in Vegas. They didn't know about the operation. Somebody had to have known. She was there at the request of the DEA office. The commander of that bureau knew... As well as myself and Charlie Metzger, that's it. I don't know what to tell you. Either somebody turned her out or she just gave herself away. In either case, at least I happened on to her before the worst. Amen to that. I'm going to have to leave her here with you. Nobody can know she's still alive until I get a better handle on the situation. Is there trouble in Las Vegas? There's trouble all over. When I pulled Zahn out of there, Danny Tang and I had an informative chat. It seems that the Kung Lok Triad has decided to move its operations into the Desert Strip... The triad's starting to hit Mexican drug rings all over the southwest. That gun I lifted off those hitters in Mexico was what made the connection for me. These guys are muscling into Carrillo's action, which is why you ran into trouble the other night on that bust. The fact those guys were ready for you and toting that kind of hardware was no coincidence. What about Chief Zapatas? I'm not sure how he figures into this yet, but I'm sure he does. I think he may be working for Carrillo. No chance he's with the Kung Lok? You said on the phone they were the ones who tried to hit you when you were tailing Cepetus. I don't think they were as concerned with me as they were with Cepetus, true. But after what Tang told me, there's no question they have a hidden agenda. Maybe they were planning to take out Cepetus and I got in the way. Do you really believe that? No, but it's just as believable as my original theory. And what if Cepetus has nothing to do with the Kung Lok? Then he's not my worry. The executioner wasn't sure what he'd said wrong, but something went flat in Rajero's expression. Her eyes narrowed, and she studied him for a moment. He knew what was coming, and he had hoped it wouldn't. This was the chief problem with involving outsiders in his missions, and the very reason why he preferred to work alone. When Bolin was trying to be efficient, others thought he was being cold and heartless. This guy may be associating with known criminals and taking payoffs from a Mexican drug lord like Jose Carrillo. Now you're telling me that's not your problem? Not when a more serious one presents itself. You're more than capable of pursuing Cepetus. And if that's what you want to do, then I say go for it. As a matter of fact, I'd encourage it. But I'm trying to stop a full-scale war that's about to explode right on the streets, lady. Some things take priority, and this is one of them. Oh, you're right, Belasco. I'm sorry I got so hot under the collar. Forget it. Where I need to focus now is on the Kung Lok Triad. I'm betting that it'll go one step at a time, slowly working its way across the bigger cities, then take care of the smaller fish. I agree. If the Triad can control the major distribution pipelines, the other stuff will be a cakewalk. The little dealers and runners don't really give a shit who they pay the cut to as long as they're treated fairly. I can guarantee there won't be any of that. What do you mean? If the Kung Lok is like other triads, it believes in a strict monopoly. Profit motive is the driving factor, and competition is costly. Those weren't pop guns being carried by those Scarlet Dragon troops in Vegas. We're talking the real thing here. So you think they'll cop a winner-takes-all attitude? I'd bet on it. Olin stopped a moment to consider their discussion. What areas would you think that they stand to benefit the most by controlling? Well, as far as the drug trades are concerned, no doubt they'll hit Carrillo in Houston. That's where most of the money changes hands and where they bankroll their laundering and distribution operations. Easy to hide because of all the money in the oil industry there. Precisely. As far as sales and movement of the drugs themselves, Carrillo has known pipelines in El Paso, Brownsville, and Nogales. Very little gets run across the Rio Grande. At least not enough that we can't handle it through the agency. Looks like quite a bit of territory. I have to get some wings. 
Okay, so how do you want to handle this? And how can I help? You've done everything you can. I have ways of getting intelligence, other sources, with means not at your disposal. I want to be involved. If you really want to help, then find out everything you can about Carrillo and Cepitas. And see if you can determine who blew Noreen Zahn's cover. We need to keep her alive in order to find out. Can you at least tell me your plan? It's better you don't know. You're alive and I want to keep it that way. She did nothing to hide her disappointment. Listen, kid. I just can't take the liability. I've got enough blood on my hands and I'm not about to add any more. I can take care of myself. I know you can. That's why I'm leaving the mission on Cepitas all to you. You've got a knack for bringing down dirty cops. You did it before and I think you'll do it again. Where will you start? I think El Paso. From there, I'll have to beat tracks to Houston, Vegas, and possibly Phoenix. California will be last on the agenda. You think this Kung Lok triad will actually go that far? They would have to. The Baja Strip is a site of major action for both drugs and sex for hire. Tang indicated that the Chinese figure these two go hand in hand. That's as close to the truth as it gets. Sounds like a dangerous job. Yeah, that's the best kind. Chihuahua, Mexico. Jose Carrillo watched the sun setting on Ciudad Juarez from his porch. He'd been awaiting Amado's answer for several days now, and the Colombian soldier hadn't responded. Carrillo was becoming impatient. He wasn't accustomed to waiting on others, but he knew there wasn't a thing he could do about it. Nevas would do things in his own way and on his own time, and Carrillo was just going to have to wait. The sound of a car approaching woke him from his state of self-pity. He immediately recognized the engine sounds of the jalopy in which Nevas had ridden upon his first visit. The ugly economy car came into view from around the flowers and rock beds lining the winding drive of Carrillo's estate. The Mexican crime lord could barely contain his excitement as he quickly descended the stairs. He arrived at the front doors in time to see Nevas emerge from the car. There was a broad grin that immediately spread across the FARC leader's face, and Carrillo knew the answer before Nivas even opened his mouth. Welcome back to my home, my friend. He hugged Nivas in the colonel's traditional fashion. Thank you, Jose. I come bearing excellent news. Do you have agreed to my terms? Yes, but on one condition. And that is? I can provide you approximately 100 of my best men. In return, we ask a small fee in addition to the weapons. Carrillo was a little suspicious now, and he knew his expression had given it away. So they wanted a cut of the action now. That hadn't been discussed as part of the original agreement, and he was wondering just exactly how much this small fee would amount to. Still, he had to maintain appearances until he could determine if the offer was reasonable. I can see your reticence. And believe it or not, I can understand it. But you must understand that I fought against this. The revolution is already getting a considerable amount from this alliance. I did encourage them to accept your terms, as offered, Jose, but they would not heed my advice. I hope you understand. I will understand more when you stop apologizing and tell me just exactly how much we're talking about. Ah, we come to the point on this. That's what I admire about you, Jose. It is one of the things I admired when I met you, and I told my people so. How much, Imado? Uh, five percent? Carrillo had to consider it only a moment before he realized it was more than fair. He had thought they were at least going to try for double digits, but they hadn't. So he wasn't going to argue over that. A mere 5% in an annual multi-billion dollar industry wasn't going to break the bank. And he was even less prepared for what came next. And you can keep the books on it. We will trust you to disperse to us whatever this amount will be on a quarterly basis. With the cash or product, as long as it's untraceable, this will be payable directly to me, and only me. And I will in turn get it to my superiors. Carrillo stuck out his hand. I accept your terms. The two men shook hands, hugged, and then finally entered the air-conditioned house together. They moved through the halls, drinking, smoking Cuban cigars, and discussing their plans for the future. It was a good time for celebration, and a good time for talking business. Carillo had something on his mind, though, and he was trying to find a way to tell Nivas. He'd thought seriously about simply keeping it to himself, but he knew it was too important to ignore. If Nivas found out that he'd lied, he could pull the plug on the whole deal. 
Carrillo didn't fear the Colombians, particularly not the FARC, but he damn sure respected them. He knew that Nivas had the resources and firepower to put down ten empires like Carrillo's cartel, but it was more a question of willingness to divert those kinds of forces. After all, only one hundred men wasn't exactly generous when one considered the amount of territory to be covered. Still, the Colombians had their own battles to fight, and that would always take place above Mexican mob profits. Nonetheless, Carrillo could live with it, and while maybe he didn't trust all of the Colombians, he trusted this one, and he felt it was necessary to maintain that trust by being forthright in certain matters, particularly when it served the greater interest of his people and his business. <sighs> Ain't no problem has arisen in your absence, one I could not have foreseen until it reared its ugly head. And what is the nature of this problem? One of those American authorities and financing came to see me a couple of days ago. It would seem that an unidentified U.S. agent is getting closer to the operation on Brownsfield. Uh, how did this happen? Just before we talked, I received a call that a major shipment had been hit by the DEA in Brownsfield. You didn't advise me of this. Joe had no reason to know at the time. Joe hadn't yet accepted my offer, so I saw nothing provoking me to discuss business. Besides, these things happen now and again. So where is the problem? The DEA attempted to seize the drugs, but they were destroyed before that could take place. We have not been able to identify exactly who was responsible for this, but the next afternoon there was a DEA agent in the office of this American in my employ. He was asking questions. Questions about guns and how they were found and supposed to be impounded. I think I understand now. We're very concerned that this man could become troublesome to us. As I said, we haven't been able to identify who it was that destroyed our shipment, but we think that the man who showed up in El Paso is a likely suspect. He tried to follow our American friend from the Border Patrol, but somebody stopped him before he could track my man here. And who were these mysterious saviors? That we do not know either. We think that perhaps there were others that the man from the DEA has crossed. He has apparently made many enemies. Then I'm afraid I must recant my original statement. If he's no longer of any concern to us, I do not understand your problem. He's still alive. We've begun to suffer losses both along the border and in Las Vegas. <laughs> Surely, this one man couldn't put so much pressure on you. We don't know if he's behind it at all. There have been no witnesses to any of the hits in Las Vegas and Houston so far. We think it is by design, and perhaps if this man is behind it, then he's operating without the sanctions of his government. A freelancer? Possibly, or maybe a mercenary that used to cover their own asses and facilitate plausible deniability. Well, he's only one man, so I don't really see how he could be any kind of true threat. Carrillo wasn't so sure but he chose not to comment on that. If what Ramon Cepadas had told him was true, then he had every reason to think it was the same man behind all of their losses to this point. There was no other reasonable explanation. The American Mafia presence wasn't heavy enough in Houston to make any notable difference, and drug running wasn't its thing. As a matter of fact, the major players in U.S. organized crime were more business executives softened by years of luxury and easy money than the hard-nosed gangsters of the 1960s. And while they might have had the resources to pull off something like this, they didn't have the balls. Carrillo knew the Sicilians wouldn't have risked starting an all-out war of rivalry with the Mexican crime families when a peaceful coexistence had worked all this time. They had tried that with the Jamaicans to no avail. So there wasn't anything left in his mind other than the American government. And whether this particularly elusive individual was rogue or sanctioned by the Americans didn't matter. I'm convinced that if we eliminate this man, these attacks on our product will stop altogether. And if it doesn't? Then we haven't spent considerable resources to try to destroy the threat. He's only one man, after all. Which is why I'm not convinced he is the threat behind these attacks you talk of. Have you considered the possibility of an outside threat? What do you mean? I mean... It's possible that this is another organization looking to take over your business, perhaps even one of your local competitors. I suppose it is possible, Amaro, but I consider it highly unlikely. Why? Because none of my competitors have those kind of resources. Moreover, I don't think they would risk standing against me. If I'm not mistaken, I believe there were those you put down that probably said the same thing. Your observations both flatter and humble me. I have to acknowledge that you might be right. But I still wouldn't rule out anything until you have more evidence. But I'm spread thinly enough as it is. I cannot risk spreading myself out to pursue one man. If he is behind these attacks, as you suspect, 
then I imagine he will come to you. Besides, you forget that my people will be here tonight. We may then distribute them at our leisure. I can guarantee you that these men will not last long against soldiers of the revolution. I have no doubt about that, my friend. I do not want you to worry about this anymore, Jose. We will take care of it when the time is right. If it will make you feel better, I can immediately divert the detachment to Las Vegas to protect your interests there. Thank you, my friend. That will certainly ease my conscience. In following your line of thought, there are rumors that a Chinese triad could be involved in this. I do not have any tangible evidence, only suggestions from my intelligence network. For that matter, it could be information being supplied to them by one of my own. But I'm sure eventually we will know who is behind this, and then you may take care of them. Mm, the triads, eh? That's an interesting theory. I'm certain you are correct. Eventually you will find out what's going on, and then we may deal with it in an appropriate manner. Now, what are our plans for moving the drugs into America? I have set up three entry points and two major centers of operation. We presently control the pipelines in El Paso, Brownsville, and Nogales. There is still Mexicali to worry about, and then how to move the product up safely to San Diego once it is across. The areas through the Sonora Desert will not be easy, particularly around the Baja. That could become a major task. It might be better to forget this altogether and utilize other pipelines to their fullest potential. I cannot do this, Amaro. That territory is entirely too large to relinquish. The success of this plan is rooted in the idea that we control the entire border, not just bits and pieces. Anything less will result in total anarchy among those working under us. This is how we maintain control. And increase profits? Naturally. When is the next shipment scheduled for crossing? Tomorrow night. We will be able to test your people firsthand in a real situation. I have connections that are awaiting the shipment on the other side in El Paso. We will move the drugs under the noses of the U.S. Border Patrol agents, then arrange to ship them to our distribution area. From there, the people who try to pick up the last shipment will get them. This will be much safer, I think. Plus, we will have real soldiers helping us to protect it. Do you refer to revolutionary forces of my people? Of course, my friend. Make no mistake, my men are excellent. But they are not veterans like yours. They lack the experience to handle these operations for any extended time period. The involvement of your troops will change the tide of my operations forever. While others might entertain the idea of opposing Mexican cartel protection, they will think twice about attacking or stealing shipments guarded by crack combatants. <laughs> it is an ingenious plan, Jose. The American drug police will know what hit them. And your competition? There will be none once they hear you've allied yourself with a veritable army of hardened soldiers. My people are the very best at what they do. And they will be amply rewarded. Then, here's to our new alliance. I'll drink to that. Brownsville, Texas. Shortly after Boland's departure from Rayero's home, Barbara Price reached him over a special paging device that Boland carried with him. The intelligence that she and Kurtzman laid on him got his attention. Rognola still hadn't been able to convince the president that action by either of the Stony Man teams was imminent. So far, all they had was a plausible theory that happened to fit the facts at hand. That wasn't proof in the man's book, and quite frankly, the executioner couldn't blame him. Boland stood inside a darkened phone booth, its door open. His car was nearby with the engine running and the lights off. Is there anything else I need to know, Barbara? No, that's about all we have right now. We can definitely start monitoring Kung Lok activity in the major cities where we know Jose Carrillo has a presence. We also plan to keep tabs on Amado Nievas and his continued dealings with the Mexican drug cartel. We'll just have to feed you the intelligence as you go. That'll work. Now, I need a favor. Is Hal around? I'm here, Stryker. What do you need? I need J.G. here, and I need him in a bad way. Jack Grimaldi was Stony Man's ace pilot and one of Mac Boland's few close friends. No problem. As a matter of fact, he's not too far from you. He's taking a little R&R, &R, but I'm certain he'd curtail his plans to work with you. Good enough. Tell him I'll meet him at that private airfield in Houston by 1100 hours tomorrow. He'll know the place I mean. Understood. Will you be needing additional help? Anything in the supply arena you think Jack can tote with him would be good. But let's keep other personnel out of it for the time being. Okay, you're calling the shots on this one. Still, you know we're ready to do what's necessary. I know, and I appreciate it. By the way, Lisa Rejero from the DEA mentioned that Jose Carrillo might have an attorney in Houston who takes money for laundering. Could you look into it and see if you can find out who it is? I'll need a name and address next time I call. Done. 
You take care of yourself, Striker. You hear me? Always. Back inside the rental, Olin put the shift selector into gear and slowly accelerated from the curb. Thanks to intelligence provided by Rajero and her team, Bolin knew exactly where to start his blitz. Carrillo had a manufacturing warehouse on the southeast side of Brownsville. Once the raw MDMA or coca product was smuggled here, they converted it and then sent out the processed junk for distribution. The DEA believed the Brownsville facility also served as a money clearinghouse but Carrillo's political connections had so far prevented authorities from closing the place for good. Allegedly, the money was then shipped up the intracoastal waterway off the Gulf of Mexico, dropped in Laporte, Texas, and then trucked into Houston to be laundered. According to Rayero, the DEA had been trying to close down the factory for years, but every time they turned up enough evidence to make their move, either a bribed judge, corrupt politician, or the mysterious disappearance of that evidence got in their way. It sounded like a sweet deal for Carrillo and an irresistible takeover for the Kong Lok. Bolin planned to end that deal permanently. The warrior negotiated the light weeknight traffic and soon found himself on a nearly deserted road that passed by the warehouse. The road was actually a hundred yards or better above the raised dock where the small lone factory stood. It looked like a legitimate operation from the exterior, one that would have left most with the impression it was some kind of small lumber or machining factory. But Bolin knew better. The old cliché, can't judge a book, came to mind as he pulled off the road, hid the car in some tall weeds, and made his way to a wooded promontory overlooking the factory. The executioner studied the lay of the land for a few minutes through his NVDs then returned to his car and grabbed his equipment. He slid into the LBE suspenders he'd worn on his first night in Brownsville and applied combat cosmetics. He replenished his ammo pouches with 30-round magazines for the now unsuppressed HK-53, then closed the trunk and carefully proceeded down a slippery embankment that led to a tree line on the backside of the factory. Once he was at ground zero, Bolin stopped to study the place again in more detail off the main building, there were two outbuildings and a 30-foot water tower that the executioner estimated about a thousand gallons. There was also a non-functional water wheel attached to an old-fashioned pumping house and a dock that led directly from the main building. The executioner nodded with satisfaction as he let his eyes rove the length of the dock and come to rest on a boat. That was probably the money boat being ready to leave for La Porte. A stroke of fortune had accompanied the executioner on his first mission, and it appeared his plans to meet Grimaldi in Houston would pan out nicely. Now it was simply a matter of figuring out which group was running this actual operation. Nothing in Rajero's intelligence led Boland to believe that the Kung Lok triad had moved on this place yet, or that they even knew about it. Chances were good that Carrillo's men were still in charge of the site. Time would tell. Bolin flicked the selector switch on the HK-53 to full auto and then broke cover and sprinted across the open field. It was risky, exposing himself for the some 50 yards to the back doors of the factory. But he wasn't about to take out the opposition while hiding behind the trees. He had no explosives other than the two M26 fragmentation grenades that remained from his previous battle in Brownsville. That was hardly enough to bring the factory crashing to the ground. The executioner reached the doors without incident, but found them locked. The flat handle of the door was the pull kind, and a quick measure gave the soldier an idea. He detached one of the frags from his LBE, yanked the pin, and inserted the bomb between the handle and the door. He stayed low, holding it in place while he pounded on the door with his fist, then rose and dodged around the corner. A moment later, he heard the door pop open and the footfalls of at least two men, possibly more, Bolin hoped that the use of one of the only two precious grenades would help do his work for him. He risked a glance around the corner and counted four shadowy forms as they emerged from the open doorway. The unmistakable shapes of SMGs held low were evident even in the darkness. The soldier ducked out of view a moment before the grenade exploded. He could feel the heat of the blast as some of the fragments whooshed past his head. 
Bolin came around the corner, the HK-53 tracking for targets. All four of his opponents lay on the ground. One was actually missing a leg, another was dead, and the others were spread out in a bizarre fashion. Bolin knew they were suffering, but he couldn't risk mercy rounds at this stage of the game. He kicked one weapon out of reach from those who were still alive, and then proceeded through the door. The executioner's shoulder rolled in time to avoid being chopped to shreds by a pair of gunners firing AK-74s. He came to one knee and fired the HK-53 on the rise. A burst of 5.56 millimeter NATO rounds took the first gunner in the chest, tearing holes through his back and ripping apart heart and lungs. The second gunman tried to avoid Boland's fire, the initial volley missing vital organs and catching him in the legs as he dived for cover. He hit the floor hard and died under a fresh salvo before he could recover from the assault. Bolin moved through the factory now, looking for new targets. Thus far, he'd seen only Caucasian or Hispanic faces among the opposition, no Scarlet Dragon types, which meant Carrillo was still in charge of the operation here, at least for a few minutes longer. The executioner met two more attackers on the far side of the factory as they crashed through a side door and ran toward the front. Both men were dressed in knight's clothing, wearing sport jackets, and carrying oversized gym bags. How they had expected to get far toting the heavy bags remained a mystery, but Boland didn't wait for introductions. He took the first one high in the chest as the guy ran past him and reached inside his jacket. The high-velocity slugs slammed into his body, seemingly pinning his arm inside his coat and spinning him away. The bag flew from his fingers as he landed face first, his arm still pinned beneath him. The other guy unloaded his baggage, obviously in favor of self-preservation, and tried to draw a bead on the executioner from one knee. Bolin rushed to cover behind a pole in time to avoid being ventilated by a hail of 45 caliber slugs from the shooter's semi-automatic pistol. Bolin waited until the guy had stopped firing, and he heard the pop of a magazine before emerging from cover just enough to snap aim the HK-53 and blow him away. Four more gunmen appeared from the other side of the warehouse, emerging from a room bathed with light. He could see the multiple levels of glass vials and vats attached to layers of tubes. It was the stepping room, the area where they processed the chemicals necessary to refine their product into street-ready drugs. The executioner knew the processes required copious amounts of flammable chemicals. This was a perfectly happy alternative. As the quartet of protectors armed with Uzis charged his position, the chemists and cleaners working in the makeshift laboratory burst from their hiding positions and tried to make good their escape. Boland dealt with the armed opposition first, taking out two with a controlled burst from the HK-53 before they could get a fix on him. He made a beeline for another pole, reaching the cover even as the remaining pair fanned out and tried to flank him. Boland kept moving, confident these guys weren't up for a confrontation with a combat-hardened warrior. The executioner's assessment was correct. He charged the closer guy in a game of human chicken, surprising an enemy who didn't know what to make of this big madman dressed like a commando. Bolin waited until he was less than ten yards from the gunner, then knelt and opened fire, cutting down his opponent. The remaining gunner turned to escape, realizing the odds had been even. Bolin raised his weapon and took the guy out, reluctant to leave a surviving hard man. Bolin waited another moment or two, stealing himself and preparing to defend against any further attacks. He'd learned long ago that impatience was the number one killer of soldiers. Professionals waited for the enemy in most cases because it was in the haste of their movement that they usually made fatal mistakes. The executioner knew that next to assumption and underestimation, impulsiveness on the part of his opponents could be used to great advantage. After nearly a minute of silence, Bolin rose from his position and moved toward the lab. He quickly scanned the room and took in the death. An almost euphoric feeling swept over him, and he realized he was being exposed to the chemicals used by Carrillo's people to peddle death throughout American youth culture. Another very large batch of stuff was being processed, and it would never hit the streets. Bolin uncapped a small cylindrical tube on his LBE harness and withdrew a single wooden match from inside the case. He clasped the stick between his fingers and struck the white tip with his thumbnail. The chemical vapors were beginning to overpower him, so he tossed the match onto the first flammable area he saw and immediately left, closing the doors behind him. The heat would build enough inside the high-ceilinged room 
to where eventually it would create a flashover and blow the place sky high. He went back to the two dead men wearing suits and quickly inspected their bags, which both held money and heroin. The money was probably for the attorneys in Houston to launder. The drugs? Probably for the attorneys themselves. The executioner hoisted both bags onto one shoulder and made haste for the front exit. Bolin left the factory and trotted along the dock toward the boat, sweeping the muzzle of the HK-53 side to side, ready for more enemy troops. He reached the small cabin cruiser unchallenged, unloaded the bags on a cushioned seat in the main hold, and then proceeded to the controls. The executioner eyed the panel with a practiced eye, finally locating the starter switch. He untied the mooring lines, shoved the power stick forward, and steered away from the dock. The nighttime sky was suddenly lit with a brilliant flash as the lab exploded. Glass shards blew from the darkened windows, the echoes of secondary explosions rolling through the air. Bolin glanced back with satisfaction. It was just another battle won, but he knew it would infuriate Jose Carrillo. Eventually, the executioner knew he would have to deal with the Mexican drug lord, but for now, he had damaged him severely. Rajero indicated this was probably a major processing center. Now it was ashes. Let Carrillo chew on that for a while. Bolin kept to the center of the Rio Grande, preventing any trouble from flanking him out of the riverside brush. The tree branches grew outward, well away from the shore, and it would have been foolish to open himself to attack from above, especially in the dark. There were pirates on both sides of the border to worry about, as much as enemy troops. Everything had gone like clockwork so far, but the numbers were running down, and he knew there would be a limit to his effectiveness. Time could be the great enemy or supreme ally, depending on how the executioner used it. In either case, he would move the drugs across the Rio Grande and up the path they usually went. It was highly improbable that he'd make contact with law enforcement, particularly if Rayero's allegations about the Carrillo bribery network were true. In any case, Mac Bolin could find satisfaction in one thing. Another arm of the Carrillo drug empire had officially been severed. Much of Laporte, Texas, still slept when Mac Bolin arrived. The lights of the bay town burned brightly, serving as comforting beacons for the Houston ship channel. Laporte was a town of more than 40,000 people, but it still had a friendly, small-town atmosphere. Many areas were green and lush, fed by the waters of the Gulf of Mexico. The executioner was counting on moving the drug money he'd acquired off the boats and into Houston without trouble. It would be time to put in another call to Stony Man to see if Intel had turned up evidence that established Carrillo's legal contact in Houston. Then he would implement a little roll camouflage and see what information he could squeeze the guy for. He needed to know Carrillo's other major points of distribution. Rayero's information was good, but he didn't know how reliable, especially since most of it had been obtained by street snitches and government informants some time back. Drug dealers regularly moved their operations to keep anyone from getting too close or too comfortable with the information. Personnel were kept to a minimum. Chemists who worked in the labs made good money only because they knew the risks were high, and it was always possible they could become expendable. It was ironic yet sad how drug processing had become such a science. There was no point in dealers and drug lords like Carrillo putting junk on the streets that wasn't cut correctly. Enough customers were lost to drug programs and overdoses or wound up in jail. Good dealers would generally go to great lengths to make sure the product they dispersed was of decent quality and safety. Drug dealers figured dead users were unprofitable. Olin moored his boat at an inconspicuous dock and disembarked. Both bags slung over his shoulder. One of the duffels now contained the full stash of drugs and money. He had the Beretta within reach beneath a light blue windbreaker, which he donned during his trip up the waterway. He'd cleaned the combat cosmetics from his face and stashed the HK-53 and LBE harness in the other bag. The black suit would have looked suspicious in broad daylight, but given the windbreaker, bags, and the time of mourning, the few people he did pass didn't give him more than a cursory glance and a smile. The executioner had learned that much of roll camouflage was appearance, He'd learned that success came when he could appear to be what someone expected him to be, rather than trying to pull off an act. His tactics had proved effective time and again throughout his war against the Mafia, and now they were going to aid him once more. 
Olin quickly located a phone booth and called Stony Man. He glanced at his watch. Zero five twenty-four hours. They would already be up and moving at the farm by now. At least Kurtzman was, because he answered the phone. Bear, it's Stryker. Yeah, we've sort of been keeping tabs. Mark one for the good guys. What did you find out about Carrillo's lawyer? We got a name and address for you, and the information seems pretty reliable. Carrillo got nailed on a petty charge for illegal possession of a firearm when he was visiting here in the States. He has some pretty powerful friends in the Mexican government, so they managed to get him a slap on the wrist and back to Chihuahua before the ink was dry on the judge's order. The attorney he used was a guy named Mario Ibanez. What do we know about him? He's a slick, high-priced legal eagle for some large Houston law firm, but known to consort with some pretty shady characters, including several oil and industrial tycoons. Kurtzman gave him the address. He once got popped for an open and shut drug charge, but his father's a judge and his cousin is a well-known attorney. I'm sure you don't need the details. Sounds like our guy. That was our assessment as well. But Hal wanted me to tell you to be extra careful. Ibanez apparently travels with a consortium of bodyguards and lowlifes. No big surprise, given his clientele. You'll be lucky to even get close enough to deliver your message. We'll see. Thanks for the information, Bear. And thank Hal for me, too. Sure thing. If you need anything else, call. Understood. Out. Now he had a name. Houston, Texas. Two hours and a change of clothes later, Olin stood in the lobby of Ibanez's Houston law offices wearing a three-piece suit and carrying a very large briefcase. The secretary behind the desk was calling her boss now to announce him. She looked at Bolin, the phone pressed to her ear. Mr. Ibanez would like to know who sent you, Mr. Belasco. Tell him Ponchos. Ponchos. Yes, sir, I understand. Okay. He'll see you right away, sir. Thanks. Olin tossed her a disarming grin. She inclined her head and showed him into Ibanez's office. The place was spacious and filled with expensive furniture. There was a huge desk just in front of a large tinted window that offered a tremendous view of the city. A bookshelf lined one wall, crammed with classics and law books. Olin had to admit that the attorney spared no expense to keep up appearances. He was directed to a seat in front of Ibanez's desk, which had a plaque that read Mario Ibanez, Esquire. There were various certificates, degrees, and other honoraria adorning the walls throughout the room, in addition to some very rare and expensive paintings, including a Picasso. The man who entered a moment later from a side door was well-dressed, with manicured fingernails and gelled black hair. His skin was very dark, as were his eyes, and there was no mistaking his Hispanic descent. The man was unusually tall and moved with self-importance. The executioner had to admit that Ibanez wasn't what he'd expected. Olin stood as the guy came over and reached out a hand. So, Mr. Belasco, Pancho sent you? Yes. He directed Bolin to sit, and then took a seat behind his desk. Bolin pretended not to hear the two men who had entered from another door and were now standing behind him. He could generally sense their presence although he didn't dare risk a glance to size them up. As long as he could play the inferior and act as if he were there on friendly terms, he didn't pose a threat. That would keep Ibanez off guard long enough to get the information he needed. I'm a bit surprised you're here. After all, Pontius doesn't generally tend to send his people directly to me in this fashion. We usually meet somewhere a bit more, uh, how would you say, neutral? Okay, so he changed his plans. And how is he? He's not good. Really? The executioner could already see where the conversation was going. Certainly Carrillo knew by now that someone was hitting his businesses all over the Southwest. He obviously wasn't going to be happy about that, and Bolin knew if he acted too chummy that Ibanez would immediately become suspicious, especially given the fact that the attorney was probably one of the few who knew about Carrillo's operations at large. It would only stand to reason that Carrillo might suspect Ibanez as being behind the hits. A meeting like this would have then been arranged, and Bolin could play the part of a Carrillo lackey looking to feel out each of the drug lord's associates. Someone has been very unpleasant toward Mr. Carrillo. Bolin produced a slight frown, as if the very thought of it were distasteful. And he suspects me? He suspects everyone at the moment, Mr. Ibanez, even me. 
I know about the trouble he's had, but I have no idea who's behind it. Mr. Carrillo figured you'd say that. And? And he told me that if you said that, he would know it was the truth. The comment seemed to please Ibanez immensely. It was entirely possible that just the opposite was true. The Kong Lok Triad was an extensive organization with its fingers into every imaginable aspect of the underworld. But that didn't mean it had information on all of Carrillo's operations. The Triad's intelligence was coming from somewhere. The network it had on the streets wasn't that considerable. Barbara Price had indicated that until recently the Kong Lok Triad wasn't very active in the States. It hadn't occurred to the executioner until just that moment. It was possible the Triad already had its claws into Ivanez, who was providing inside information. But if the attorney was nervous about being discovered, he was pretty good at covering it. You can assure Ponchos that we're behind him 100%, Mr. Belasco. If he needs anything, you let him know that I'm at his disposal. I'm certain he'll be pleased to hear that. Now, let's dispense with the nice-nice and talk business. You know why I'm here? The lawyer nodded at the briefcase. You have a delivery to make, I assume? Yes, but I'll get to that in a moment. There's another issue we should discuss first. It has to do with the punks who are cutting into Mr. Carrillo's business. I assume you know who I mean. Ibanez began studying his fingernails. Well, I don't know who it could be, but I know they've been troublesome. Olin had to wonder how much more perfect the crooked attorney's hands could get. The guy probably already had a manicurist on 24-hour call, but he seemed to have a fetish about his nails. He kept looking at them, becoming distracted and distant as he talked to his visitor. Troublesome doesn't even come close. Last night, somebody canceled the operation in Brownsville. There's not much left of it except a smoldering pile of ashes. I barely got out alive. Something in Ibanez's expression changed, and there was an edge to him now. That was a particular piece of news he hadn't expected. This told Boland two things. The guy knew about the Brownsville plant, but he had expected to hear someone had taken it over, not destroyed it. Now Boland was very suspicious that perhaps Ibanez was working for the Kong Lok Triad. It was time to sweeten the pot with an offer he just couldn't refuse. An offer that wouldn't only bring the Triad to him, but also set the stage for knocking out two birds with one stone. This is only one part of the actual take. The rest of it ended up in El Paso, since we couldn't risk bringing it directly here. I'm taking a big chance sending you this much. You'll also find a little extra set aside for your trouble. What trouble? Ibanez splayed his hands in an attempted gesture of innocence. The executioner wasn't buying it. Mr. Carrillo needs you to take yourself and some of your people and pick up the rest of the stuff tonight in El Paso. He's left it in the care of our Border Patrol friends. I assume you know who I mean? Yes, of course. Uh, but why does he need me to go? Because you're one of the few he trusts. Olin could sense the increased tension of the men behind him, but he didn't hear them make a move. Mr. Carrillo is finding it difficult to put faith in any of his business associates right now. Consider yourself one of the lucky ones. I understand. I will take care of it personally. I'm sure you will. Now it was time to get some answers. Mr. Carrillo wanted me to ask you something. What is it? He wanted to know where else you think they might hit him. He wants to get your take on this thing. He wants to know what other locations might be threatened. Well, I'm certain the operations in Las Vegas are in trouble, particularly where much cash is trading hands. Like? Like the Milburn House and the Del De Lux Casino. What about some of the remote locations, such as El Paso? Well, that's possible, although I think it's too close to his home operations. However, there are the major holdings here in Houston, although I think those are safe. For the most part, anyway. Of course. And then let us not forget San Luis Rio, Colorado, Laredo, Nogales, and Mexicali. Ah, blessed Mexicali. The executioner found the man's behavior strange now. He couldn't determine what was so special about Mexicali. Although the capital city of the Baja was a major traffic route for narcotics, everyone knew it, but nobody seemed to want to do anything about it. It was easier for the DEA to protect the high-profile areas, such as Miami, because of the natural boundaries of water, but the Baja-California-U.S. border didn't enjoy that much fortune, and the natural maintenance of such a large area naturally required a high number of personnel. Nonetheless, 
Olin knew that whoever controlled that part of the border controlled every bit of the drug trafficking that found its way into San Diego and the distribution pipelines that ran from it. Most of the dope that found its way across the northern part of the Southwest Strip, from Los Angeles to Denver, could claim its source through Mexicali and the surrounding areas. Olin left the briefcase on the desk and got up to leave. I'll pass on your observations to him. The meet is scheduled for 11 o'clock tonight. Be on time. Mr. Carrillo doesn't want a repeat of the incident a few days ago in Brownsville. He doesn't yet know about what happened last night. I get the privilege of having to break the news upon my return to Mexico. Ibanez stood as well. His eyes narrowed. Ah, uh, I've never met you before. Conrado has always handled these kinds of things for Panchos. Just who exactly are you? You can ask Mr. Carrillo tonight, although I doubt he'll tell you. You mean he's going to be there tonight? You have a hearing problem. I already said that Mr. Carrillo doesn't trust anybody right now. He'll be there to oversee the operation and make sure nothing goes wrong. Okay, I, I understand. Good. Bolin turned to leave, but then abruptly stopped. Just a friendly bit of advice, Counselor. Don't do anything foolish tonight. My boss is trusting, but he's no fool. Oh, I wouldn't think of crossing him, Mr. Balasco. Bolin smiled. As he turned... He made a show of acting startled to see two rough-looking bodyguards standing near the office doors. Their muscular chests and broad shoulders pressed against the tailored suits, which threatened to burst at the seams. In addition to their menacing expressions and general size, Bolin also had to assume they were carrying hardware beneath the jackets. Bolin opened the door between them. You guys are good. I didn't even hear you come in. With that said, Bolin left the office of Mario Ibanez. He knew within just 12 hours he would be dropping the hammer on the very same man. Hopefully, if fate was with him, he'd strike his first blow against the Kung Lok triad as well. Although they didn't know it, the Scarlet Dragons were about to experience the Executioner's Fury for the very first time. And it would be an experience they wouldn't soon forget. Jack Grimaldi broke into a wide grin when he saw the executioner enter one of the tea hangers at Ellington Field at 1100 hours sharp. The two men shook hands, and then Grimaldi quickly led the executioner through the terminal and out to where a plane awaited. It wasn't the Gulf Stream 21C that Bolin had expected, but instead a Bell Cardoen 206L3 Bakito helicopter, a civilian version of the Bell OH-58A Kiowa, the Cardoen 206L3 was fast, reliable, and very popular for commercial use. It would serve its purpose perfectly, and Bolin mentally commended his friend for the choice. Grimaldi had to have sensed the executioner's appraisal. She's not fully armed like an army chopper, but Hal figured you wanted to keep a low profile. I do. It's perfect, Jack. Thanks. Where to? Our first stop's El Paso, but I've bought us a little time. This thing is much bigger than I imagined. That's why I asked Hal to bring you in on it. I hope you don't mind cutting short your R&R. &R. Not at all. I was just sitting around the hotel room and cooling my heels with a tumbler of scotch. Frankly, I was pretty bored. Now I know why Lyons and McCarter are always bellyaching about never enough action. Yeah, well, Lyons and McCarter should learn how to relax once in a while. <laughs> exactly right. So, what's the gig? Well, I don't know how much Hal told you, but I hope you signed on for some action, because you're going to get it. Blitz play? In a nutshell. You brought the maps? In the chopper. Olin stepped into the cramped cargo area of the Cardoan, and quickly located an ammo can that contained a score of U.S. maps in different versions, including sectional, regional, topographical, and aerial satellite reconnaissance. He yanked a topographical from the labeled folders inside the can and spread it out on his bags. Grimaldi stepped onto the strut and leaned inward, careful to keep his cigarette outside the confines of the chopper. Here's the plan. Bolin traced his finger on the path as he described it. We're going to head into El Paso first. I've set the bait in a parking area across from the Border Patrol offices, inside an underground parking facility. Once I've got the enemy inside, they're all mine. Bob mentioned something about the Kung Lok triad. What's all that about? That's only part of this deal. Do you remember my mission a few years ago against the Mexican drug cartel? <laughs> Who could forget it? We were all over the countryside, both in Central America and here. I don't think I've ever clocked so many hours on a single mission. We bounced all over the map. Yeah, well, not much has changed. The new guy in town is a dope dealer by the name of Jose Carrillo. 
His influence seems to stretch pretty far, and he's got his fingers deep in a lot of pies. The action has apparently proved profitable for him. Profitable enough to turn heads in the Kung Lok. How high does it go? I don't know yet, but I have a name. The Kung Lok operation is being enforced by the Scarlet Dragons under the leadership of a guy named Ying Kao Chu. His people are being supplied with weapons by Dim Mai. The Asian arms dealer? Those are some pretty heavy hitters, Sarge. Well, it seems they've turned their eyes on Carrillo's business. I guess the profit outweighs the risks. So Kung Lok is prepared to do war with Mexican mafia? And they've picked this country as the battleground. The Kung Lok controls the entertainment industry in Canada. If memory serves, the head of the organization is a guy named Lao Ming Shui, aka Merciless Ming. I've heard the name, although I was never sure of the connection before. So where else are you planning to hit? In addition to El Paso, I know they have operations in Las Vegas and San Diego. Although I'm betting the payload is going to be somewhere along the border. Any ideas? Well, if it were me, Nogales and Laredo wouldn't be worth it. They're small potatoes. Agreed. There's no evidence Carrillo has a major influence in these areas anyway. The attorney that handles his business here in the States said that they have operations there, but there's no evidence to prove these are major locations. There has to be a central pipeline. Okay, so that leaves either El Paso, San Luis, or Mexicali, or maybe all three. Hell, I don't know, Sarge. That's a lot of area for just the two of us to cover. Mexicali is the California pipeline, more or less. But that might seem too obvious to law enforcement. This attorney talked about it like it was the be-all and end-all. If we're going to shut down this operation, we'll have to shut it down for good. That means I'll have to go up against both Carrillo's people and the Kung Lok. But we aren't sure who has what right now. Maybe not, but Carrillo obviously has influence in El Paso. It's possible he might try the same play in Mexicali, but I don't have enough information to make that assumption with certainty. We'll have to see how it goes, Jack. The more intelligence I have, the easier this will be for both of us. Like I said, Sarge, I'm in this for the long haul. I'll be here as long as you need me. Thanks, Jack. The executioner looked at his watch and realized he hadn't slept in a while. How long do you think it'll take us to get there? How much time you need to spare? Say, 15 minutes from drop-off. Range on this thing isn't that great, so there'll be one fuel stop in San Angelo. With a cruising range of about 118 miles per hour, I guess probably five hours, give or take. That gives us about five hours to catch some shut-eye. It's going to be a long night, and I especially don't want you falling asleep at the wheel. Shucks, I didn't know you cared. As the clock struck 22.30 hours, Boland broke out the two crates of gear Grimaldi had brought with him. He began to inventory their contents as the pilots sipped on the thermos of coffee they had acquired in San Angelo. Grimaldi had managed to put together quite a bit of stuff on his alleged short notice. Among other basics like MREs and standard supplies, there was an impressive amount of weaponry. One box contained an MP5 SD6, the silenced counterpart of the MP5 line of SMGs. Not only was this one of the best weapons available in the Stony Man arsenal, but it was also an extremely accurate weapon. There were also 20 loaded 30-round magazines of lead-cored 9mm ball ammunition for the weapon. The other box contained various tools, including 25 pounds of C4 plastique, a spare Beretta 93R with shoulder holster, and 10 deal DM-51 grenades, weighing less than a pound each and containing PETN high explosive. The DM-51 had a special feature. It could be used as an offensive or defensive grenade. When Bolin operated in offensive mode, the grenade generated a significant blast with very little fragmentation. A hollow plastic sleeve, which was filled with more than 6,000 2-millimeter steel balls, could then be added for a defensive effect. The high-velocity fragments propelled by the explosion would decimate any enemy soldiers within its 25-square-meter effective range. Bolin activated the headphone set in back that linked him with Grimaldi in the cockpit. Nice job on the equipment, Jack. My pleasure. The executioner checked his watch. True to Grimaldi's words, it had taken them just over five hours to get to El Paso. Bolin nodded, well aware the approaching lights visible through the window signaled their proximity to the city. He'd make the meeting on time, barring any unforeseen trouble. The plan was to spring the surprise on the Kung Lok, and he was certain they would show. There was very little doubt that Carrillo wasn't the only one from whom Ibanez took payments. At least now, he had some answers. 
He knew where the major holdings were. These would undoubtedly be the targets for the Kong Lok triad. The only question remaining was where they would hit. It might have been better to simply let the triad do away with Kariyo, and then he would only have to bring war against a single enemy. But if there was to be violence and bloodshed on American streets, then the executioner had a responsibility to make sure the destruction was kept to a minimum and the bloodshed was kept to the enemy. Olin wouldn't let this war get out of control. He couldn't just stand by idly and watch these devils cut down innocent bystanders, hard-working men and women looking to just survive or support and protect their children, were no match against heartless savages armed with automatic weapons. Four-minute ETA, Sarge. Olin threw the pilot a thumbs up and then armed himself. He slid into the double holster for the Beretta 93Rs and shoved the weapons with extended magazines into their respective spots beneath his armpits. He then slung the MP5 SD6 and filled his fanny pack with several DM-51 grenades. The Desert Eagle rode in military webbing on his hip and a Colt combat knife was sheathed on his thigh. Grimaldi held up a finger. One minute to ground zero. Olin nodded as the chopper dipped toward the city lights. The Kung Lok Triad wouldn't just stand around the parking garage and wait for his assault. He would have to seek them out and then implement his plan. And that plan spelled out only one thing, complete annihilation. A moment later, the chopper landed on the rooftop helipad of the U.S. Border Patrol parking garage. And Mac Bolin jumped from the chopper, prepared to meet his destiny. <laughs> The executioner shoved his six-foot-three, 200-pound frame against the roof door and splintered it off its hinges. He descended the stairwell, tracking the area ahead with the MP5 SD6. With standard ammunition, the MP5 sound suppressor reduced muzzle velocity in such a way that the sound was no louder than the air brakes on a panel truck. In single-shot bursts, the sound was unrecognizable to the untrained ear as a silenced machine pistol and single-shot accuracy was high within 100 meters. The soft neoprene pads glued to the soles of Boland's combat boots would further enable him to maintain some covert movement. That would prove to his advantage, since his first encounter with four Kong Lok ambushers didn't occur in quite the way they were expecting. The Chinese gunman turned just in time to see Boland come around the corner of the stairwell landing, lower the muzzle of his weapon, and squeeze the trigger. The first two 9mm parabellum rounds chewed through the closest gunman's jaw, splattering flesh onto his Scarlet Dragon brothers. He staggered backward, the weight of his toppling body interfering with the remaining trio since they had foolishly clustered themselves on the stairwell. Olin seized the advantage, pressing forward and shooting another dragon gunner who was trying to push his dead cohort away while simultaneously clawing shoulder leather for his pistol. The other pair tried to retreat down the stairs. One got his hand on the door handle before Boland fired twice, both rounds going through the gunner's right kidney and exiting his belly to lodge in the metal door. The dragon was slammed face first into the door by the force of Boland's slugs. He slid to the ground, his dead weight now effectively blocking the only exit. The remaining dragon paused a moment, obviously torn between the decision to run or fight. He chose to fight, managing to clear a Jadamatic from beneath his long leather trench coat and aim it in Boland's direction. The executioner was already triggering his weapon, but then a very familiar and a very bad sound reached his ears. The weapon's extractor jammed on the shot, the bullet straying low and effectively locking out further fire until the breach could be cleared. Boland dived for the stairs, the bodies of the fallen saving him from a very painful landing and broken bones. He completed a roll and got to his knees, the Colt combat knife now cleared from its sheath, the warrior drove the blade into the Kung Lok terrorist solar plexus, sinking it to the hilt. The body fell prone onto the landing after Bolin yanked the knife from its belly. He picked up the MP5 SD6 and expertly cleared the double feed. A quick inspection of the breach revealed no visible damage. The weapon was safe to continue using. The executioner keyed up the microphone to the wireless headset that kept him in communication with Grimaldi. Eagle One, this is Stryker. Go ahead. I ran into trouble here. The cat's out of the bag, so I won't meet you topside. Go to plan B for our rendezvous point. Roger, Striker. Eagle one out. Anytime they had a mission together, an alternate plan for pickup was chosen. This was usually predetermined, and then Grimaldi would await the executioner's signal. 
In the event Bolin got out of contact and didn't show at the scheduled rendezvous point, Grimaldi would automatically proceed to the alternate area and wait for an agreed amount of time. If still a no-show, Grimaldi was to assume that Bolin was either dead or unavoidably detained, and he was to beat feet out of the LZ and cool his heels until it was established the executioner was alive or dead. Now Bolin was less than three minutes into this mission, and he already had trouble. Even within the concrete and steel confines of the stairwell, somebody was sure to hear the automatic fire. If the enemy could pinpoint the executioner's location before he could complete the mission, everything would end right there. That would undoubtedly put finality on the situation, and whether Brognola could take over with Able Team or Phoenix Force was anybody's guess. Still, the executioner wasn't planning to give up just yet on his plans. The mission was still salvageable, as far as Bolin was concerned, and there were numerous Kung Lok gunners in that garage who needed to be dealt with. Bolin decided to take each level one at a time. He'd left instructions for the meet to take place on the ground floor, so the Scarlet Dragons he'd encountered on level four had obviously been posted as sentries. He reached a door labeled L3 without incident and entered the garage proper, sweeping the darkened parking area with the muzzle of the MP5. Most of the spaces were empty, giving the executioner a clear line of sight. He sprinted across the open space and had almost reached the center partition of the ramp when the sounds of squealing tires and a powerful engine reached his ears. A moment later, a van rounded the corner and raced toward him as he sought cover behind a concrete support. The van screeched to a halt, and a half dozen scarlet dragons jumped from the rear and side doors. They wore black fatigue pants, scarlet t-shirts, and combat boots. The gunners fanned out, machine pistols and automatic rifles held at the ready. Bolin turned the selector switch to three round bursts, leveled the MP5 SD6, and opened fire on the gunmen. Most of them ducked, keeping low and in motion. Two immediately fell under the executioner's crack marksmanship. A burst of 9mm parabellum rounds spit from the muzzle, tearing through one dragon hard man and continuing into the guy immediately behind him. Bolin squeezed the trigger repeatedly, laying down a hail of auto fire that took the gunners by surprise. The remaining four continued moving, spreading themselves as far apart as possible and returning Bolin's fire with a fury of their own. The executioner ducked behind the pillar as enemy rounds whistled past, some of them chewing concrete chips from the pillar, while others scored deep gouges in the slick pavement. Bolin yanked one of the DM-51s from his harness and pulled the pin. He poked his head around the corner, fired off a few three-round bursts, and then rolled the grenade in the general direction of the enemy troops. The Scarlet Dragons realized their mistake, the smooth outside walls offering no suitable cover from the blast. The best they could do was hit the pavement and press themselves flat as the DM-51 exploded, showering the area with the superheated pellets. Another gunman died immediately, too close to the grenade to escape its deadly blast. The others were far enough out to escape the deadly fragments, but the concussive blast was disorienting in the confines of the garage. Bolin emerged from cover and knelt. He tracked the MP5 onto the nearest Chinese enforcer and squeezed the trigger. One round connected with the gunman's shoulder, flipping him onto his side, and the remaining pair of slugs decimated his face. The executioner was already aiming at the second gunner, who was trying to align his sights on him. He found his mark before the guy could pose any real threat. The bullet split open his skull, cracking bones and shredding brain matter on the way through. The remaining Scarlet Dragon got to his feet, shooting wildly in Bolin's direction, the shots going high and wide. The gunman was trying for the door where Bolin had made his entry. The executioner raised his weapon, took a breath, and squeezed the trigger as he let half out and steadied the chattering weapon. The 9mm parabellum rounds caught the dragon at the small of his back just as he was opening the door. The force of the bullets pushed him through the opening, depositing him onto the floor in a dead heap. The door closed, propped open maybe a foot by the pair of lifeless legs protruding from the doorway. The executioner started to rise, but paused a moment when a flash of movement registered in his peripheral vision. He turned in time to see the driver and a passenger in the van raise their weapons, in time to hear the crack of their pistols as they opened fire, in time to realize he'd made a fatal mistake, in time to feel the first round punch through his body. Mario Ibanez sat in the back seat of his rented limousine and glanced nervously at his watch. The limo was parked a half mile up the street, the entrance to the parking garage in view. The Kong Lok Scarlet Dragons were inside the structure right at that moment, checking things out 
and clearing any potential threats. Despite his early morning visit from the guy who claimed to be an employee of Carrillo, Ibanez wasn't stupid. He wouldn't put himself in any position that could result in getting his ass shot off, unless he first knew the place was secure. Ibanez hadn't been able to reach either Carrillo or Zapetas. That wasn't unusual, considering it was Saturday. It might not have even meant a thing, but Ibanez wasn't going to take that chance. If this was a legit meeting, he'd find out soon enough. Not to mention the fact that his business partners were anxious to get their money. Ibanez had decided not to mention the fact he'd gotten his cut and then some. Why slit his own throat? He was the key to Carrillo's laundering operation anyway. And if what this Belasco character had said was true, Carrillo was still as trusting and foolish where it came to Ibanez's loyalties as the Mexican drug lord had ever been. Besides, Ibanez really did have a good thing going here. He wouldn't throw it away on the word of just anyone. The cow chews people take the heat if there was going to be trouble. For all he knew, it was Carrillo or Zapetas who had set up this whole thing. Perhaps Belasco had been sent to lure him into a hit. After all, Pancho's had as big a reputation for taking care of traitors as he did for rewarding loyalty. Frankly, Ibanez was just about ready to get out of the business altogether anyway. Just as soon as the Kung Lok triad was in control and he had the rest of what was coming to him, Ibanez was going to disappear forever. The sound of a chopper passing overhead caused him to stiffen. He peered up through the heavily tinted windows of the limo and watched as the low-flying chopper passed overhead. He continued to watch it move away and then relaxed and let out a sigh when he realized he'd been holding his breath. <sighs> Relax, Mario. You're being paranoid. Everything's cool. The attorney reached into the wet bar and poured himself a drink. Weekend traffic was pretty heavy, but not so much that he felt out of place. Once this meeting went off, or maybe if it went off, he'd have the boys take him out for a late dinner somewhere. But there was a plane awaiting him at the El Paso airport. Well, screw those bastards. They could wait, too, as far as he gave a shit, and that was that. Ibanez sucked down the full tumbler of scotch and then poured another half full and set it on his lap. Bertie Gutierrez opened the back door of the limousine and squeezed his large frame into a seat across from his boss. The attorney's chief enforcer was a loyal companion. He was the only one Ibanez trusted. Any word yet? Nothing yet, Mario. Well, I'm getting sick and tired of sitting on my ass. I'm hungry and I'm tired. How long does it take to check that garage? It's only four levels, for God's sake. I don't know, sir. Do you want me to take a walk down there? No. I don't want you to do anything but sit here and keep me company, Bertie. What do you think of that Belasco guy? Yeah, seemed all right. You think he's really working for Carrillo? Or do you think it's a setup? Jeez, Mario, you've asked me that a hundred times already. I don't know who the guy is. Well, I'm asking you again! Ibanez could feel his face go flush, and Gutierrez promptly shut his mouth. He knew they hated him when he was in this kind of mood. Hell, he didn't like himself when he was in this kind of mood. <sighs> I'm sorry I lost my cool, Bertie. Let's just forget it, okay? Okay, boss. He's forgotten. Ibanez knew he would just have to sit there and wait for word from the lieutenant leading the Scarlet Dragons. He'd have to answer nicely when he got the report and kissed the man's ass because he worked directly for Ing Kao Chu, and Kao Chu just happened to be Ibanez's meal ticket for the time being. Not that any of that mattered. As it turned out, he wouldn't need to worry much about anything. Fate or some unknown deity, had been with Mac Bolin. Because while his movements might have been fatal, the bullets that ripped across his body didn't hit areas that would result in death. One grazed the small of his back, and the other pierced his left calf. The subgun flew from Bolin's fingers as he stumbled and fell. He managed to execute a half-decent shoulder roll, clenching his teeth and growling against the pain in his leg and back. The executioner got to one knee, both of the Berettas now clutched in his fists. He fired in succession, the weapons barking with thunderous reports as the 158-grain 9mm lead core slugs rocketed across the garage and struck his enemy. Two rounds from one of the pistols punched neat little holes in the driver's chest, ripping through lung and heart tissue and blowing out part of the gunman's spine. 
the passenger took twice as many rounds from the executioner's pistols, the 9mm slugs blowing out his kneecap, throat, and the top of his skull. Bolin climbed to his feet, scooped up the machine pistol and tucked it under his arm, and then hobbled to the van. He knew the fight wasn't over, but he didn't have time to worry about further enemy troops until they presented a threat. It was entirely possible there were Scarlet Dragon reinforcements on their way, but he couldn't allow that fact to divert him from his mission. He still had Ibanez to deal with, if he could lure the guy, and the van would provide him the opportunity. Plus, it wouldn't be long before he'd have to get some medical attention. It wouldn't do him any good to stay and fight longer, only to die of infection perhaps a week from now, or even a day. I believe this is your stop, pal. The executioner stepped gingerly but quickly into the van, put it in gear, and swung the vehicle into a 180. He powered down the garage ramp, thankful that his left calf had taken the brunt of the trauma, leaving his right one free for the drive. His shoulder was throbbing, and both wounds hurt like hell. Despite the fact he'd been shot dozens of times and come closer to death more times than he could count, familiarity with injury didn't seem to numb the pain. Bolin reached the ground level and started to accelerate as he saw several Kung Lok hardmen attempting to wave him down. He then thought better of it and decided to play along with their game, applying the brakes as he pulled up to the closest man. He stuck his arm out the window, one of the Berettas in his fist, and shot the Triad gunner in the face. The man next to him fell a moment later as the next bullet from Bolin's pistol entered through his chest and blew apart his heart. The last dragon stepped onto the running board on the passenger side while the vehicle was still moving and tried to shoot Bolin through the open door. Bolin ducked back in time to avoid being decapitated by a three-round burst from the guy's machine pistol. The soldier brought the other Beretta 93R into play, flicking the selector switch to three-round burst as he stomped on the brake pedal. The enforcer lost his balance, holding on to the mirror to save himself. The distraction was enough for Bolin to pump three rounds into the dragon before he could regain his balance. He fell from the van, and Bolin stomped on the accelerator. The van emerged onto the street, and the executioner stopped, looking both ways. The sudden flash of lights from a limousine parked a half mile down the street caught his attention. Bolin turned the wheel in the other direction and quickly drove to the next intersection. He'd driven these roads a few days earlier and was familiar with them. Circling the block, he drove past the intersection where the limo was parked. He proceeded one block farther and then turned at the next intersection so that he could move in behind the vehicle. Bolin was making an educated guess that either the head of the Kong Lok was inside the limo or it was Ibanez himself. In either case, they would be expecting the van to contain friendly troops. The executioner was counting on that fact to give him an edge. After he made a left onto the street one block to the rear of the limousine, Bolin detached the remaining two Deal DM-51 grenades from his harness. He removed the sleeves from them to reduce the risk of endangering civilians. The limo was parked in front of a darkened building. There were no passers-by on the street, and he was going to double-park the van to protect passing traffic. As the van drew close, one of the big men Bolin had seen earlier that morning in Ibanez's office emerged from the driver's door. Well, at least he knew which enemy occupied that vehicle. The executioner didn't slow, instead choosing to increase speed until he was practically on top of the limo. The van smashed the bodyguard between the limo and the front fender of the van. Bolin yanked the pins on the DM-51s and tossed them through the open window of the van. They landed on the exposed front seat of the limo. He then jumped from the van and limped away from the scene. A moment later, the limousine erupted with a tremendous blast, the window shattering under the impact of the concussion as a bright orange ball of flame and black smoke emerged from the new openings. The second grenade exploded a moment later, nearly lifting the limousine off the ground. The executioner took the first alleyway and headed in the general direction of the rendezvous point. At least the first stage of the operation was complete. No more money would be laundered in Houston. No more dope processed in Brownsville, and a message had just been sent to the Kung Lok, Cepedas, and with any luck, Jose Pancho Carrillo. A message that the executioner had come to settle just debts in a most permanent fashion, once and for all. Las Vegas, Nevada. In Kao Chu could hardly believe his ears when he was told of the death of a respected lieutenant and more than a dozen of his Scarlet Dragon brothers. He sat in brooding silence in the office of his new home, a home under considerable remodeling after its surrender by Danny Tang. 
leave it to a half-breed to screw up a perfectly suitable place with what amounted to little more than the American version of ancient Chinese art. Well, Tang would no longer present a problem since he had joined those in the afterlife of eternal damnation. This was his punishment for allowing the enemy to steal Zahn and for agreeing to serve as messenger for the man called Belasco. Now he'd lost fifteen more good men, along with any known connections to the operations being conducted in Brownsville and El Paso. Moreover, rumor had it that a firebombing down the street from the Border Patrol parking garage might have been Mario Ibanez, an attorney who provided laundering and distribution services for Carrillo's Houston operations. That now meant three major services had been destroyed, which would effectively cut the Kung Lok profits by half. It would have been easier to take these operations like they had those here in Las Vegas and slowly phase out Carrillo's people once they had an overall handle on the situation. Even as Cao Chu now sat here thinking about it, Lao Ming Shui's plans were falling down around his ears. It was time that they took matters into their own hands. Cao Chu picked up the telephone and immediately called Shui's private home telephone number. He would probably be reprimanded for waking the mastermind from his sleep, but it was important for Lao Ming Shui to know the situation immediately. I would assume that you're calling me at this hour for a good reason. I am very sorry to wake you, but this is important. What has happened? The American that we discussed has struck again. This time he killed more than a dozen of my men and destroyed the processing facility in Brownsville. He may also have killed that attorney who was working for Jose Carrillo. There was almost a minute of dead air. A minute that seemingly lasted so long, Cao Chu wondered if his master had fallen asleep or simply hung up the phone. These weren't the times that Cao Chu relished his position, despite Shui's long-suffering attitude and patience toward his ward and future heir. Cao Chu had earned this right only because he was closer to the underboss than anyone, and Shui had never been able to sire a son. Not that he didn't keep trying, but the man was aging rapidly, and it went against Shui's personal belief system to take more than one wife. What are you planning to do about this situation, Ying? I wasn't sure I would do anything. Your last advice was to wait. You said that he would come to us. I would say that he has. What do we know about this man? We know his name is Belasco, and that he is a competent warrior. If I were to have my own way with him, I would recruit the American dog to fight with us. He also seems to have unlimited resources at his disposal, given the firepower with which he has resisted us. There is already talk among some of my men that he's not real, but rather a spirit that looks real and fights like a demon from the grave. You must cross those rumors immediately, Ing. Such things can be much more dangerous to you than the actual threat. I understand, and I will deal with this. I know that he is just a man, and you know the same. However, he is a formidable opponent, and as I believe we previously discussed, he is dangerous to both the physical and mental well-being of our organization. Not to mention the radical amount of interference he's created in both my plans and the established operations we meant to acquire. My feelings exactly. I will leave this in your hands. This man has become a thorn in your side, and I feel your need to exact vengeance. You may deal with him as you wish, provided it does not alter our timetable. My sources tell me that they think this is the next place he will come. It's possible, but I think to be on the safe side, you should provide him some incentive. What do you mean? Send your men to capture the two women that aided him. The Zahn woman he took from Tong, and the other one that we know helped him in Brownsville. They've been troublesome to us, and I'm sure he has some loyalty to both of them now. Do you think he'll actually worry about them? Belasco is a professional soldier of some kind. Their lives may not matter to him. Perhaps, but I'm not inclined to think so. His hits against Carrillo's people and ours have been precisely timed and carefully orchestrated. Innocents always appear to be out of the way. Even our failed hit in Mexico resulted in no loss of life by those uninvolved. I think he actually cares for people. I think I see. You're going to use this as leverage. Hmm, precisely. You see, Balasco is on the offensive, and he apparently likes to keep it that way. We must change our tactics so that the hunter becomes the hunted, and we put as many of what he considers innocence in the way to keep him on the run. 
Eventually, he must retreat so far that he can go no farther, and then he is trapped. It is an old art form in war, but still a very effective one. I understand. I hope you do, Ing. I hope you understand that the Kung Lok cannot and will not tolerate this man's interference any longer. We've suffered losses that we're already feeling, and I'm sure news of this incident in El Paso will get back to Hong Kong. That will not be good. We must put an end to this now. I will not fail you, Lao. I promise. I'm going to hold you to that. Find the Belasco and finish him. El Paso, Texas. Grimaldi shook his head as he stood in the emergency room of the El Paso Trauma Center and studied the executioner's wounds. There was a large patch on the back of his calf and a second covering his shoulder. Grimaldi had met Bolin at the arranged alternate point, picked him up, and flown him straight to the trauma center. He'd even called ahead to let them know he was bringing the soldier in via helicopter and was planning to land on their roof pad. They used their credentials as DEA agents to get past all of the uncomfortable questions. A chopper bringing in a shot DEA agent in the middle of the night in El Paso probably wasn't the most unusual sight to the hospital staff, and it was certainly explainable if the local authorities showed up. Any details of the incident would be taken care of later by Stony Man, including the erasure of all records from the hospital, DEA and police databases, if necessary, thanks to the handiwork of Aaron Kurtzman. The doctor completed suturing the wounds and administering tetanus and antibiotic shots. You should stay a few days. Uh, sorry, Doc, but no dice on that. I've got work to do. I'm sure your colleagues can handle that. No, they can't. I'd really prefer you stay. I'm not staying, okay? And something in the executioner's eyes had told the doctor it was better to just nod and leave the room from the large and commanding presence as quickly as possible, particularly one with cold blue eyes who was dressed head to toe in a black suit and who'd been shot. The man's entire presence read, Don't argue with me. Now Grimaldi watched as the executioner quickly removed the black suit and rapidly dressed in the street clothes the pilot had brought him from his pack in the chopper. Blue jeans, a red plaid shirt, and a black leather jacket. Bolin had donned one of the holsters, and Grimaldi passed the Beretta over to him. The other holster he slung over his shoulder with nonchalance. With things wrapped up there, they headed for the helipad. Bolin looked at his watch and scowled. It was almost 0500 hours. Time to get moving and head for Las Vegas. Word of what happened there had probably already reached the ears of Carillo and the Triad, which meant that trouble was just around the corner. Grimaldi had taken the chopper to an airfield in El Paso and fueled it, so the aircraft was topped off and ready for action. Once airborne, the executioner used a remote telecommunications server to contact Stony Man. How'd it go? I think I delivered a clear message. Jack already contacted us once. He says you took a hit or two. Nothing too serious. I'll live. We're heading to Las Vegas. The Kung Lok has moved into that area in full force. I figure 48 hours at best to bring them down. I understand. Any word from the man? Yes. He agrees with me that Jose Carrillo and the Kung Lok may be starting a war with each other. He's also suspicious, like we are, that either side might be receiving support from officials within the government. Do you have a clue who these officials might be? Not yet. But if there are high rankers involved, they're doing a good job of keeping a low profile. Our strained relations with the Chinese notwithstanding, it's a good bet that Lao Ming Shui is the man responsible. Being he's in Canada, it's a bit difficult at the moment to track his movements. Nonetheless, the president's gone forward and approved CIA involvement. They're going to be watching him on that end. Shui won't make any move until his people are firmly in place here, Hal. How so? He's an experienced criminal with lots of ties. I agree he's probably running the show, but many triad activities in the past have gone unchecked by the Chinese government. It's not good business for officials in Hong Kong. True. Groups like Shui's feed Chinese politicians with quite a bit of information and intelligence on our activities here. That's why it's always been important for them to maintain some kind of workable relationship. Right. Which is why I think Shui is moving on his own with this one. Do you think there could be any tie to this and Shui's relationship with Dim Mai? Without a question. So we're getting deeper into this all the time. Yeah. Okay, Striker. 
I'm willing to play this your way. I've definitely got enough to involve the rest of the team, but I don't want to step on your toes. I know, Hal, and I appreciate it. But, like I said before, I'm concerned about compromising security. For the time being, I think it's better I keep moving at this on my own. He looked at Grimaldi, who was listening to the conversation through the headset, and flashed him a grin. Besides, I've got Jack with me, and that's more than enough. All right, it's your call. But you know where to reach me. Understood. Out. After Bolin terminated the call, he fell silent and began to think about the next two days. Danny Tang had undoubtedly reached Ing Kao Chu by now and delivered the executioner's message. With the previous night's activities, that meant the Scarlet Dragons would probably be searching for him. He wasn't too concerned that they'd reach him before he reached Las Vegas. There was no reason for Bolin to believe they knew how he was traveling or what his next step was, which gave him the advantage. Bolin would have to strike quick and strike first. That was the only way to keep his strategic advantage and keep the Kong lock on the run. The other issue that had him concerned was Carrillo. There were probably still countless resources the Mexican drug lord had at his disposal, and with the destruction of his Brownsville-Houston pipeline, Carrillo would be looking for payback. If nothing else, Olin would have to keep them coming at him. He could manipulate the situation in such a way that risk to innocence would be minimal. However, if the Kong lock or Carrillo's people were allowed to run rampant, Lots of civilians stood the risk of getting killed. The executioner couldn't allow that to happen, no matter what the costs. And he knew that if he fell, Stony Man would be forced to take over. As he closed his eyes, allowing his body to rest and mend some, the executioner's mind continued to draw closer to his objectives. Slowly, he started forming a plan. Brownsville, Texas. Lisa Rayero and Noreen Zahn sat in Charlie Metzger's office, neither of them very happy to be stuck there waiting for their boss to return. Rayero knew that telling Metzger about Zahn's near demise had probably been a mistake, particularly if he was on Carrillo's payroll. But Zahn had insisted they follow official channels, and with Belasco missing in action, Rayero didn't know where else to turn. She was doing this for her team, but it was against her better judgment. She'd never trusted Metzger, and not because he wasn't a decent enough guy or because he'd mistreated her in any way. It was just a gut instinct, something she'd learned to trust over the years. As far as the rest of the branch personnel for the Brownsville DEA office were concerned, and apparently the suits in Washington as well, Metzger was a model supervisor. He had an outstanding success record, had a loving wife and kids, went to church every Sunday, and lived a clean public life. While there were rumors his record had recently been up for scrutiny, he was generally considered a fair and equitable boss. Still, she couldn't shake the feeling of dread as they told him the story, including the business about Belasco. Rayero couldn't find any way to back out of that because Peter Williams had become concerned that she was in over her head, and he'd gone right to Metzger. The return of her boss to the office shook her from her thoughts. She sat up in her chair self-consciously as he quietly closed the door and sat behind his desk. He leaned forward, folded his hands on his desk with his thumbs touching, and fixed her with a puzzled gaze. We need to talk. He looked at Zahn. Thanks for your time, Noreen. I'm glad to see you in one piece. It appears we owe your life to this Belasco guy, if nothing else. You're dismissed for now, but I want you to stick close until we can do a full debriefing. You're on suspension with pay until this mess is straightened out. Thank you, sir. Zahn inclined her head toward Rajero. But what about Lisa? She's the one who stumbled onto all of this. I'm concerned that maybe the agency is looking at this all wrong. You're questioning my judgment? I've never questioned your judgment, sir. I'm questioning whether the DEA has all the facts here. We'll get to the bottom of it. He looked at Rajero. Believe me. Now, you're dismissed. Yes, sir. Lisa, I'll be waiting outside for you. Rayero nodded, and then Zahn got up and quietly left the office. <laughs> oh, I don't understand, Lisa. When have I ever given you any reason to distrust me? Rayero tried not to squirm in her seat. I don't understand. Cut the bull, Lisa. I know about your affiliation with this Belasco guy, and I know that he went to see Ramon Cepedas of the Border Patrol. We're a tight-knit team down here. 
a team I thought you were a part of. Did you think that these little stunts weren't going to get back to me? Ramon happens to be a friend of mine. Well, then, maybe you ought to find some new friends, Charlie. What's that supposed to mean? It means that your friend has ties with a known drug smuggler and member of the Mexican Mafia. It only took a moment for the expression on Metzger's face to change from that of indignation to realization. You're talking about Jose Carrillo, aren't you? That's exactly who I'm talking about. And what proof do you have of this? The proof that the guns used against us on this most recent bust were in his custody and care. The particular gun we traced was identified as the murder weapon of one Randy Lovato, a drug runner for the Rosares family. I know about the Lovato murder. The FBI ruled it a professional hit. Then why isn't that weapon sitting in a federal evidence lockup instead of floating around on the streets and being used to kill our people? Those agents were ours, Charlie. That weapon spilled the blood of our own, and I want to know who put it back into the hands of those who did it. You let me worry about that now, Lisa. You're not like this Mike Belasco, some kind of a law unto himself, taking on whatever cases you please. You're a federal agent, and I expect you to conduct yourself with some discretion. I also expect you to make yourself accountable to me, keep me apprised of your movements, and I expect you to follow the rules. Am I being clear? Yes, sir. Metzger rose, stuck his hands in his pockets, and began to pace. You know what bothers me most, Lisa? It's that your actions aren't just suggestive of a maverick or an insubordinate agent. They're more suggestive of an agent who doesn't trust her superiors. That hurts me personally, and I don't mind saying it. But it also hurts the cohesion of our department as a whole. And not only can that severance of teamwork get more agents killed, but it undermines my authority and makes us look bad in Washington's eyes. I'm sorry if you feel I violated your trust, Charlie. And you're right in saying you've never done anything to me to do that. But I have to ask myself if you're more concerned about what Washington thinks or about the fact that good men and women are getting wasted for nothing more than profit. This payroll of Carrillo's goes deep. I know it does. I can feel it in my gut. Metzger sat again. I understand what you're going through. I went through it myself once. God knows this agency isn't invulnerable to graft and apathy, but I have to know that everyone's on my team. I have to be able to trust that you'll watch my back and you have to trust I'll watch yours. If that concept breaks down, we're all going to be in trouble. Am I being clear? Yes. Now, if Cepetus is working for Carrillo, I'll be the first to agree we need to get him off the streets. But before we can do that, we need proof. A missing weapon from evidence isn't proof of any wrongdoing, which means we're going to have to find another way of going about this. I'm going to start the ball rolling on my end. For now... I'm lifting your suspension and restoring you to active status. Don't blow it this time, Lisa. The consequences wouldn't be good for your career. What do you want me to do? I want you and Pete Williams to get over to El Paso. I'll get the okay from my end to make the investigation official. But you keep in touch with me at all times. And you don't make a move without my okay. You get me? I get you. Rayero was at last beginning to feel that maybe the guy was on their side and that somewhere along the way she'd done him a horrible injustice. But this would finally be her chance to bring Sapedas down once and for all, and bring her one step closer to putting Jose Carrillo out of business forever. Rayero and Williams were in a black Ford Bronco, traveling Highway 93 within an hour from the time they got Metzger's approval to proceed with the operation. Rayero didn't say much to him during the trip, she was having a hard time dealing with the fact that he'd ratted her out to Metzger, and even more difficulty understanding what had prompted him to betray her trust. But eventually she knew she'd have to get over it. They were going to be together for the next few days, and as such, they were going to have to make the best of it. After nearly an hour of silence, William spoke up. Anything you want to get off your chest? Not really. I see. As a matter of fact, yes, there is something I'd like to talk about. I'd like to talk about why the hell you betrayed me after promising to keep quiet about Velasco. <sighs> I knew it would come down to this event. You're damn right, Pete. Did you think I wouldn't find out? Did you think that Charlie wouldn't tell me who it was that squealed? I thought I could trust you, and you betrayed me. I'm sorry if you feel that way, Lisa, but I was concerned about your safety. I thought maybe this Velasco had you misled, and I wasn't going to take the chance of watching you buy it, too. We lost several good people the night he blew that truck full of evidence sky high. I just didn't know what else to do. 
We didn't lose them because he blew up the drugs, Pete. We lost them because somebody betrayed us. I think that somebody might have been Ramon Cepedas. I told you that during our meeting at the diner. I know that, but I figured maybe you weren't thinking straight. I knew your suspension was a big blow, and despite the fact I personally think Metzger's a windbag, I wasn't about to lose you quite that easily. Well, I believe your reasons were genuine, but that doesn't make it right. Look, I swear it won't happen again. From now on, I'll keep my mouth shut if I say I will, unless we both agree otherwise. Deal? Deal. I guess the truth is, I'm having a lot of trouble buying this thing about Ramon Sapitas. I mean, what's the motive here? This guy's got nothing to gain by burning us. He's got everything to gain if he's on Jose Carrillo's payroll. Do you have any proof of that? Not yet. That's why Charlie approved this little excursion to El Paso. Velasco was certain the guy had something up his sleeve, and I trust his instincts. If Ramon Cepeda says playing for the other team, we'll find out soon enough. Three sedans and one van of varying colors appeared as if from nowhere and surrounded the Bronco so quickly, Williams had nowhere to go. The new arrivals boxed their quarry quickly and effectively. Who the hell are these guys? Chinese triad! What? Rayero reached into her purse and withdrew a Colt 380 Mustang pistol, a backup piece to her duty weapon, the Glock 19. She could barely see through the tinted windows of the Bronco that the driver of the closest sedan was Asian. Stop the truck! William shrugged and did as instructed, leaning on the brakes of the Bronco as the four sedans tried to keep him pinned to the center lane. The others shot past at the sudden slowing of the SUV, and the sedan in the rear swung to one side to avoid rear-ending them. As that vehicle came into the right lane, Raguero powered down her window, pointed the 380 through the opening, and fired at the driver's window from point-blank range. What the hell are you doing? Trying to save our necks! The second round shattered the driver's window, and the third made contact with flesh. The sedan first veered into the Bronco and then bounced away and flipped off the highway as soon as the front wheels touched the soft shoulder. The vehicle began to spin, flipped twice, end over end, and landed on its roof. Williams could barely keep control of the shimmying rear end as he tried to recover from the impact of the sedan. A moment later, he didn't have to worry about it. The right front tire blew out. Williams leaned hard on the brakes and finally got the Bronco to stop fishtailing, but now the other vehicles had come to a stop. A wave of Chinese gunmen emerged from them and fanned out. They advanced on the Bronco. The Jotomatic machine pistols and AK-74 assault rifles in plain sight. I think we're in trouble. Williams didn't reply, but instead jumped from the Bronco and took up a firing position behind the door. Rogero went to follow suit, but there was no time. Williams got off one shot before his body was riddled with auto fire. <laughs> he jerked spasmodically as round after round pierced his flesh. Blood and tissue sprayed the interior of the Bronco, splattering across Rogero's exposed skin. Rogero's mind screamed at her to get away, but she hadn't been prepared for that kind of vicious assault. The Chinese triad was formidable enough, but if Velasco had been right about the Scarlet Dragons, there was no question left in her mind why they had earned their particular reputation. Rajero lay in her seat, waiting for the Asian killers to get close enough. If she was going to die this day, she would at least take a few more with her. The passenger door opened suddenly, and Rajero shot the first visible dragon. The man's head exploded as the 380 caliber slug from the Mustang drilled a path through his skull. Before Rayero could select another target, something hard hit the back of her head. Ugh! She drew her hand up to touch her head as darkness pervaded at the edges of her sight. The last thing she saw was her own blood covering her hand as the world around her faded. After Williams and Rayero had left for El Paso, Noreen Zahn decided to do some checking herself. Word of the destruction of Jose Carrillo's distribution warehouse was spreading through the Brownsville DEA office. So were rumors of a firefight that had left nearly 20 people dead in El Paso. Other than herself and Rayero, nobody had made the connection. But she knew it was the handiwork of a certain dark-haired, blue-eyed stranger who called himself Mike Velasco. It had to be. Zahn contacted several of her friends in the FBI, along with the company contact at Langley. Nobody admitted to ever having heard of Belasco, and there was no personnel record that anybody by that name had ever existed, as a cover or otherwise. This made Zahn nervous. She was certain that he worked for the U.S. government in some capacity, 
but he wasn't employed by any of the known groups that would participate in his kind of operations. She didn't know anybody in the NSA, but she quickly dismissed the idea, since Belasco just didn't strike her as the type. It was illegal for the CIA to operate on American soil, and if there was anything she could decipher about her mysterious guardian angel, it was that he played by the rules. So perhaps he was a freelancer, as Rayero had told her. And perhaps he wasn't. In either case, Zahn was now on a mission to find out exactly who Belasco was and for whom he worked. And there was only one real way of doing that. She would have to locate him and find out for herself what was really going on. She understood the guy's seemingly fanatic drive to stop the Kong Lok Triad from participating in open battle against the Carrillo Empire. Such a war could prove disastrous for innocent civilians and dangerous to the law enforcement community as well. After almost four hours of digging, she finally hit pay dirt. One of DEA's people had been treated at the El Paso Medical Center, brought in early that morning by Chopper. The wounds hadn't been serious, and the nurse she spoke with said the patient refused to stay any longer than necessary. Strangely enough, they couldn't find any record at that point, but that wasn't unusual since they had seen lots of patients that morning, and it was possible that the medical records simply hadn't been entered in their database yet. No, she had no idea where the chart was, and she didn't remember the guy's name. She did think they had left by Chopper. Okay, so Belasco had suffered some injuries in his battle with the group in El Paso. Based on what Rayero had told her, that left only a few possibilities. He would either continue west, heading toward a showdown in Nogales or Mexicali, or he would go back to Las Vegas to infiltrate the operations there. Zahn was betting on Las Vegas. She made another phone call to a pilot friend, and he agreed to fly her out to Nevada. She packed a small bag and proceeded directly from her apartment to the airport. Hey, Harry. Thanks so much for... T the Asian gunners appeared from nowhere, the muzzles of their weapons winking with merciless efficiency. Harry! No! Zahn reached behind her to grasp the Glock secured in a holster, but she never got off a shot. As she cleared the weapon, the wind was knocked from her by a sudden blow to her back. Another Chinese gunner swung the butt of his AK-74 and connected with her stomach. She bent and felt the white-hot pain of something strike her in the side of her neck, something like the rigid side of a hand connecting with her brachial cephalic nerve, and then all faded to black. Mac Boland sat in a motel room at the outskirts of Las Vegas and studied a map of the city spread out on the bed. His chair was positioned next to it, and he sipped coffee from a foam cup while marking areas on the map with a red grease pencil. He was developing a battle plan that would effectively target those areas known to be Carrillo's hotspots. The targets themselves included two casinos, three large drug houses, and a couple of known gathering places for distribution gangs. Grimaldi was smoking a cigarette at a table near the window, which was open to crack, but covered by a shade. On the table were clips for the Beretta 93Rs and the two H&K assault weapons. The pair rarely spoke during their individual duties, obviously content to focus upon the mission ahead. Grimaldi obviously had something he wanted to tell the executioner, but Bolin had to squash the pilot's opportunity to do so at every turn. The Stony Man Flyer knew that this was something Bolin would have to do on his own. He couldn't risk anyone else from the farm involved more than they were already. What's the word, Sarge? Trouble. The numbers are running down. The pilot stubbed his cigarette in the ashtray. That's no surprise. I wouldn't expect anything less out of you. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. How many of those locales do you think are still held by Carrillo's people? I'd have to say most of them. The Kung Lok will try to phase themselves in quietly. Only the heavy resistance will be met with a forceful takeover. Makes sense. Yeah. The only thing that makes me suspicious is that I haven't seen much in the way of retaliation by Carrillo's people. What do you mean? He's not fighting to hold on to what he has. Everything I know about this guy's history would suggest he'd be coming back at the Kung Lok full force. Or at least at you full force. Right. He's taking a lot of hits, but he's not retaliating. That does seem strange. It's more than strange, Jack. It's almost tactical. Bolin fell silent, contemplating the possibilities. You think maybe he's waiting on the Avis's forces? Yeah, I've considered that. It's possible that that's exactly what he's waiting on. And if it is, that means he has a very large operation in mind. 
Well, you said before that whoever controlled the border controlled the Mexican-American drug trade. You're thinking maybe Mexicali? It's possible. Me too. That could mean nothing short of a third world war right there in the Baja. I was concerned when Hal told me about their theory of Carrillo and the FARC joining forces. Now it seems even more probable. This could go sour real quick. I don't know. That seems pretty intense, Sarge. What do you think? I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Grimaldi pulled the shade aside and looked out the window. Sunset. I guess it's about time for you to go. Olin nodded as he started to change into his black suit. Uh, start putting stuff together, would you? You got it. As the soldier changed, he began to run the situation through his head. He was almost out of time. Only five days had passed since his first encounter in Brownsville, and it seemed already like an eternity. The next 48 hours would be the deciding factor. Bolin knew that he was going to have to push himself beyond the limits of endurance if he were to bring things to a close. He'd tackle the problems here in Las Vegas in a quick and permanent fashion, and then head for Mexicali. Nogales and San Luis Rio, Colorado would have to wait for now. Local law enforcement could probably handle the issues in those areas in conjunction with the DEA anyway, if Stony Man found a way to filter intelligence to them without compromising the source. Brognola would probably already do that on his own, knowing what the executioner was up against. Despite his talents as a soldier and covert operative, Mac Bolin knew he couldn't be in two places at once, and he certainly wasn't invincible. The scars and fresh wounds he noted in the mirror as he dressed were a testament to that. After lacing up his combat boots, he strode to the duffel. Romaldi was still arranging things in the butt pack attached to the military canvas belt, so he handed the dual shoulder rigging to Bolin. The executioner shrugged into it, cinched the straps, and then checked the actions on both Berettas before holstering them into the rigging. Bolin quickly checked Grimaldi's pack job, made only a few minor adjustments, then sealed it and slung the belt over his shoulder. Grimaldi handed him the gym bag-sized duffel. Both the SMGs are in there, locked and loaded. So's the 44, LBE, the last of the grenades, and your combat knife. You're all set, big guy. Thanks, Jack. I'm gonna have to take the car. You'll get back to the airport? Yeah, I'll stay here tonight and grab a taxi back to the airport first thing in the morning. I think a hot meal and a good night's sleep will do wonders. I'm tired, and I don't want to risk flying back to Texas tonight. Understood. Hey, Sarge? Yeah? Give him hell. Bet on it. And with that, the executioner walked out the door. In Kao Chu smiled with satisfaction as he entered the basement of his new home, and noted the two American women tied to a back wall with leather ropes. They wore nothing, a fact that had left them naked and absent of their dignity as well. Kao Chu had ordered this so that these two whores, who obviously didn't know their place in a man's world, would realize he had ultimate power over them. It wasn't about sexual desires. He had plenty of women, pure of his race, on hand to do such bidding. This was about stripping his prisoners of honor, and restraining their minds from entertaining hopes of escape. They almost took on the appearance of trophies mounted against the dark brick wall of the finished basement. In the center of the room was a pool table, covered with brilliant red felt. Spread fans of polished black wooden frames and hand-beaten tin painted gold cast shadows on the wall around the pair of American beauties. There were pictures of dragons and ancient Chinese writing painted on the fans, and the entire scene appeared apropos of an ancient Ming dynasty ritual or ceremony. It looked as if they were sacrificing these two women to appease some angry god, and Kao Chu had to admit that he loved it. The Scarlet Dragon leader dropped into a nearby chair and propped his feet on the pool table. He began to take an interest in his fingernails, finally pulling a paper clip from his pocket and using one end to clean under the edges. He sat and acted engrossed in what he was doing, pretending to ignore the stares of hatred directed his way. He particularly enjoyed the fiery resolve of the dark-haired one they called Rayero. It was almost erotic. You are both so obviously full of contempt for me. He looked up from his nail-cleaning task. If looks could kill. Some say they can. Set me free and I'll show you what looks can do. He walked directly over to Rayero and slapped her across the face. <coughs> Kao Chu sidestepped and delivered a similar blow to Zahn. 
He then turned from them and began to pace around the pool table. First, you will watch your tongues, or I will cut them out myself. Second, you will tell me everything you know about Mike Belasco. I want to know where he is, what his plans are, and who he works for. You'll have to drag that information from her cold, dead bodies, then. Kao Chu walked back to her and slapped her again. <coughs> you forgot the first rule. Don't speak unless I ask you a direct question. Fools chatter, but the wise listen carefully. Well then, we know which category you fit into. <coughs> Both women now had cheeks red with Kao Chu's brutality. The Scarlet Dragon leader returned to his pacing. This was going nowhere, and he was convinced that given their training, the more he tortured the DEA agents, the stronger the resolve. Of course, Kao Chu had learned the fine arts of extracting whatever information he desired. However, it would do no good to kill the American bitches. His target was Belasco. He truly wanted that man to suffer. This man is responsible for the death of many good Scarlet Dragons. Belasco has been responsible for the death of a group of thugs. Kao Chu could tell from the look on the DEA woman's face that she was waiting for him to come over and beat her to death. But he refrained this time. They wouldn't be quite so cavalier when they knew what sort of plans he had for them. Although he saw no reason to tell them, it wouldn't have done much good anyway. This Mike Balasco, who does he work for? I wish we knew. Then he does not represent the DEA? He represents everyone. Eventually, he'll get to you, and when he does, you're going to regret ever hearing his name. I do not think so. It would seem this man fancies himself a hero, but there are no heroes left in your society. This individual is by no means superior to our organization. We will find him and destroy him. Then your hope will be gone, and this Belasco will be forgotten as dust in the wind. Las Vegas, Nevada. The information on Mac Boland's first target was gleaned from Stony Man Intelligence through Las Vegas police channels. It was a known drug house that doubled as a high-priced brothel and was nestled in a secluded neighborhood just outside the Strip. As a matter of fact, it wasn't too far from Vito Rossetti's place. The executioner knew there wasn't time for soft probes. He would have to hit several places hard and fast and still manage to keep bystanders out of the way. It would have been ideal to take them on the inside, but the three guards smoking on the front stoop needed attention first. Boland gave it to them. He put the sedan on the curb, casually exited, and used the cover of the car to take down his enemy. The third hood backed up the steps, fumbling for a machine pistol. He was able to clear it from beneath his suit jacket, but Boland had already moved from his position into a clear line of fire. The impact hurled the gunman against the front door and he slid lifeless to the porch stoop. The executioner closed the gap and vaulted the steps two at a time. The door opened just slightly and a beefy tanned head appeared through the opening. Poland blew it off and put his foot to the door as the muscle man's headless corpse fell where it stood. Poland came through the front door, ready for action. Several Hispanic hoods were playing cards at a table and another was watching the game from a nearby couch. He was the least threat since a slim and beautiful brunette was wriggling on his lap. Boland thumbed the selector switch to burst mode and took the two closest players before they had time to react. The third man stood and managed to bring a pistol into the play. He fired off two hasty shots and turned up the table for cover. The soldier was undaunted, firing through the flimsy table and punching holes in the gunner's stomach and head. Brain matter exploded from his hiding place, showering the walls and table. The executioner didn't wait for an invitation to get killed, but drew the other Beretta 93R as he popped the magazine on the first and put a single round through the hood's jaw. The woman was doused with the blood of her boyfriend. Olin clamped a hand to her throat, leveling the muzzle of the Beretta at her forehead. Get up and get out. She immediately obeyed, running out the front door without another word. Boland turned to the sound of footsteps rushing down the stairs. Two more soldiers, pistols drawn, descended quickly as the woman vacated the house. He fired a well-placed shot to the kneecap of one, the round immediately disabling the gunman. The hard case collapsed on the stairs and rolled to the bottom. 
The second wasn't as lucky. He managed to get off a wild round before Boland shot him through groin and stomach. The gunman flipped over the false stairway railing and crashed through a glass top table. Boland inserted a fresh clip in the first Beretta he'd used and holstered it. He quickly stepped around the body of the one he'd wounded, who had obviously passed out during his fall. The executioner made sure no weapons would be within easy reach if the guy suddenly came around, and then quickly ascended the stairs. Without question, he meant to put this place out of business permanently. As Bolin reached the top landing, four gunners jumped from various rooms and began to fire wildly at him with pistols and SMGs. His cat-like reflexes had saved him more times than he could count, and this particular time there was no exception. In a situation like this, there was little room to maneuver. The soldier avoided the assault by shoulder rolling toward the closest gunman. He came out of the roll on his feet, grabbing the man around the throat and constricting his windpipe with well-trained forearm muscles. The natural progression for the two with automatic weapons was to follow the target. Their aim was true, unfortunately for their comrade, and the rounds intended for Bolin ended up in his human shield. The executioner raised his pistol and took out both of the guys toting SMGs with headshots. Bolin dragged the limp body of his shield backward into a room and slammed the door closed with a kick. He dropped the corpse, reached into a concealed pouch on his black suit, and withdrew a sleeveless DM-51 and pulled the pin. Moving to the door as the grenade cooked off, he quickly opened the door and tossed the bomb, even as a fresh salvo of rounds spit from the weapon of his remaining opponent. Plaster rained from the ceiling, and some of the nearby drywall cracked with the concussion. It felt as if the entire house were going to fall around the executioner's ears. Bolin had been through worse hell holes than this one, and he wasn't intimidated. He peered into the hallway and surveyed the scene there. It was a gruesome sight. The grenade had obviously landed close because the blast had been enough to dismember the gunman. Body parts lay in every corner of the wide hallway, and one leg was perched precariously at the edge of the stairway landing. Bolin holstered the Beretta, then yanked the 44 Magnum Desert Eagle from the military holster and entered the hallway. He first checked the rooms with the open doors, but they were empty. He then began to take the closed doors, one at a time. The search took him about five minutes, and the place turned up deserted. Something was wrong here. Bolin could tell the house was just what the Las Vegas police had claimed it was, and he knew that Stony Man's intelligence was always good. Kurtzman went through that stuff with a fine-tooth comb before feeding details to the executioner or the teams. There were some telltale signs that drugs and prostitution went hand-in-hand hand with each other in the house. There was a powdery residue in one of the bathrooms and a half-dozen crack pipes in various places. Bolin also found a wad of cash in a dresser chest. Whoever used the place had left in a big hurry. And as the soldier descended the stairs and exited to the house, he understood why the place was abandoned. Someone had blocked his vehicle with a large panel truck. Several curious onlookers had emerged from their houses, the gunfire and explosion having obviously attracted considerable attention. But it was the sound of the rear door on the panel truck rolling upward and slap of combat boots hitting the street that demanded the executioner's attention. A handful of hardened combat soldiers in urban camouflage emerged from the rear of the truck, automatic assault rifles held at the ready. West Palm Beach, Florida. Lao Ming Shui sat in the lobby of the Lara Ket Pearl Suites, watching impatiently as the other guests arrived. His eyes roved through the lobby, ensuring that bodyguards were in place and watchful for any signs of trouble. This was a very dangerous time for all of them, with the myth of this super soldier called Belasco floating among the Scarlet Dragons, and the war with the Mexicans. He should have been up in Toronto keeping a low profile. Coming to the United States had been a matter of great risk to his personal security and his assets. The truth of the matter was that he didn't really have time for this meeting anyway. Nonetheless, it was necessary to keep up appearances, and despite the power he wielded, it was not acceptable to reject an open invitation by the Kong Lok Triad's council, especially when so many important guests were here. This was actually an important time for him. Undoubtedly, word of his ostensible coup and subsequent activities in the American Southwest had reached the ears of the Hong Kong underworld. 
It also had most likely been the subject of discussion among the elite politicians of China's cabinet members. Some of those men he saw here now, individuals who roamed the halls of power with indifference and commanded armies with mere impunity. Yet in Shui's mind, their power was superficial. They were little more than window dressings for the great China they preached among themselves in the bathhouses and their pitiful diplomatic circles. Most of them had no real love for their country, which disgusted Shui. Sure, they had done some great things in the area of military might, but China had always been strong in that sense. What they claimed they did for the country and what they had actually done were two entirely different things. He couldn't respect them for that, no matter how much they might wish or even command him to do so. Shui had once been a part of them, but he wasn't anymore. He didn't even feel like a part of them. He couldn't be a part of them ever again, although he would never tell them as much, not because he didn't have the courage, but because he wasn't foolish enough to burn his bridges. Despite disagreements, he rarely dealt with them, and that was consolation enough. He was here only to make an appearance, and then he would depart directly for Las Vegas, where Ying Kao Chu obviously needed him most. Lao Ming Shui? Shui stood, turned, and immediately recognized the slender Chinese beauty standing behind him. She had sleek black hair tied behind her in a traditional bun held by wooden hair picks. She was wrapped in a thin, semi-transparent gown of black silk that hung on one shoulder, interwoven with shiny gold threads, the pattern representative of a dragon-like shape. The incandescent lights of the lobby danced in her soft, dark eyes, and her skin was clear and soft to the touch. Lao Shui bowed deeply and smiled as the woman put a slender, electrifying hand on his shoulder. It is a distinct pleasure to see you again. It has been a long time, Lao. Too long, I think. The two had been lovers for a brief time, very brief. But Nian Shi Feng became much too demanding of Shui's time. She'd obviously grown up quite a bit, having been much younger and more impressionable back in his days as a devoted Taoist student. He'd been full of ideas and ambition then, two traits that had eventually led him to success. As a married man, he'd never betray the trust of his devoted spouse. However, if anyone might have swayed him, it would have been this woman. She was as beautiful and graceful a China doll as she had been in the days he'd first known her. The years have been much kinder to you than they have to me. <laughs> and you are still a man of whom it is the duty of every woman to be cautious. Shui inclined his head, accepting the compliment in the spirit it was given. <laughs> How have you been? Most excellent. She moved closer to him and looked around cautiously. I am actually here to keep up appearances for my husband. You are married now? When he has a moment to act as a husband? Forgive me, that was very disrespectful of me. I have learned some hard lessons that it is not for me to question Dim. You are wedded to Dim, Mai? Shui hoped the mixture of surprise and contempt didn't slip out in the tone of his voice. Why, of course. You didn't know. I had no idea. You seem surprised. You'll have to forgive my bluntness, Nyonchi, but I am overwhelmed. While I do not see Dim often, we are close enough that I couldn't see how I wouldn't know. As a matter of fact, I saw him recently and he made no mention of it. Perhaps he doesn't know of our past. I am certain that he does. Well, there is little reason to be conspiratorial. This would probably come as a surprise to many, but Dim is a patient and kind man. He commands the highest respect, however, and many thus view him as a tyrant in that respect. Shui disagreed, but he said nothing, choosing instead to reply to her with a warm smile and bow of his head. Dim Mai was anything but patient and kind. He was the largest, most powerful arms supplier in Asia, perhaps in all of the Pacific, and Shui had heard him described as many things. Patient and kind weren't two of them. He couldn't believe that Nian Shi wasn't bright enough to know this, but he saw no reason to contradict her in a setting as public as this. Shui made a show of searching through the lobby. I do not see Dim. Where is he? He'll be down shortly. I left him in the suite on an important call. He asked me to go ahead of him and be charming. A task that is suitably worthy of you, my dear. 
You're too kind. Another man joined their discussion abruptly, and Shuey came to a position of military-like attention, and with good cause. General Zheng Jiquan was no stranger to Shuey, and neither did he command a presence easily ignored. Jiquan was known throughout the triad as a military enforcer. His rise to power had been the direct result of his move to ally political views with the present Chinese premier. As such, his influence over military affairs and the subsequent friendship with the seats of power in both the Chinese cabinet and council rendered him virtually invincible to outside interference. Jiquan was also one of the few to whom Shui showed deference and complete respect. The general had on more than one occasion made his support and liking of the Konglok leader very clear, though Shui wasn't clear if Jiquan's position had changed in recent times. Lao Ming, my friend, it is most agreeable to see you again. And you, General Jiquan. Ah, please, please, must you be so formal? When is it that you stop calling me by my first name? I grow so weary of the formalities of everyday public life. Is there no place we can't be safe to socialize with each other on a friendly basis? I beg your pardon, sir. I just didn't presume. <laughs> you never do, and that's what I so respect about you. Jiguan turned to Fong. Good evening, Madam Mai. You will most certainly do me the honor of dancing with you later, but I ask your pardon to steal Lao Ming from you for a short time. I beg your leave, then, gentlemen. Jiguan inclined his head. Put his massive arm around Shui and steered him away from Fong. I heard of your recent incursion into this country. I would believe congratulations are in order. I don't know if that wouldn't be a bit premature, Dong. Oh? Jiquan stopped, and the bushy gray hairs of his eyebrows rose, dispersing the wrinkles around his tiny eyes. Is there trouble? I'm not certain yet. Ying Gaozhu has met a problem. It isn't one that I foresee as insurmountable, but it is troublesome all the same. Then I trust you will handle it in time. What I have in mind to discuss with you before the start of the formal meeting is quite another matter. A recent issue has come to our attention. It is one that has the council quite concerned, and they have asked that I investigate it further. What is it? My spies tell me that this competitor of yours. What is his name? Carillo? I understand that he may have enlisted additional aid as a counterstrike to your plans. Shui, of course, knew what was coming, but he chose not to let on to that fact. While he trusted Jiquan, he didn't trust him completely. He realized Jiquan was going to tell him about the alliance between Carillo and Navas, but he decided not to disclose he already had the knowledge. Jiquan was vying for a position here. And Shui would continue to act as if he were playing into Xi Guan's hand until he knew what the general was really seeking. In what fashion? Are you familiar with a man named Colonel Amado Nieves? Shui put on an act of considering the name a moment, then shook his head. He is the leader of the South American guerrilla army, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. I know of this force. Then you should know what kind of problems you might encounter were this alliance to be committed. Ying Gaozhu's men are excellent soldiers, Dong. I think they are capable of stopping these guerrillas. My dear Lao, it is not about abilities; it is about sheer numbers. Even if Dim Mai supplies your weapons in the quantities you're asking, and I have it on personal authority that he's resisting this move, you cannot possibly believe that the Scarlet Dragons are sufficient against such an amassed force of trained soldiers. Dim Mai does not like my plan. Mai is an imbecile. As far as the Council is concerned, it doesn't matter what he wants. I have personally vouched for you, and through various machinations, I am ready to come to your aid. I appreciate the offer, Dong, and perhaps I may take you up on it in light of this newest information. Shui watched for Jiquan's reaction, and it was just as he suspected. The military man's smile was one of smug satisfaction. He was up to something, although Shui still wasn't sure just what that something was. An elevated position in the Kung Lock didn't make sense. Jiquan had already attained that goal. The guy was a hardened soldier. And so he couldn't envision Jiquan had aspirations to succeed Shui's position as underboss of the Western territories. No, there was something else afoot here. I'm a bit concerned about Dim Mai and his lack of support here. 
I knew that I didn't have his full support, but I'm surprised he would openly criticize me to the council. That was something of a mystery to me as well. Naturally, the council is suspicious of his motives. However, you should be conscious of the fact that he very much respects you as an individual. But he is vehemently opposed to your ideas and launched scathing attacks against your plan to monopolize the southwestern drug trade in America. Would he prefer we ally ourselves with the likes of Jose Carrillo and the other Mexican crime families? Chiquan appeared to consider this for a time. Hmm. I don't know. I know he was against any sort of similar association with the Italian crime family and their corporate holdings, but his resistance here does not seem to stem from the feelings of racial prejudice. There is something else going on here. Perhaps he's driven by sheer profit motive. In what way? Well, the supply of arms to the Scarlet Dragons comes at sheer expense to him. There is undoubtedly little profit in supplying in Chu's people with free weapons. But if it is as you say, and Carrillo has joined forces with this Colonel Nievas, it is possible that they will need weapons. Could it be that Dim Mai sees a more direct route for profit? I had not thought about it from that point of view. Neither had I. It was all a lie. Chewie had very much considered this. Mai was a businessman, plain and simple, and the council was compelling him to supply these arms free of charge to the Kung Lok's enforcement team. From where Mai stood, that was a considerable overhead without guarantee of any sort of return on his investment. Not that Mai wasn't already one of the richest men in the Kung Lok. Still, it probably didn't make much sense to him to fork over thousands of assault weapons just to watch the money from sales go back into the public coffers, particularly since this was a Western Territory operation. I don't know, Lau. I've known Dim for many years, and I find it difficult to believe he's driven by sheer profit motive. He's always been loyal to the party and to the Kung Lok. Riches can do strange things to men, my friend. Some men. I would no more want to believe it of him than you would. Then we shall agree, for now, that he has his reasons for resisting your plans. In the meantime, I stand ready to assist you in whatever fashion you may require it. I'm concerned about the forces being amassed in Mexico. Word has it that FARC troops are already in this country, and that certainly means war between them and the Scarlet Dragons is imminent. For all we know, it may have already begun. I hope you will forgive me for asking, Dung. But I'm wondering why your sudden interest in this operation. You think I'm seeking something for myself? I didn't want to be blunt, as you have always been magnanimous both toward me and my causes. And I don't wish to risk our friendship. But yes, I am wondering what advantage you seek. Naturally. I wouldn't have expected anything less from you, Lao. The fact of the matter is that I'm primarily doing this under the orders of the Council. However, I hope to move forward in my career. I have my eye on something extra special. I know your influence in the area, and I am hoping for your support when the time comes. And what is this mysterious goal? Let us not discuss it now. I promise that you needn't commit before seeing the value of my assistance. Noting the general's voice had lowered again, and that he was watching the lobby, Shui observed that Dim Mai as well as the other council members, had arrived. It would be time for them to have their meeting soon. Of course, there would be the formalities of dinner first, and then the ladies would retire, and the men would have time to discuss their plans at great length. Shui wasn't sure what Ji Quan had in mind, but he was already certain he wouldn't like it, and equally certain that it would cost him a great deal. And Lao Shui wondered if perhaps it was time to start looking for some new allies. Las Vegas, Nevada. The first thing Mac Boland did when he saw the troops emerging from the panel truck was take cover behind his vehicle. The second was to let them know he wasn't just going to roll over and die. The executioner knew he was outgunned, and he wanted to avoid starting a firefight where bystanders might get injured. The best way to avoid that kind of trouble was to take down the newcomers quickly and efficiently, and the deal DM-51s promised to do the job for him nicely. 
Bolin extracted one of the grenades from the pouch, pulled the pin, and tossed the bomb into the still emerging troops. He immediately followed it with a second and third, foregoing the sleeves to cut down on flying shrapnel that might strike the now gathering crowd. Grenades! Look out! They obviously hadn't expected their lone adversary would be so well armed and underestimated his resolve. It cost six of them their lives. The explosions ripped into the far side of Boland's sedan, the concussion lifting it off the ground as heat melted the rear tires into bubbling rubber. The remaining troops scattered, still confused by the sudden explosions and the felling of their comrades. Boland immediately acted on the confusion and began to lay down a firestorm with the Desert Eagle. Thus far, the executioner had been dishing out the better part of the destruction, but it seemed obvious the remaining soldiers had regrouped and were now taking the offensive. They began to return fire. The 5.45 millimeter rounds shattered the back windshield, and Boland barely escaped the onslaught as he smashed the window of the rental with the butt of the Desert Eagle, reached inside and retrieved his munitions bag from the front seat. The sedan was history, and there were police cruisers at both ends of the street. The officers were now EVA, taking care to stay behind the doors of their cruisers as they lined up pistols or shotguns and began to fire at anything toting a weapon. Bolin cursed to himself, anxious for their safety. He peered at the cab of the panel truck and noted the interior was empty. A break in the firefight told him the engine was still running and the damage from the grenades appeared to be superficial. The executioner had an idea. He holstered the 44 and traded it for the HK-53 in the bag. He vaulted off the sidewalk and onto the hood of the sedan, took down an approaching soldier with a well-aimed burst from the SMG and landed on the other side. He accessed the cab from the passenger door and climbed behind the wheel. Boland popped the gear shift into reverse and popped the clutch as he gummed the accelerator. The panel truck swayed uncertainly as Boland backed the vehicle until he had a turn radius clear of any vehicles. He swung the rear end toward the house, the driver's side door now facing the stunned enemy troops. Boland stuck the HK-53 through the window frame and shot one enemy gunner in the face at nearly point-blank range. The 5.56 millimeter slug pierced the man's forehead and blew out the back of his head. Bolin swung the muzzle in the direction of another gunner who had turned to fight the cops and squeezed a three-round burst that caught the terrorist in the small of the back. The impact carried him forward into the concrete face of the lamp pole that had served as his cover. His lifeless body crumpled as blood spilled onto the sidewalk. The panel truck lurched into the street, and he had to wrestle the bulky steering wheel with one arm. His shoulder was aching from his earlier injuries. He tried to ignore what he knew was the sensation of blood running freely down his arm where he had torn the stitches. He maneuvered the truck onto a direct course for the police cruisers as he shot another enemy gunner on the fly. The police officers seemed certain that Bolin was going to ram their cruisers, which is exactly what he wanted them to think. They began to fire at him, some of the pistol rounds ricocheting off the hood, while a few shotgun blasts tore holes in the radiator. Steam and fluid belched from the front of the truck as it was pounded and abused by hot lead. At the last moment, the executioner stomped on the brakes, letting the engine die as he jerked the wheel hard to the left. He brought the truck to a stop on the sidewalk in front of a house that ordered an alleyway. The truck now served as an effective roadblock, and he was far enough away from the far intersection that those officers didn't pose a threat. Bolin engaged the brake, grabbed his bag, and jumped from the cab of the truck. He sprinted down the alleyway. The officers still probably had a few of the enemy gunners with which to contend, but the soldier knew Las Vegas' finest could handle it. The executioner couldn't and wouldn't battle with the police. He'd never dropped the hammer on a cop, and he wasn't about to start now. However, the appearance of a five-man SWAT team at the other end of the alleyway entrance, silhouetted against the streetlights, triggered a moment of hesitation. A moment that was enough to give the police the advantage they needed and left him with no place to go. Free police department! Grab your weapons and let's see your hands! And as Bolin came to a halt, staring at the high fences bordering either side of the alleyway, he knew there was only one small chance remaining other than surrender. The executioner reached slowly into the bag slung over his shoulder. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. Hal, we've got some new information. What is it, Barbara? Rognola had been sitting in the war room for the past ten hours, sifting through information that Kurtzman was putting in front of him faster than he could read it. The bear was damn efficient, no question there, 
and the Stony Man chief was buried under mounds of paperwork. File folders and historical information gleaned from FBI, NSA, CIA, and other U.S. agencies had been retrieved from archives or computer data collected by Stony Man. Price smoothed out her skirt before sitting and handing a file folder to Brognola. There's a meeting being held in West Palm Beach right now that has some very interesting faces in the crowd. One of our CIA connections at the hotel claims that at least two dozen Hong Kong diplomats from various arenas are there. We've also confirmed that the arms dealer, Dim Mai, is present. And you'll never guess who else. Shui? Yes, how did you know? I just received a phone call from the man. He was very curious to know why the Chinese government hadn't advised U.S. authorities that such heavy hitters from their government would be in-country. Unfortunately, I didn't have an answer for him. I don't understand how they could not know that they would be here. Ragnola leaned back in his seat and stuck an unlit cigar in his mouth. That's what we're paid to know, Barb. I wonder if these recent actions we've seen by the Kung Lok aren't tied to some larger machination cooked up by the Chinese government. Well, it's no secret that the Kung Lok has operated in the areas they have under sanctions by government officials. Ever since the return of Hong Kong to China by the British, there are large sects of the triad that have acted lawlessly in China and Canada. Not to mention all the things they've done we can't link to them. Exactly. And that doesn't even take into account the fact that there's just too many of them to be effectively handled by law enforcement at local levels. And the British intelligence services don't have the time to deal with it. Because in comparison to the Islamic terror groups and the continual problems with the Egyptian jihad, the Kung Lok triad is small potatoes. Ragnola nodded, then gestured to the pile of paperwork. I've been mulling over this whole scenario in my brain for the past few days, and I don't mind saying it scares the hell out of me. In what way? Well, for one thing, I wonder if Shui and the Kung Lok are aware of the recent alliance between Carrillo and Yevas. The Triad's intelligence network spreads as far and wide as its criminal influence. I would find it hard to believe it if they didn't know. Okay, let's assume for a moment they do, or at least they did before moving into U.S. territory. That means Shui felt he had the manpower and resources to handle the resistance. You see, it's the timing of this whole thing that disturbs me. Based on Bear's most recent intelligence, we now can say with certainty that the alliance was formed between the FARC and Carrillo crime family before Shui made the decision. Agreed. So let's say I'm Lao Shui, and I want to take over the Mexican Mafia's drug and porn action. Where would I start? Take your pick, Hal. There's at least half a dozen major networks throughout the better part of the American Southwest. Drugs run through Texas, Arizona, the Baja, California, Nevada, and parts of New Mexico and Colorado. That's a big area. Exactly. A big area that could not possibly be controlled effectively. Unless... Unless what? Ragnola felt himself go pale, and it suddenly began to come to light. Unless someone controlled the U.S.-Mexican border. And how in the world could they do that? I'll be the first to admit that the Carrillo crime family is large, but they're not that large. They would be if they had a Colombian army on their side. Oh, my God. Ragnola could tell she was beginning to see his point. The relationship between Mexico and the United States had been friendly for the most part, with joint cooperation between U.S. and Mexican federales in at least stemming the flow of illegal drugs being smuggled into the country. Much of the funding had gone to the U.S. Border Patrol and other agencies affiliated with border security. The border and joint operations tied to it has always been controlled through mutual efforts of officials at the El Paso Intelligence Center. The only way anybody could even hope to pull off an operation like that would be if members of organized crime had their hooks into certain individuals very high in the chain of command from that organization. Are you thinking that this meeting of Kung Lok criminals with Chinese officials may be a play by the triads to join efforts and put pressure on U.S. officials? Possibly, but I think it goes much deeper than that. In order for the Kung Lok to have any hope of defeating Carrillo and his network, they would need to do two things. Control all major trafficking of narcotics and control border officials. That takes money, influence, and considerable resources. It's my guess that the Kung Lok Triad is playing two ends against the middle. What do you mean? Well, let's suppose for a moment that Shui and the Chinese government put pressure on Dim Mai to provide arms for sale to the Colombians. 
It's really no money out of anybody's pocket but mine. While he's got the largest stake in it and the largest risk to his investment, he could reap a reward tenfold. It would definitely put him in the good graces of the triad hierarchy. It would do more than that, Barb. It would put him at the top of the list for an official position of leadership in the government dealings with the Kung Lok. But in the meantime, Shui has aspirations of his own. He wants to reap the profit, not from the arms end, but rather from the drugs and porn. If he can find a way to manipulate the situation, he stands to gain a significant foothold in the West, one much larger and more influential than he currently has. But Carrillo and Nievas won't necessarily give up so easily. They don't have to. Don't you see it? The Chinese are already involved with Colonel Nievas and his FARC cronies. They're the ones who are supplying the arms, thanks to Dim Mai. That means they have control of a large part of the FARC, and Nievas and Carrillo are obviously too ignorant to see it. I get it now. That leaves Carrillo and this little plan of his out in the cold. Precisely. Which is why Stryker made it so clear that it's imperative he take down the Kung Lok Triad first. Why not send Phoenix Force down to Ciudad Juarez and let them finish the job on Carrillo? No, absolutely not. Stryker was very clear that he didn't want me to involve the other teams in this without official word from the president, and I have to honor his request. If I go off half-cocked and drop Phoenix into this whole thing, he could get caught in the crossfire. I've never questioned your reasoning or authority, Hal, but I'm very concerned that this is spinning out of control. You might be right, but I can't justify acting on a whim. We're doing exactly the best we can do right now with this. And that is to feed intelligence to Stryker when he asks for it, and then let him handle it. I understand. Rognola rubbed his eyes. Ugh, I understand how you feel, Barb. And I can't say I don't agree. I know it seems like we're just sitting on our hands here, and maybe in some fashion we are. But until I hear word from Stryker, all we can do is wait and watch. Do you think he can handle something this big on his own? I don't know. But I'm sure of one thing. If I needed someone in my corner on it, I'd want it to be him. Las Vegas, Nevada. Mac Boland couldn't surrender to the Las Vegas SWAT team, and he couldn't fire on law enforcement. So the executioner was left with only one option, and it was one that might very well get him killed in the process. But he knew there was a glimmer of a chance as he withdrew the last deal DM-51 grenade from his bag. I said, let me see your hands! Boland brought out the grenade, knowing they couldn't see what it was at that distance, pulled the pin, and tossed the bomb underhand down the alleyway. The lights attached to the underside of the SWAT team's MP5s might not have allowed them to discern exactly what it was Boland had thrown, but they got the idea and scrambled to escape a blast that wouldn't have come close enough to affect them. Nonetheless, they didn't know that, and it gave Boland the chance he needed. The soldier ran to one of the seven-foot privacy fences and bounded over it with ease, just as the grenade exploded. Splinters of wood gouged his hands, but he ignored the pain and landed into a crouch on the other side. Bolin advanced down a walkway and then bounded over another privacy fence. <clears throat> a few more fences and Bolin was on the street. He trotted across it at an angle, making his way toward another block of houses. He was still on schedule and his near encounters with the police hadn't upset his timetable that much. The next target was one he'd penetrated before, so being on familiar territory would make it less of a problem. As long as he could keep his operations on schedule, he'd get to Mexicali in time to stop whatever Carrillo and Nevas were cooking up for Baja. At least he hoped he could get there on time. Meanwhile, it was time to take care of business. Bolin emerged through another block, waiting in the shadows of a large bush and watching the street in front of him. It was dark, but early enough that people were still out and about. He'd been lucky to escape notice this long, and he knew that luck wasn't going to hold forever. He needed transportation to help him get farther from the dragnet he was now sure the police were implementing at that moment. Suddenly, Boland spotted a very familiar car cruising down the block. He waited until it was close enough to his cover to view the occupant inside. Vito Rossetti sat high in the seat, Sunday driving, as if it was nobody's business. Bolin smiled and shook his head, then bounded from his cover and maneuvered behind the vehicle. He came up on the driver's side, opened the back door, and dropped into the seat of the sedan. Rossetti never turned his head, 
the guy was still a pro. Rossetti accelerated now, gaining distance from the area while still obeying the law. The Las Vegas police might have been tied up with the hard men, but they would also have traffic patrol looking for anything remotely suspicious. Not that speeding was all that suspicious. Still, the heightened sense of alert across the police force probably left Rossetti with the good sense not to attract attention. All right. How did you know? You ask because you don't know? Rossetti's face remained forward. The guy didn't even look in the rearview mirror. I ask because I know you're dying to tell me. <laughs> Simple. I had a police scanner wired a long time back that's able to monitor high bandwidth and a large range of frequencies. I can listen to fire, police, EMS, SWAT, and even some local communications of the FBI and U.S. Marshal Service. Actually, it was given to me as a gift. Gadgets? <laughs> of course. I should have guessed. The truth is sometimes stranger than fiction. Bolin grinned. I heard about the commotion over their secured frequencies, and I figured it had to be you crashing someone's party. I don't live too far, so when I heard they had a fugitive on the loose, dressed, and I quote the dispatcher, like a commando, I figured you might need someone to bail you out. So you decided to take a chance? Yeah, I figured you'd squeeze through that little hole. They just weren't planning on something like this happening when the original call came through. Shots fired calls come in a hundred times a day in this city. They weren't expecting guys armed with automatic weapons. And they sure as hell weren't expecting you to be there kicking ass and taking names. Well, I guess I owe you one for pulling me out. But don't take another risk like that. I've got too many souls on my hands already, Vito. I don't want to add yours. You know I'd do it all over again, no matter what you say. <laughs> yeah, I guess I do. West Palm Beach, Florida. It would seem you have a new ally, Lao. And who is that? Why, General Ji Kwan, of course. I think it's a bit premature to consider the good general a new ally. He has always been a staunch supporter. Although do not assume I mean any disrespect toward him, I have nothing but the utmost admiration for Dung. And I guess in some small respect his support of me would make him an ally. I think you are being overly suspicious. The general speaks fondly of you to his colleagues in the government. And I can tell you that Dim has definitely noticed the relationship. Shui dabbed the corner of his mouth with a linen napkin. My dear, it sounds as if you have become quite knowledgeable in Dim's affairs. If you are referring to the licentious lifestyle he lives, or what he does for his business, you would be correct in your assumptions. That is odd. What? I would have thought you would be more ignorant of the situation. When we were together, you were quite adamant about staying away from such sordid affairs of men in the Kung Lok. People can change, Lao. I have found ways to go past my ideas about those things that I once found less than agreeable. It's the capacity of woman to change her mind that moves government. Or topples them. I beg your pardon? I'm sorry. I should take mine to keep my opinions to myself. It is just that your abilities to remain innocent, to shy away and be untouched by these things we must do, was what I most admired about you. Fong laid a hand on his arm. That's sweet of you, Lao. But I can take care of myself. I have to tell you a secret. The marriage between Dim and I was arranged. I really had little choice in the matter. Shui felt a pang of anger. Your father? She nodded. Not looking at him now, but choosing to stare at her unfinished dessert. That only agitated Shui more, because he hated her father, had always hated the bastard. He had been a repressive and domineering despot, just a wisp of a man as cancer ate his body to the bone. He died a few years ago, and Shui refused to attend the burial ceremonies and rites of his death. He wanted to be there to support Fong, but there was too much enmity between the respective families so he chose not to return to Hong Kong. Now it appeared that in addition to the insult of her father not leaving Fong any of his inheritance, instead bequeathing the residue of his riches to his son, who had squandered the entire fortune, according to rumor, she had been forced into marriage to Dim Mai. Shui was aware of the friendship between Mai and Fong's father. He just couldn't have foreseen such a tragedy as this. I am sorry. Do not be sorry. Dim loves me and has treated me well. I have every reason to be grateful and not one to complain. I have had a good life. 
I know, but let us I... not discuss this anymore, Lao, lest we are overheard. Besides, I do not feel like talking about it anymore. As you wish. We were discussing General Jiquan and his affection for you. That is a subject I would prefer not to discuss. I understand. Shui nodded, but he wondered if she really did understand. Right at that moment, as a matter of fact, Jiquan and Mai seemed to be in the middle of a very serious conversation. Shui thought about walking to where they stood talking and butting right into the conversation, but then he decided against it. To intrude on them would have served no purpose, and it might have even told them he was suspicious. If there was a coup d'etat in preparation, he did not want ties to the architects. As a matter of fact, as Shui looked around at the various pairs and trios of conversation, he didn't find a really friendly face in the crowd. There was, of course, Yu Chang Shen, head of the Kong Lok Triad in the whole eastern sector, but he was also a direct competitor in many respects. Shui began to wonder if he'd allowed himself to become too isolated from his ties in the east. He was certainly friendly with most of the underbosses and ringleaders, but at the same time didn't consider a single one trustworthy. The only one he really trusted was Ying Kao Chu, and even within that trust lay a few doubts. Somehow, though, Lao Ming Shui had come to both expect and accept that fact. Being a recognized leader in any Chinese triad carried with it a certain loneliness and isolationism that one couldn't escape. This atmosphere has come to bother me. Would you join me for a walk? It would be an honor. The two rose and managed to escape the huge dining hall without being noticed. Several bodyguards attempted to follow Shui, but he warned them off with a flick of his head. He wanted to be alone, and with Ing Kao Chu absent, the bodyguards weren't hard-pressed to hold their vigil. They would keep an eye on their master to be sure, but at a considerable distance. Had Kao Chu been there, Shui was certain he would have never allowed it under any circumstances. Shui had just too many enemies to take risks like that. It was a bit of a relief, despite Shui's admiration of Ing Kao Chu's loyalty. But Shui's idea of getting Fong alone with him had to go on hold when two large men intercepted them as they reached the doors of the hotel that exited onto their gardens. Mr. Shui, our boss would like to see you. He was a tall man wearing a three-piece suit as gray as his eyes. His associate wore a pinstripe nearly identical in cut and style, but this one was blue. The bodyguards started to step in, but Shui restrained them by raising his hand. He looked at the man, and his eyes narrowed some. I do not know whom your master is, sir. Moreover, I am engaged with this young lady at the moment and really not interested in discussing business. He said you would say that. If you did, I was instructed to tell you the sword of the dragon is not nearly as sharp as the talons of the eagle. Oh, really? Is that supposed to mean something to me? No, it's supposed to mean something to me. Shui was completely taken aback by the entire exchange, and he wasn't sure he liked it. However, he wasn't afraid, and it appeared the two men were no match for his bodyguards, so he agreed to go with the man. Very well. I may bring my bodyguards, yes? Just one. You will not be harmed, I assure you. The lady may come as well, a gesture of good faith. The pair followed the men to the elevator and rode it to the fifth floor. When they had finally reached a very plain and nondescript door, like all of the others on that floor, Shui and Fong were shown into a fabulous room that looked as if it took up the space of three or four rooms. They were seated, offered something to drink, and then left to wait. Finally, their host emerged from a closed door accompanied by the two men. Shui didn't recognize him, and a brief glance at Fong told him she didn't know who he was either. However, he was clearly an American. The entire situation was strange, but Shui somehow felt at ease unthreatened, and almost in some sort of trance. He had to wonder for a moment if the men had drugged him, but he was in full command of his senses. The atmosphere was just charged with the combined aura of power, security, and warmth. Lao Ming Shui, welcome to my home. Thank you for accepting my invitation. I had the impression there wasn't a choice. I am not accustomed to being summoned like some common servant, sir. I do apologize. My men were ordered to be polite. He smiled and sat down in a chair across from the sofa on which they were seated. However, you are not a prisoner and free to leave if you wish. I hope you consider yourself my guest. 
That would depend on why you have asked me to come here. Oh, now that's the interesting part. I'd like to tell you a story about hostile takeovers and the Mexican mafia, and about gun battles in Las Vegas and double crosses in the Kung Lao Triad. But most of all, I want to tell you how we're going to help you change all of that and make the Kung Lao Triad the most powerful organization in the world. And who is we? The government of the United States. Chihuahua, Mexico. Carrillo greeted his military guest sadly, who was seated on the veranda overlooking the gardens of Carrillo's estate. Amaro, my friend, I have just received the report that the team just sent to Las Vegas was destroyed. Colonel Nevas jumped from his seat. What? All of them? Most of them. The rest either eluded police capture or were killed resisting them. Someone tipped off the American law enforcement? No. They responded to reports of gunfire, apparently instigated by the slippery and mysterious American. Although we do have a name now. Mike Velasco. Ah, cover name. Obviously. But he is the same man that killed several of my closest associates in Las Vegas and questioned my man inside the U.S. Border Patrol about those weapons we tried to acquire for Joe. Your team was responding to help my men, but Velasco apparently caught them off guard. Nevas slowly sat and shook his head with an expression of disbelief. One man destroyed a platoon of my best soldiers? I do not believe it. I have no reason to lie to Joe. This man is very dangerous. Of this, I have no doubt. We must eradicate him, and quickly. I agree. It will be done before sunset tomorrow. No, I do not think it is wise to send any more troops. I believe an alternative means is required to deal with this individual. He was posing as a member of the DEA, but I do not think he works for them. Could he perhaps be with the CIA? No, I don't think that's the case either. I believe he may be working with an agency we know nothing about. It's hard to say. However, I have an idea that has worked in the past. There are other means to deal with such men. And those would be? I have previously used Conrado for missions just like this one. He is well-trained, tough, and resourceful. I do not think you'll have any problem eliminating this Belasco. Carrillo noticed Nevas's face turn a disconcerting shade of reddish purple that was evident even through his dark complexion. He wasn't sure why, but he thought maybe the FARC leader was embarrassed. He didn't have any reason to be in Carrillo's mind. This Belasco was a dangerous man, and his elimination required someone equally dangerous. Conrado Diaz was just that someone. Diaz had learned his art in both the urban and jungle battlegrounds of Mexico and Honduras. He was extremely quick and an efficient killer. Diaz killed solemnly, quietly, personally. He wasn't a flashy assassin or a braggart. He was a methodical assassin, but not an exhibitionist. And Carrillo had every faith he could eliminate Velasco quickly and effortlessly. I realize that this may be a matter of honor for Joe, Amado, but we must both set aside our pride and concentrate on the real task ahead of us. The controlling of Baja has become a priority. We must seize control while we can. Do you think that we should act immediately to move up our timetable? I don't think we have any choice, my friend. It wouldn't be the ideal method, but I'm concerned that with the footholds we've already lost in Texas and Las Vegas, we might lose the Baja-California border as well. I cannot argue with your logic, Jose. That much is sure. Good. Then we're in agreement. The time to act is now. How do you wish to proceed? I will send Conrado to find his Velasco immediately. That should eliminate that liability. I have heard rumors that some of our remaining areas of control may fall under attack by these Chinese vermin. You must regroup your forces there and instruct them to render whatever assistance and protection they can in conjunction with my own teams. They're at your disposal. Let us hope that word will remain strictly a figure of speech. If Belasco isn't working for the Chinese and is only one man, then I dare not think about what multiple men could do. I'm not sure why we're having such trouble defending our positions. Because you could have never foreseen something like this. You have never faced a group of this size before, nor had to battle against this kind of fanatical resolve. However, I have many well-trained men at my disposal. I will bring in a thousand troops if that's what it takes. But we will not be defeated by these Chinese slime. I admire your metal, my friend. And I yours. Now tell me of your plans for the Baja. I believe our first step should be a quick, decisive strike against any Mexican or American law enforcement that may not be on the payroll. We have identified certain areas that should be under control before we make the move to transport our shipping across the border. I thought you had all of those angles covered with the Mexican and American police. As far as our molested passage across the border is concerned, yes. But that doesn't take into account agents from the BATF, DEA, or the local cops in Mexicali. 
They could prove to be quite troublesome if we don't take security measures. Mm, what is your plan to deal with them? Oh, that is a most pleasurable thought. I already have my own men in place who will create a diversion. They're going to bomb the central police station in Mexicali. It's where all prisoners arrested are brought for processing before being shipped out from more isolated jails until trial. And that is quite a diversion. Absolutely. The bomb will not be large, but it will be enough to bring their police and other agencies running. In light of the anti-terrorist measures created by the U.S., the aid will come pouring into the area. This creates a media circus and also focuses attention on what's happening at the local area. I see what you're saying. This will allow us to quietly slip through the cracks. Precisely. There are always holes, and I've spent considerable amounts of money to bribe U.S. Border Patrol officials, not to mention my trump card. What trump card? Oh, no. I'm not quite ready to reveal that, Jay. I thought you trusted me. I do, but I promise not to weaken this individual's position or status until the time is right. You see, many years of experience have taught me that it makes little difference if an operation is planned down to the last minute details. Something can still rear its head and bite one in the ass when attention is focused on the battle. I had to learn this lesson the hard way. So when the time is right, I will reveal this plan to Joe. Las Vegas, Nevada. Despite the destruction of Carrillo's drug house and Boland's subsequent escape, the executioner felt as if he'd only won a hollow victory. He was also disturbed at something that had bothered him since cleaning up and leaving Rossetti's place. It was something he couldn't put his finger on yet, but he trusted his intuition. There was a lot more here than met the eye, and he planned to be there when that something manifested itself. Rossetti had loaned Bolin his car, and the executioner promised to leave it parked at an arranged spot. The executioner now approached Danny Tang's house from the rear. He'd warned the man to skip town, get out of the business of flesh peddling, but he was fairly sure the criminal hadn't followed through. It was time for Boland to help point him in the right direction. The guys guarding the house weren't the regular types Boland had seen on his previous visit. They were totally professional and wore markings of the Scarlet Dragons. Nobody was talking, nobody was smoking or joking, and every single one of them exuded an attitude of alertness. Boland did a quick estimate, engaged he probably needed to take five to six soldiers before even gaining entrance to the house. The executioner wanted to try to pull this off quietly. He planned to get in, take care of Tang and his men, and then get out. He stripped himself of all but the Berettas and his combat knife, and then moved to an adjoining yard before moving closer to the house. A flank movement would be the best approach, because the thick wall of mortared flagstone that surrounded the property wasn't as much made for security as a matter of decorative taste. Tang obviously had faith in his security force. Olin ducked and moved silently along the wall until he reached a point he judged would be a blind spot to the guard force. <clears throat> he came over the wall and moved into the shadows of the house, cast by the street lights and decorative lamps scattered at regular intervals along the top of the wall. The executioner couldn't help wondering why the Scarlet Dragons were present. Tang hadn't given Bolin the impression he was friendly with them. Then again, perhaps Tang wasn't there anymore. Maybe he was dead, and somebody had moved into his action. Well, whoever it was wouldn't live to see the sunrise. Bolin started to move quickly past a basement window, when something surprising and revolting caught his eye. Lisa Rayero and Noreen Zahn were tied to a wall naked, their faces bleeding and bruised. Someone had tortured them, and Bolin stared grimly at their condition. Rayero seemed to be in much better shape than Zahn. She was still conscious, at least semi-conscious. The executioner immediately knew that his odds of getting in and out quietly had just dropped to about nil. Bolin tried to access the wide, short casement window, but it was shut and locked from the inside. He didn't want to risk breaking any glass, at least not until he'd verified Zahn's and Rayero's condition. He wasn't even sure they would have enough strength to escape, which meant he'd have his hands full if he got into a firefight. He continued onward, moving toward the front of the house, and crouched when he reached the corner. A guard was leaning against the side of the house, not moving, and a little too busy watching everything happening on the street. It proved fatal, as Volan took a deep breath, let out half, and then jumped up and encircled his forearm around the smaller man's neck. The guy struggled to break free, trying to elbow Bolin, but the effort was futile. 
All the man's training in martial arts couldn't compare with the cold, hard experience of the executioner. As the guy lost consciousness, Olin drove the combat knife into his kidney. He deposited the corpse quietly on the lawn and then ventured toward the front door. Just over the hedges covering the front of the house, Olin could see the top of squad car lights. They had obviously beefed up patrols and watches since his last visit to the neighborhood. Well, he was going to avoid an encounter with them at all costs this time. Olin reached another casement window, jumped into the semicircle culvert, and shoved the window aside. He squeezed his frame through and dropped quietly onto the carpeted floor. He was in what looked like a recreation room, and he saw two doors. The one to his left, he surmised, led to the room where Zahn and Rayero were held captive, but he wanted to check the other one. He would need a couple of ways out. The soldier went to the door and tried the handle. It moved smoothly, and he cracked the door, peering through the opening. The door led onto a wide hallway that was vacant at the moment. A few doors lined one side, but they were open, and Bolin didn't hear anything. He closed the door and moved over to the second. Bolin opened this one in the same fashion and saw he was right. The two women were bound to the wall, and the extent of their suffering was much more obvious from his vantage point. The executioner glanced quickly around the room, then moved through the doorway, Beretta held in front of him and ready for any threat. No one emerged to challenge him as he walked slowly toward the women. He checked Rayero first, feeling for a pulse at her neck and the lifting of her head. Keep still. It's me, Belasco. Tears began to flood her eyes. Olin released his hold and tried to comfort Rayero as she started to sob softly. He moved over to Zahn and checked her pulse. There was none. He cupped her bruised and swollen chin in his hand and put his ear to her nostrils. No breathing, either. Her eyes were sightless when he lifted the lids, and the executioner could taste the rage in his mouth in the form of bile. Is she okay? No, she's not. <laughs> oh, God, why? Why would they do this to us? We didn't know anything. Bolin untied her and found a quilt to throw over her. What did they ask you? He wanted to know about you and the operations you had planned. He reached to a chair, retrieved an afghan from it, and tossed it around her shoulders. You didn't know that, and neither did Zahn. What are we going to do? Get the hell out of here. Did you recognize any of the men who questioned you? She shook her head as they moved over to the casement window. It was just one man. One man did this to you? Uh-huh. Uh, you're passing out. Think you can make it? Uh, yeah. It was a damn tragedy. The death of a good woman like Noreen Zahn, and Bolin was thankful he'd arrived in time to pull out at least one of them alive. He silently vowed that he would come back and destroy whoever was responsible for her death. As he assisted Rayero out the window and started out after her, he heard the noise of the door to the hallway burst open behind him. All of the executioner's rage over the death of Noreen Zahn was poured into the initial hail of gunfire he rained on the Scarlet Dragon troops who burst into the room. The subsonic 9mm Parabellum bullets took the first pair of dragons shoulders high. Two rounds of the first three-shot burst punched holes in the chest of the lead dragon, and the third took his backup man in the face, blowing apart his skull and showering the Scarlet Dragon troops with blood and brain matter. The second trio of rounds tore through the stomach of the third man, punching him to the floor. The bodies of the hasty were now stacked in front of the door, preventing any of the other troops from gaining a clear shot. Bolin used the moment to climb through the casement window and get to high ground. Rayero was waiting impatiently, huddled in the shadows and trembling. Bolin decided to take her mind off it by handing the Beretta to her. Kill anything that moves. She nodded and they started to return via the path Olin had taken coming into the property. The house suddenly went bright, the grounds coming alive with the stark glare of searchlights and security lamps that had been hidden in the dark recesses of the house. Bolin and Rayero were immediately flooded with light. The executioner gestured to the wall, holstering his pistol, and then kneeling to offer Rayero a leg up. She immediately took his cue and scrambled over the wall with the assisted height. Bolin followed behind her, going over the wall and shoulder rolling to his feet. Head for the rear of the lawn. They stayed low, crouching as they ran and keeping close to the wall. Shit. 
so much for quiet. A shadowy form appeared to challenge Bolin, but the guy didn't have a chance under the sights of Lisa Rigero. The DEA agent shot him before he could reach Bolin. She walked forward to put another four rounds into him after he'd fallen, then kicked his body and finally spit on him. Dirt-streaked tears were evident across her worn and weary face. Let's get out of here. And with that, Bolin grabbed Rayero's hand and led her into the safety and cover of darkness. Within an hour of their escape, Bolin had managed to get them into a small motel near the airport. The cab driver thought the couple were pretty strange, but a hundred-dollar bill ensured no questions now and the promise of complete silence thereafter. The guy even waited in the cab with Rayero while Bolin checked in which would avoid any uncomfortable confrontation with the motel staff over bringing a bruised, half-naked woman into the building. Bolin waited until Rayero had showered and then used a first aid kit from his pack to treat her wounds. Now that your injuries are cleaned up, they don't look quite so bad, but you still might be better off in a hospital. No, I wouldn't feel safe there. These people mean business. I'd feel better laying low until I've had a chance to recover. You can stay here as long as you want but I'm going to have to catch the next flight to LAX. Los Angeles? Why LA? Two reasons. One, I know there's a major air operation going on at a private airstrip just outside the city. Korea is smuggling drugs across through the Baja pipeline, and from there they go to the airstrip. Then they come directly here, and we're being sold through one of Korea's major houses, which no longer exists. You shut it down? Permanently. What about the Kung Lok Triad? Who do you think was holding you? They're definitely involved in this. A guy named Lao Ming Shui is running the operation, and they're taking over big time. My actions against Carrillo to this point have barely made a dent. How can that be? Because while they could have proved disastrous to Carrillo, it's no loss to Chinese organized crime. To a group like the Kung Lok, this is small-time stuff. You saw the force we were up against back there. That wasn't ordinary muscle. It was the Scarlet Dragons, which are feared and renowned as some of the toughest enforcers in the business. Okay, but what do you think is going on behind all of this, Mike? And how does any of this tie into Cepedas? What do you mean? Well, somebody told the Kung Lok that my partner and I were going to see Cepedas because they hit us on the road. We were under orders by Charlie Metzger to go to El Paso and pick up the investigation of Cepedas where you left off. Oh, by the way, my boss knows about you. He also knows you've passed around fake ID as one of our agents. And he may have assigned somebody to find and arrest you for questioning. Story of my life. I just don't get any of this. It's too much for coincidence. You're right. It's definitely not coincidence. The Kung Lok has been planning this operation for a while, and I think it knew exactly how much control Carrillo had over these operations. So the triad decided to take it over for itself. Bolin shrugged, dabbing at a cut on her forehead with some antiseptic. Why not? It's nothing but pure profit, and the Kung Lok has little left to exploit in Canada and Hong Kong. And that's not to mention its political ties. Especially with its political ties. I have a feeling there's a lot more going on here than seems to be the case. And I think there's some political maneuvering that figures in. I just haven't figured out how it ties to Carrillo and his connection with the Colombians. Not yet, anyway. What about the Kung Lok? If it had dibs on Tang and its hooks into Mario Ibanez then it's obvious the triad would have to take the major air shipment operation going on in L.A. That's why I have to go there. In the meantime, you can stay here until you feel strong enough to go back to Brownsville. I'm not going to Brownsville. I'm going to El Paso and complete my mission, just like Metzger ordered me to do. You're kidding, right? Metzger might have been the one that set you up. I don't think so. And I need to do something. And since it's obvious you're not going to let me help you, then I'm going to be involved some other way. I have to, Belasco. For me and for Noreen. Those bastards killed her, and I want some payback. I'll make sure you get payback. Trust me on that. Maybe so, but you can't be everywhere at once, and eventually, when and if you're finished with the Chinese, you're going to turn to Carrillo. I might as well start being useful for something other than a punching bag and start finding out what's going on. If Ramon Cepedas is on Carrillo's payroll, then I have to assume he's not the only one. Fair enough. But you watch your back, Lisa. I can't promise I'll be around to pull you out of the fire next time. Let's just say there won't be a next time. From here on out, they either take my dead body or they don't take me at all. I won't wind up like Noreen did. I refuse to wind up like that. 
West Palm Beach, Florida. The story the man took more than an hour to recount was fascinating, if not bordering on complete fantasy. But there was something genuine and congenial and motivating about the man, and the way he told the story left Shuey with the impression he had no choice but to accept it as the truth, at least until he had time to check with his own sources and verify the story. The man appeared genuine, although he had offered neither his name nor an explanation for how he knew so much about Shui and the Kong Lok. It had been his understanding that the meeting was secret and forbidden to anyone except members of the Kong Lok. Non-Asians weren't allowed. Then again, he hadn't seen the man at the dinner party or even in the lobby of the hotel, so perhaps he had kept to himself. He had blonde hair and blue eyes. The dark complexion of his skin wasn't the result of natural pigmentation as much as regular exposure to the sun. He was almost a Hollywood dream boy, had the kind of Southern California good looks that Shuey had seen hired again and again for the porn films they made in Canada. Shuey guessed he was from the South somewhere, perhaps the immediate area, or perhaps the American Southwest. How much again did you say that this deal you've made was worth? Five billion U.S. <laughs> Impossible. Fact. And how exactly do I fit into all of this? How much is it going to cost me? Nothing more than you didn't already spend. You just need to keep the pressure on Carrillo. The more pressure that's on him and Amado Nieves, the more desperate they get. Pretty soon they're expending troops and money like never before, and suddenly it's all for naught. They walk away with nothing. The Kung Lok walks away with half. And the other half? It goes into various other coffers. And just exactly what other coffers are those? The ones that are on a need-to-know basis? Look, you can do this or not. It makes no difference to me. But you've opened the door on the Carrillo crime family, and that's not something you can just back out of. Even if you don't choose to be part of this alliance, you cannot withdraw either. You try to back down now, and Carrillo will convince his Colombian cronies to come after you. There's already a small war brewing between the Carrillo Nieves faction and the Kung Lok. Why not profit from this in a way even you had not imagined? Your words sound good in theory, but I have never trusted the Americans. Kung Lok doesn't need the United States to fulfill its place in history against men like Carrillo. Not to mention the fact I am unable to bring myself to trust a man who claims to represent the American government, but would sell out from under them for a quick U.S. dollar or two. <laughs> You're kidding, right? You're not talking a few hundred thousand or even a few million here, pal. We're talking about two and a half billion dollars. Now, that might not seem like a lot to Bill Gates or John D. Rockefeller, but it's more than adequate to get the attention of a profiteer like myself, or you for that matter. Do not pretend to know me. You do not know me. You are impetuous and presumptuous, and I do not think we should continue this conversation. Well, now that's too bad. Because Dim Mai indicated you would be much more amicable to accepting assistance from outside sources. That caused Shui to give pause for a moment, and he could feel Fong's hand come to rest on his arm. He looked at her, and although she didn't return his guess, but stared straight ahead, he could tell she was fighting to keep her face impassive. It was probably her way of telling him that she hadn't been aware of her husband's plan to ally himself with American officials. Then again, maybe she had known about it, and she was cautioning him. He decided to play out the line, act interested, and see what turns the conversation took. Shui made a show of looking out the window of the hotel onto the twinkling skyline of West Palm Beach. I don't trust the Americans. I don't trust you. Well, I don't trust you either, Shui. But you have to admit that what I'm telling you is true. And let me tell you something else you may not know. The American government doesn't want the embarrassment of a war right on their own streets. You know what you're up against, taking on Carrillo and his Mexican mafia, and you sure as hell know what kind of price you could pay. My people are ready to pay that price for the greater good. <laughs> Do you really think that your people in Hong Kong give a rat's ass about the pride of China? Can you honestly say you care about it yourself? You got into this to make money, Shui, and the fact of the matter remains that you won't make a cent without the help of others. And here's something else you probably don't know. Everybody in this little deal is doing nothing more than looking to carve a name for themselves in the financial annals of history. 
This isn't about pride in China or Hong Kong or the might of the triads, my friend. It's about money, plain and simple. It's about profit, and we all have our little piece of the pie. I'm offering the Kung Lok triad and everybody in it an opportunity to have both. You sound more like an opportunist on a mission to make as much money as you possibly can. Well, you're damn right I am. Look around you, sweet. You think this is the way I want to build my own empire? Surround myself with meager furnishings and second-rate room service? I've been renting this hole from the hotel for months under an assumed name. Those idiots think I'm some pedantic businessman with an ego too large for my own good. And I've been doing everything I can to maintain that image. I knew about your little powwow here months before it happened. Where do you think I got that information? I do not know. I was wondering about that earlier. I'll bet you were. And you're probably wondering just who the hell I am and who I work for. Yes, Mr... Ah, 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 that shall remain unimportant for now. Or at least until you've decided whether to accept my offer. I have no reason to trust you, then, if you will not even tell me your name. <sighs> None of your associates know my name either, but that hasn't stopped them from seizing the advantage. You see, Shui, now is the time to ask yourself what you believe. I can tell you that if you're doing this thing against Carrillo because you feel it will put you in better graces with the Hong Kong syndicate, you're gravely mistaken. They don't care if you carve a niche for yourself. Hell, they've been expecting it. And Dim Mai's been running your name down to everyone he can, including your pal General Jaquan. So you put the feelers out through the general? Yeah, in a manner of speaking. Jaquan and I have done each other favors on more than one occasion. I like the guy, and I like his ideas. You see, Shui, and you'll have to forgive me for saying so, Mrs. Mai, but Jaquan doesn't like Dim Mai that much. He especially doesn't like the way the guy is always lording it over everybody that he controls the Pacific Arms Network. He may be a big gun dealer, but that's all he is. He has no real political power, and the Hong Kong politicians hate his guts. I can definitely tell you that Yi Chang Shun doesn't think anything of him. It is true. Shen and Dim do not get along. They are as different as night and day. Exactly. So you can see why an alliance with someone like myself would be of tremendous advantage to you. It would seem you stand to suffer nothing in this alliance, as you call it, while the rest of us stand being put to considerable inconvenience. Mm, my intelligence told me you were a skeptic. So you have been spying on me? It's my job to spy on everyone who poses a potential threat to the United States. And I am one of these people? All six billion of you Chinese are a threat to us. You've stolen our military secrets, bribed our public officials, and put gangs of unrivaled force onto our streets. The Chinese triads are still one of the most feared crime syndicates in this country, surpassing the power of the Sicilians, Mexicans, or Japanese Yakuza. There are more Chinatowns and more major cities in this country than any other single icon of ethnic demographics. That sounds like a stereotype. Hardly. It's a well-known fact. And don't preach to me about stereotype and shui because you stereotyped Americans earlier. You and your pals aren't as inscrutable and proper as you'd like the rest of the world to think you are, and I'm not so impressed by the kung lok that I'm intimidated. However, I am a wise man and a man of opportunity. And I hope you're the same. And if I do not accept your offer, well, it's no skin off my nose. The fact of the matter is, you have nothing to fear from me. I'm not in the business of rubbing out those who don't want to play ball with me. It's not good for business, and it's not profitable. A man needs allies in today's world. On one side of the fence, I've got the faith and loyalty of the American government. On the other side, I've got the Kung Lok tribe. Shui could feel his face go flush with anger and disgust for the slime that sat in front of him. He cared for nothing, wanted for nothing. All the man could see was his greed and his power. All he could obviously envision was a virtually unlimited source of monetary funds and whatever imagined power it would bring him. This man was nothing short of delusional, and he was so confident in himself that it wanted to make Shui vomit. He knew that such a man might seem beneficial at first, but eventually he would be a liability. 
Nonetheless, Shuey knew that what he was saying about the Carrillo crime family was true. If he backed off now, or for some unlikely circumstance, he was unable to seize the action in the American Southwest, there would eventually come a time where his life wouldn't be worth any more than the filth on the bottom of his shoes. That wasn't a good position in which to be when it came to the Kong Lok. So he would bide his time, make a pact with this nameless stranger, and when all seemed right, and he had used the man for what he could, he would destroy him, and anyone else who got in his way. I have decided that I will accept your offer. The stranger smiled, leaning forward to offer his hand, which Shuey took reluctantly. Now I shall tell you a little bit more about myself, and just how I can help you succeed in destroying Carrillo and the Colombian. Los Angeles, California. Mac Boland took a red-eye flight from Las Vegas to LAX, procured a rental car, and was soon headed toward the outskirts of the city. Thanks to one of Cowboy Kissinger's contacts, fresh firepower awaited him in the trunk of the rental. Stowing his weapons aboard checked luggage would have been virtually impossible on such short notice, and even if he could have acquired clearance documents in a timely fashion, it would have drawn way more attention than he wanted. Boland found a new bag in the trunk, complete with a Beretta 93R and 44 Magnum Desert Eagle. There was also an M16 A2 M203 with a thousand rounds of SS-109 ammo, ten 40mm high explosive grenades, and four handheld smokers. A Remington 7mm sniper rifle with 30 power scope completed the kit. Lisa Rayero didn't bat an eye when the executioner told her he had to go. The lady was tough, and she would survive. In a way, he felt guilty for leaving her behind, but he knew the numbers were running down, and there was little doubt Rayero could take care of herself. She didn't act like the helpless damsel in distress, so Bolin put her troubles out of his mind and focused on the work ahead of him. After about an hour, the executioner stopped at a vacant rest stop off the highway and contacted Stony Man. Aaron Kurtzman answered. We clear? You bet, Stryker. How's it going? Could be better, but I'm still on schedule. Anything new on that end? Well, Hal left less than an hour ago for a meeting with the man. Barb's at NSA headquarters, using her contacts there to run down some additional information on recent FARC movements. Able team's still on standby, ready to help if you need them. Unfortunately, we couldn't send Phoenix to help now, even if we wanted. They just left for Costa Rica. What's brewing down there? I'm not exactly sure yet. I haven't had time to talk to Hal about it. Seems the natives are restless down there, though, so I'm sure I'll find out soon enough. Check that. Listen, tell Hal there may still be some loose strings in Vegas, and he might want to send the feds to check it out. You remember my little message to Tang? Yeah. Well, I think the receivers weren't happy with it. I'm sure Tang and most of his gang are no longer with us. That's no loss, in my humble opinion. I hear you. But there's still a major pool of Scarlet Dragons trying to hold their position in Las Vegas. I'd advise Vegas PD to proceed with caution and do what they can to curb the problems. I'm in blitz mode, and there's one more thing to take care of here in California before I head to Mexicali. Do you need anything? No. Cowboy already helped me out on this end. Jack headed back to Texas, and he's waiting there for further instructions. I imagine he'll be checking in soon. Already has. We got him on standby there until we know how this thing is going to play out. Good enough. Hey, that reminds me. We have something else you might find interesting. Some company guys reported a major meeting down in Florida. Looks like we've got a whole slew of Hong Kong politicians sponsoring some sort of major shindig. Most of them have known ties with the Kung Lok triad. Seems there are a lot more fingers in this pie than we'd originally thought. Interesting. We thought so too, since not one of these guys bothered to inform the man they were in town. I hope he plans to continue playing ignorant. He was originally going to make it an issue, but I think Hal talked him out of it. That's probably the best way to play it. It's not like they believe we don't know they're here. I agree. But we're hoping that the president will come off unconcerned and they'll be off guard. Not likely. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we've identified some interesting faces in the crowd. Not only are some major political players on the guest list, but also Lao Ming Shui, Dim Mai, and Yi Cheng Shun. And check this out. Are you familiar with a Chinese general by the name of Deng Jiquan? Something tingled in the pit of the executioner's stomach. Yeah, he knew the name all too well. 
Jeek Wan had been responsible for the deaths of thousands of innocent people in his time. He'd offered arms and troops to at least half a dozen known terrorist organizations throughout Southeast Asia and was a major contributor to continued warfare in the Middle East countries. It sounds like some heavy hitters, Bear. If Jaquan's involved, I'd start looking for supporters from inside the U.S. You think this goes that deep? I can almost guarantee it. Jaquan never does anything on his own, and if he has a green light from his masters in China, that means there are big plans for conquest on the part of the Kung Lok. They've already shown they're not afraid to start a war right on the streets of this country. I think Jaquan knows the FARC is involved, and I think he'll be looking to manipulate the situation to his advantage. Roger that, Stryker. I'll start digging up what I can on his most recent activities. I'll be in touch again. Out. Bolin returned to his car and continued toward his target. He kept an eye on the rearview mirror, conscious of any change in traffic flow. It was light, as light as could be expected for L.A. suburbia that hour of the morning. So Bolin knew any tales would be easy to spot. He'd experienced a foreboding sense since leaving Las Vegas. No potential threat had presented itself thus far, but the warrior had learned to trust his judgment. He rarely left things like that to chance when his good sense told him differently. Still, if someone was watching him, they were doing one hell of a job staying inconspicuous. Another ten minutes elapsed before Bolin exited Interstate 405 where it met Highway 73. It was a short jog southeast to where the road intersected Highway 55. The airstrip operations were actually taking place within the control of John Wayne Airport in Orange County. The executioner had to admit that there was some poetic justice in that fact, and the thought brought a smile. Bolin parked his car on a side road, stripped his street clothes off to reveal his black suit, and then retrieved his bag from the trunk. He jogged the half-mile to a fenced area on the southwest perimeter of the airport. The executioner had obtained aerial reconnaissance photographs from DEA records, and he knew which section was held by the drug runners. He'd planned to tackle this part of Carrillo's organization in conjunction with his offensive on the Brownsville pipeline, but his encounters with the Kong Lok had changed all of that. Bolin wasn't even sure if this part of the California pipeline was still under Carrillo's control, but he couldn't believe the Kung Lok could move so fast in such a short period of time. Carrillo's operations in the southwest spread far and wide. He still controlled the major drug action on the other side of the border, and the executioner had no solid evidence that that had changed, especially since he'd been working on stamping out the Kung Lok's territorial claims faster than it could make them. Bolin studied the quiet airstrip on the other side of the fence. This side of the airport wasn't well lit, and the shadows kept the soldier virtually invisible to any ground observers. He retrieved his M16 A2 M203 and several spare clips, which he shoved into the hidden pouches in the suit. He stuck the Desert Eagle into a special horizontal shoulder rigging beneath his left arm, and then folded the bag over and latched it with clip straps. To most, it would have looked like an ordinary gym bag, but it actually converted into a hip satchel for quick access to the grenades. Olin secured the makeshift pouch to his military belt and then climbed the chain-link fence in one easy motion. The executioner crossed the expanse of the airfield in a flat run and dropped prone at the far end of an asphalt strip. Three adjacent buildings, erected in an I formation, stood off the airstrip. No light emanated from the windows, but Bolin suspected this was by design. He was confident that most of the drug runs took place at night, when departures and landings from the main terminal were at a minimum. Most of the inbound and outbound flights from the airport were business commuters, consisting of private express flights to other airports in neighboring states or business jets. None of the major airlines operated at the airport either, as it wasn't designed to handle commercial traffic. Thus, the irregular comings and goings of private planes at odd hours wasn't unusual. Olin noticed a lone Learjet positioned near the buildings in a taxi lane. He couldn't tell exactly what type of craft it was, but an inspection of the exterior markings visible in the illumination by a tall light pole didn't reveal anything out of the ordinary. He crossed the airstrip without incident and made for the central building's door. Nobody would be expecting a fully armed assailant to come strolling through the front door, and he realized that would give him the advantage he sought. The executioner had learned through experience that taking a certain calculated risk was part of the business. 
His intuition had paid off before, and it did again. As he suspected, the place was filled with trouble. The first pair to spot him clawed for guns, barely able to see above a table containing hundreds of kilos of cut product and pills. The bags of cocaine weren't thick enough to repel Poland's justice. Clouds of crystalline narcotic rained on the table and floor, thousands of dollars lost in the twinkling of an eye. And the executioner was just getting started. As Bolin reached into the satchel and withdrew one of the smokers, three more hoods with weapons drawn appeared from a nearby room. They were ready for a shootout, but not expecting Bolin's alternative, as he yanked the pin on the smoker and tossed it underhanded onto the table. The heat from the fuse began to melt the plastic, and smoke immediately filled the area between the soldier and his opponents. Bolin knew the smoker wasn't enough to stop them from trying to kill him, and dropped to the linoleum in time to avoid a firestorm of pistol fire. The executioner got to his feet, starting to choke on the toxic fumes filling the vestibule area when the battle had joined. The fuse on the smoker had obviously ignited the meth powder in the pills. Combined with the melted plastic and heated cocaine, Bolin wasn't sure if asphyxia or overdose would kill him first. Either way, it wouldn't kill him as quickly as another trio that arrived to investigate the sounds of gunfire. Two of these men carried some of the automatic machine pistols. Bolin had seen entirely too many of them already. The remaining target managed to evade Bolin's first couple of firsts, but the fate of the pair with him proved too much a distraction. By the time the guy realized that his adversary wasn't going to just hit and hit, it was too late. The man collapsed as blood spewed from his mutilated abdomen. Bolin rose from his kneeling position and continued through the winding complex. He kept the over and under in front of him, ready for any resistance. He figured maybe five or six minutes remained before he had to make his exit, assuming someone had heard the gunfire coming from the outbuildings. It was more likely nobody had heard a thing, given the distance to the enclosed main terminal and the majority of ground crews outside were ear protection. However, there would be no hiding the plane and buildings when he destroyed them. But by that time, the executioner would be gone. The soldier finished checking the first building, then made his way out a rear door and proceeded to check the second. It was empty. He moved on to the third, and it was vacant as well. The executioner had to admit he was a bit puzzled. It was possible that someone had warned his people, or perhaps they had left only a skeleton crew to watch the place. It seemed that Carrillo was just rolling over to the Kung Lock, and the executioner couldn't understand it. Bolin was about to leave the third building when a light in the corner caught his eye. It was just a glowing sliver, like light spilling through a partially closed door. The soldier approached with caution when he realized that was exactly what it was. He pushed the door open with the muzzle of his rifle and immediately noticed a gray metal desk and chair, like the kind issued to many government offices. There was a small lamp on the desk, the source of the light, and then Bolin noticed the open safe and the open window that looked onto the main terminal. The executioner stuck his head through the window in time to see a man running for the plane. Shit! <clears throat> Bolin jumped through and took up pursuit. The guy reached the rear jet and got up the ramp. Reaching the jet just as the man struggled to lift the stairway ramp on his own, Bolin managed to shove the muzzle of his M16 through the opening before the guy could close it. He then reached up, grabbed the top of the ramp and yanked hard. The vinyl coated heavy tension cables holding the ramp nearly dislodged in the mounts. The guy stepped backward, obviously surprised by the ferocity of the executioner's attack. He was a puny little man with bifocals and thin hair. Bolin had seen his kind before, and there was something about the guy that was slimy and putrid. The executioner made a show of pressing the still warm muzzle of the M16A2 to the man's forehead, making sure he got a particularly good view of the gaping escape chamber for the grenade launcher. Who are you? I, I... Shut up. I'm asking the questions. Who are you, and what are you doing here? Ah, I can't tell you that. They'll kill me. You're dead anyway if you don't start answering questions. Well, I don't know what I can tell you. Start with who you are and why you're working for a man like Jose Carrillo. I don't work for Carrillo. Then who? As the man began to talk, Bolin could hardly believe what he was hearing. When the would-be escapee's story concluded, Mac Bolin knew that the situation was much worse than he could ever have imagined. The story was so unbelievable, the executioner wasn't sure he could trust his own ears. But the man knew too much, 
and had too many details readily at hand in answer to Boland's questions, which left no doubt his story was true. Once he had secured his prisoner and let loose a volley of grenades onto the jet and buildings from the perimeter of the airport, Boland made arrangements for a pickup. The operator for the local FBI office was certainly puzzled by a phone call from a DEA agent claiming they could find a former government official who had something important to say about drug running in Southern California. After Boland had concluded his call to the FBI, he contacted Stony Man. Brugnola? It's me. Good God, man. Are you okay? I'm fine. Why? We heard there was all kinds of trouble in Las Vegas, and reports are coming in now about California. Bear said you sounded, well, strange. Don't worry, Hal. Just running out of steam, and I've still got a long haul. I'm not worrying. I never worry, Stryker. You know that. I just manage. Whatever you say, Hal. Well, what's next on your agenda? Mexicali. I think that's going to be the center of Carrillo's final play. The guy's pulled out all the stops. Really? Yeah. He's left skeleton crews behind at most of his major sites. Or at least the ones the Kung Lok haven't taken over. Yeah. I also ran into a very interesting character on my assault against Carrillo's operation here in L.A., it seems my hunch about U.S. government officials tied up with the Kung Lok may have some merit. Yeah, Bear mentioned something about that. He and Barb are working about six or seven different angles on this, but we haven't gained much ground. We also don't have the first clue as to who within the government might benefit greatly enough to risk treason and deal with the likes of the Chinese triads. Well, the guy I stumbled across didn't have any names. But he had documents that definitely put Ramon Sapitas of the Border Patrol on the top suspects list. There may also be someone even higher than him working this whole deal. Someone closer to justice. But I'll get back to you when I know more about that. In the meantime, I have another angle you might find interesting. What's that? It seems the motive for hostile takeover isn't centered on the U.S. Where, then? Don't tell me this is about Mexico or Colombia. No, it's about money and Hong Kong. What do you mean? Think about it, Hal. The FARC needs guns, and Carrillo needs to control the border because the competition is getting fierce. That's scenario one. Scenario two is the Kung Lok, who think they can play two ends against the middle. Let's say Shui gets ambitious and decides to go after all of the drug and porn action in the Southwest. But he knows he doesn't have the resources to do it on his own, so he cooks up this elaborate scheme to start a war. I think I see where you're going. He's got the manpower, but he doesn't have the firepower. Or the strong political ties with Hong Kong. It's no secret Chinese officials look the other way in times like these, because the information passed back to them is invaluable. And they don't want to lose their little spy network. Right. So they decide to have a meet, and Shui recruits major players like Dim Mai. Then, because of the political maneuvering, you get people like Jiquan and Shun into the act. Before long, someone in the American government sees where this could be a strong advantage. Drugs for weapons, weapons for power, and power for political anarchy. Someone looks to profit from all sides of the coin while stirring the pot. Then they step back and watch the show. That's an old story. Yeah, but a profitable and deceptive story if all who stand to gain some major advantage play their cards right. And if a U.S. official is pulling the strings here, I'm going to deal with them my way. You think it's Sapitas? Doubtful. I've met the guy, and he's not that bright. Well, it sounds like you're quickly getting this under control. It's just too bad that innocent people have to pick up the pieces when tragedy strikes. Not this time. I'm about to shut down this operation. Permanently. How? I'm going forward with the mission as planned and turn off the pipeline at its source. Carrillo and the FARC pose a significant threat to security, much more right now than Shui. The Kung Lok is still licking its wounds after our last bout. But it sounds like the Kung Lok is the real threat. Agreed. But destroying the drug source destroys demand for weapons or territories. Okay, but then what? Then I finish the remaining rats as they retreat. Brownsville, Texas. Lisa Rajero didn't waste any time returning to her headquarters after Belasco left. She wanted to talk to Metzger. Despite her short but traumatic ordeal, Rayero wasn't feeling too badly, and it wasn't as if she'd never had someone rough her up before. Her ex-husband used to regularly beat the hell out of her, but she learned very quickly that she didn't have to be a victim and put a stop to it. He went to jail, she went to divorce court, and that had been the long and short of her six-month marriage. Rayero grabbed a taxi from the airport 
And within an hour of her arrival, she was seated in Metzger's living room and reporting the events of the past 24 hours. She decided not to wait until he got to their offices. Rajero had a plan she wanted to run by him, and she didn't want anyone else to know about it. Metzger listened with interest, and when Rajero had finally concluded her narrative, the DEA chief took off his glasses and rubbed his sleepy eyes. Why is it that every time this ballast goes around, people start to die? Did you ever ask yourself that question? Probably because every other federal agency is sitting on its respective fat ass and doing nothing, Charlie. You think I'm doing nothing about this? I spent three hours on the damn phone last night trying to console Pete Williams' widow as she wailed in my ear. Not to mention I put out a search party for you and Noreen while agonizing over where you might be or what happened to you. Now I have two agents dead, one who looks like she got run over by a semi, and some maniac who's flying around and killing anyone who looks Hispanic or Chinese, and he's doing it in the name of the DEA. He's not a maniac, and he certainly isn't doing anything in the name of the DEA. He's out there doing something while we do nothing. He single-handedly destroyed that manufacturing plant on the end of town that we've been trying only God knows how long to put down, and he also took out Jose Carrillo's Houston connection. Belasco was behind that hit on the plant? Yeah. I didn't know that. Well, maybe he's not such a bad guy. That place had been generating coke and MDMA in quantities I wouldn't even venture to guess. I think our stat guys estimated somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 keys of processed junk a week running out of that place. Well, now it's a smoldering pile of ash. Metzger appeared to think about the situation for a minute. Rajero didn't say another word, respectful of the silence. <sighs> okay, Lisa. I'm through fighting with the higher-ups about this. It's time for us to start kicking ass and taking names and letting Carrillo know we're not going to take it anymore. Tell me what you think we should do. Belasco is fairly convinced my theory about Cepedas is true. You still think he's dirty? I'm sure of it, Charlie. I'm sure about this than I think I've ever been sure about anything in my whole life. I don't know if he's working for Carrillo or the Kung Lok, but I know he's a filthy traitor. Well, I ran a check on his whereabouts after you disappeared, and I found out he was nowhere near you when the hit on your vehicle went down. I'm sure he didn't even know you were coming, so that probably rules out any connection with the Kung Lok. But Ramon and I have worked in conjunction on a couple of cases. His office is always cooperative with us, and there have never been any problems I've heard of. Still, I know that the recent events have opened my eyes a little more, and it does seem he's a little too clean for my tastes. Well, I'm glad you think so, because I believe he's on Carrillo's payroll. What do you propose to do about it? I'm going to go to El Paso like we tried before. I owe that much to Pete Williams and his widow. But this time, I don't want to advertise the fact. I want only you and me to know about this, Charlie. I think we need to keep things quiet until I can get to El Paso and question Cepedas myself. And what if he doesn't want to answer any of your questions? Well, I can be pretty persuasive. But if he's uncooperative, then he's probably got something to hide. Not necessarily. Just because he won't answer your questions doesn't make him a criminal, Lisa. Whatever you do, I want you to be careful. Don't lean too hard on this guy. Because if he's clean and you push him, we could end up with the proverbial egg all over our faces. I refuse to see my own career go down the tubes because I stepped on another agency's toes when I shouldn't have. So you make sure there's some solid evidence there before making accusations. And I want you to check in hourly. Hourly? Come on, Charlie, I can't it's get... It's not open for negotiation, Lisa. You check in hourly or you forget it and I send someone else. I've lost two good people in the past day. And I'm not going to add to that number. No more deaths, Lisa. I couldn't take that. Okay. Every hour. I give you my word that I'll check in every hour. Good. Rajero knew it was time to get moving, so she started to leave. She had to get some things packed because she knew this little excursion to El Paso was going to be more than just an overnight jaunt. She figured to be gone at least four days, possibly the whole week. As they walked toward the front door, something in Metzger's expression seemed to fall. What is it? I have a really awful feeling about this whole thing. Why? I don't know. I just feel... I feel like something's very wrong, but I can't put my finger on it. Well, I wouldn't worry too much about it. You know, you might be totally right. There might not be a thing to this theory of Belasco's. But then again, there might. This mercy angel of yours has been 3-0 and so far, and he's probably right about the other stuff where Zapatas and Carrillo are concerned. 
The guy obviously has access to intelligence. We don't. Metzger opened the door for her, and she started to leave. Well, I know that whatever happens, it's all going to be okay. I hope you're right. Trust me on this. I'm always right about these things. <laughs> Get out of here. Las Vegas, Nevada. Ying Kao Chu and several of his Scarlet Dragons were waiting to greet Lao Ming Shui on the tarmac of the private airfield outside the city. The Chinese crime lord had concluded his meetings in West Palm Beach and immediately departed for Las Vegas. Shui was exhausted, having spent most of the night talking with his new partner. Despite his earlier reservations, Shui had come to like the triad's newest benefactor, and he foresaw a long and fruitful relationship with the man. Of course, he still planned to fully investigate the man. He needed leverage on every business contact, and Shui had found that the easiest way to do that was through information. And if things didn't work out like the stranger had promised, well, he would simply have to let it leak to the Americans just exactly what was happening in their own backyard. But first, he needed to know who the man was and everything he could about his position inside the U.S. government. That had become Kao Chu's number one priority. Shui told him as much during their ride to Shui's hotel. Why aren't we going to your new house? Security reasons. I find your tone disrespectful, Ing. You will explain yourself and your actions, and you will do it now. <sighs> it is this Belasco again. I thought I told you to eliminate him. We tried Lao, but he is extremely elusive. This is no ordinary man. Ah, that's a feeble excuse for the weak-minded thing. Every man is an ordinary man until someone tries to make him extraordinary. It seems this man is becoming some sort of myth among the dragons, and you're letting it happen. He has walked into and out of the hands of your best soldiers, snuffing their lives as if it were nothing, and he has done so with repeated impunity. Why have you let him do this, Ing? He's undermining your authority and my reputation, and it has to stop. Is that clear? Yes. I think that for the time being, I don't want you to concern yourself with this Velasco. Leave him to me. Your newest priority is to find out everything you can about the man I spoke with. I've arranged to secure copies of the hotel video cameras so that we can get a picture of him. You think he would be foolish enough to allow someone to take his photograph? I don't think he believes we are smart enough to utilize those kinds of resources. I spoke with Dim Mai and General Ji Kwan after talking with this individual, and they don't trust him any more than I do. So we have decided to find out who he is, and then if things do not come about as he predicted, we will know how best to deal with him. As you wish. And what about Velasco? How are you going to deal with him? I have already told you not to worry about him. Shui looked out the window and nodded to himself. Yes, he knew exactly how to deal with Velasco. His day of atonement is coming. Chihuahua, Mexico. The troops are in position. I've just received word from Captain Mirada, and he is standing by for my orders. We're ready to implement your plan. Carrillo nodded at Nevas and looked at his watch. We still have a few hours before the trucks will arrive. Where is the shipment coming from? I have a processing plant just north of San Felipe. It is served as a great central point for that entire area. The product will move up through Mexicali and across the border tonight during the, uh, shall we say, festivities. It sounds like you have things well in hand, my friend. Carrillo tried not to look impressed with himself, although he couldn't help gloating a little bit. This had been a long time coming, and he was finally going to see all of his work pay off. Nothing could stop the disaster that was about to befall the city of Mexicali. Carrillo knew that some Mexican people, his own blood, would perish tonight, but it was for a greater good. The Americans had always been smug, looking down their noses at the wet back. Well, that was about to change, because Carrillo was going to give them the monkey for their backs they always desired. The whites, and particularly those in America, had an unusual propensity for drugs, and they would pay through the nose to get them. Carrillo considered himself nothing more than a businessman. He knew what they said about him, but he didn't really care. The whites could have their half-million-dollar homes and green lawns and dreams of successful companies. Carrillo knew that after tonight, his profits would be secure, and that was all there was to it. What exactly is going to be the timing here? The bomb is scheduled to go off at 7.30 their time. 
I have calculated that it will take approximately 20 minutes for emergency crews to respond. I have also arranged to ensure that in addition to the injuries that will flood the local hospitals, the blast will allow a way of escape for prisoners they might be holding. That will keep the law enforcement and emergency services busy. But what about the border itself? That is the beautiful part about this. Any time that such an act has occurred before, they have closed the border. It is approximately 18 minutes from the main precinct where the bomb will go off to the border. In previous incidents that have occurred, one of the first things to happen is the closing of the border. The trucks will be going through at that time. There are special lanes designated for commercial semis, and when the order comes through to shut the border down, they like to have those lanes clear. So you're counting on the fact that they will move the trucks through quickly? Yes. And if they don't? They will. You see, I've already told you that I had a trump card to play. First of all, I have first-hand information coming from Zapatas. But I also have a man inside the border station between Mexicali and Calexico. He has promised to ensure the transfer goes smoothly. And if it doesn't? I've been planning this for many months. I can assure you that it will work. It has to work, or I'm through. I can no longer afford to hold my assets without regaining control of some larger part of the drug trade between my country and America. And if the drugs don't get through, you don't get your guns, and I have no way of fighting my Chinese competitors. You will be embarrassed, and I will have to go into hiding. Perhaps. But it wouldn't be the Americans you would have to worry about hiding from as much as my own people. What do you mean? My superiors took a chance on you solely at my recommendation. If this does not work and we cannot continue our revolution in Colombia, they will find and dismember both of us, starting with our testicles. You are suggesting they will do something like that to their own? Don't doubt what I'm telling you. The People's Revolutionary Army plays for keeps, Jose. Our cause is our life. The blood of many good men has been spilled in the name of freedom. And one day we will rid Colombia of the democratic scourge that threatens us. We're not just fighting for an ideal, but for our very survival. You can be sure that I understand your struggle, Amado. And you can be equally sure that I understand the repercussions of failure. I hope you understand what's at stake. Do not worry, Amado. After tonight, the face of the entire American border will change forever. And nothing will be able to stop it. Mexicali, Mexico. The executioner reached his destination by sunset and soon found his way down a main thoroughfare in the heart of the city. Mexicali wasn't like the other cities in the Baja, such as Ensenada, Tecate, or Tijuana. Although Mexicali was officially part of Mexico, the obvious influence of American trade and tourism coursed through its neighborhood streets as well as its commercial districts. The area through which Boland was driving was alive with activity. People walked down the streets, boldly crossing in front of slow-moving cars. A group of rowdy college kids coursed past the executioner's slower-moving sedan, and the driver honked at him, a friendly hello, one American to another. The soldier flashed him half a smile, then returned to business. He was driving slowly because he was looking for something in particular, and the rowdy kids almost caused him to miss it. Hito's wasn't the kind of place Bolin imagined when he'd first entered Mexicali. It was a hole in the wall, nothing in comparison to the other places along this part of the street. Olin found a parking spot on a side street and had to backtrack three blocks on foot in order to reach the place. He changed into more casual attire, which consisted of blue jeans and black khaki shirt hanging outside the jeans to conceal the Beretta he'd secured at the small of his back. The government guy he'd snatched at the airport indicated this was where the meetings took place between Carrillo's people and the American contact they had inside the local border patrol office. The only problem was that Bolin had no idea who or what he was looking for. He just knew they were scheduled to meet here at 1830 hours. He had about 20 minutes to spare. Bolin entered the dark, smoky bar and was immediately approached by two guys who looked right at home. They were short, stocky, and stank of beer mixed with cigarettes. The executioner immediately noticed one of them wore a boot knife, and the other had nothing more than a leather vest covering his hairy chest and beer belly. Tattoos adorned the two like craters on a moon, and the one with the boot knife had several teeth missing by a mechanism Bowman didn't even care to guess. Are you looking for trouble, my man? Because we don't want no trouble in here. Bowman hadn't come to brawl with the two bouncers. At least he was assuming they were bouncers, whether officially serving in that capacity or not. The executioner really needed information, and he knew that if he challenged their authority, he would not only draw attention to himself, but it was likely he'd spook whoever was supposed to be meeting. 
He whipped out a 50. No trouble. Just some place to drink. The two men looked at the money and then Toothless smiled, snatched the bill out of Boland's hand, and the two disappeared into the darkness as quickly as they had appeared. Boland made his way to a corner booth where he could see every person who came into the place without being easily noticed himself. Everyone appeared either too tired or too drunk to care much about Boland one way or the other. Si, sí, señor. Cerveza. Tecate, por favor. A waitress showing way more of her goods than necessary, even in a place like that, took his order for a bottled beer and wiggled away. She returned a minute later, accepted the ten he dropped on her tray, and then departed to make change. As she left, a newcomer walked through the door. He was native, dressed nice in comparison to the rest of the crowd, and acting totally relaxed. Bolin had to wonder for a moment if he was the owner, since neither of the brutes that had stopped Bolin even appeared to challenge this man. But rather than disappear into a back room, the guy sat at a corner table and lit a cigar. Almost a half hour went by, and the waitress hadn't returned with Bolin's change. Neither had she offered him another beer. He was nursing this one for all it was worth, but it was about empty, and Bolin was beginning to wonder if he'd been misled. Before he could reconsider his options, though, another man came through the door and joined the first. This one sat with his back to Bolin, and he couldn't tell if the guy was American or not. Five minutes ticked by, and then the man rose, tossed something on the table, and turned to leave. And the executioner recognized Ramon Cepedas. Bolin was out of his chair in moments, crossing the dark expanse and almost in arm's reach when he was intercepted by his two muscle-bound friends from earlier. You are looking for trouble, si, senor? Move! A look of horrified recognition crossed Cepedas' face. De la Alamadre! Bolin sidestepped the attempted grab by Toothless and got his partner between them. If the soldier had learned anything in his time, it was that two men trying to attack one in a confined space was awkward, and generally they got in each other's way. Bolin just decided to help that process along a little bit. Once he had the chubby one between them, Bolin snapped an elbow strike to the guy's throat. His voice box snapped. <laughs> Bolin finished with three hammer blows to the solar plexus, and his would-be assailant dropped to the greasy wood floor. The second man now had hold of his senses, and obviously realized he wasn't dealing with some amateur brawler. He reached down to his boot and pulled the knife. Bolin watched helplessly as Cepedas broke for the exit, and the guy he'd met headed for the rear of the place, probably bound for some rear door Bolin couldn't see. He knew time was a commodity, and there was no point in trying to fight the guy. Bolin withdrew the Beretta from beneath his shirt, aimed between the eyes, and squeezed the trigger. The executioner was moving toward the exit before the corpse hit the ground. He concealed the weapon beneath his shirt before venturing out the front door. He stopped on the sidewalk and looked both ways several times, but Zapatos was nowhere in sight. Bolin knew he couldn't have gone far, but he wasn't about to search for him because something more pressing nagged at him. As Zapatos was leaving the table, he tossed something to the other guy. Some hidden force whispered urgency in the executioner's ear, and he knew that Zapatis wasn't the real threat. It was the native who'd met with him. Olin lurched down the sidewalk, shoving people out of the way and never breaking stride until he reached the end of the block. He immediately spotted his target. The guy was walking casually toward him, acting as if he didn't have a care in the world. Obviously, he overestimated the abilities of the bouncers to stop Bolin. The look of surprise on his face when the soldier stopped him short, locked arms, and concealed the gun beneath them, made it apparent he realized the error of his assumption. Walk straight until I tell you otherwise. The man nodded and smiled as the executioner steered him away from the main street. Clearly the guy understood the gravity of his situation, and Bolin knew he'd made the threat imminent enough. He also knew that if he'd been dealing with some religious fanatic or suicidal terrorist, he would have had a fight on his hands. However, this guy was calm and collected, which meant he had desire to live and wasn't out to kill himself or any crazy ideals. Within minutes, they reached the executioner's car. The sun had now disappeared, and darkness enveloped the immediate area. Nobody could see them from the main street, and that particular area was visibly devoid of observers. Bolin didn't release his hold on the prisoner, choosing instead to jam the pistol into the man's ribs. Start talking and be quick about it. I not know what you want. Do you want money? To take wallet. Take my money. But no kill me, senor. I have children. 
Cut the act and listen to me. I know the man you met is a U.S. Border Patrol officer. And I know he gave you something before he escaped. What was it? I'd not take anything from... Listen carefully. I don't have time to play games. Now you either cough up whatever it was he gave you or I'm going to kill you here and now. You ready to die for a cutthroat like Zapitas? You think he would protect you? He's looking out for his own interests, pal. So why don't you get smart and start looking out for yours? The man flinched as Boland jabbed the gun into his ribs during his little impromptu speech. The executioner waited another moment and was about to put a hole through the guy's stomach when the man finally broke into a sweat. Okay, okay. D just don't get nervous with that heat, man. What were you and Sapitas meeting about? And what did he give you? I guess it doesn't matter if I blow the whistle now. Whoever you are or whatever your business is with Ramon is none of my affair. But if you're trying to stop what's about to go down, you're too late. What are you talking about? Tell me what's planned. Well, right about now, our trucks are arriving at the border checkpoint and will very shortly be in the U.S. And once they get out of Calexico, they'll be home free. What are they carrying? Oh, not much. Just enough processed smack and atom to supply every junkie in L.A. for a year or better. And it's going to make every one of us rich. Don't count on it. Oh, I forgot to mention that part about the diversion. Stop playing games and tell me or you're dead here and now. <laughs> you know the central processing facility for the local roughnecks? In the downtown area. You're talking about the main holding area for arrestees. That's right. What about it? Well, it's fixing to go sky high, my man. Boland looked at his watch. It was 1851 hours. What time? At 7 p.m. sharp. And you won't never make it. Neither will you. A surprised look crossed the man's face just before he collapsed to the pavement. Boland could feel the bile rise in his throat as he considered the horror of his predicament. He had a choice. Let the drugs go through, or let potentially dozens of innocent people die. He didn't have to think twice. The executioner jumped into his car and put it in a wild turn. He headed straight for the main thoroughfare, taking the corner on two wheels and nearly flipping the lightweight sedan in the process. Bolin accelerated, pushing his speed and his luck to their respective limits. He risked another glance at his watch. He had six minutes to avert a catastrophe, and the numbers were ticking off in a way Boland had never experienced before. Why are you calling me here, Sapedas? Because Belasco showed up at our little meeting. You want to try explaining that to me? You assured me you would take care of this, Ponchos. Shut up. You know better than that. How did he find out? How the fuck should I know? All I know is that I made the payment to the guy who planted our little package for tonight's show. Then I turn and Belasco's there in my face, heading right toward me. If it hadn't been for those two bouncers, he probably would have asked me right there. Stop being so dramatic. The guy's not going to kill you in cold blood in front of the public eye. He operates in secret. You tell that to your boys at the Brownsville plant, or maybe Mario Ibanez. Don't take that tone with me. I'm paying you very good money to do what you're told to do, and keep your mouth shut. So show me some respect, or I will make it my life's pursuit to track you down and cut up your family jewels personally. Do you hear me, Ramon? I hear you. But now what do we do? We do exactly as planned. There are only a few minutes remaining before showtime. You do your part, and make sure you get to the checkpoint on time, and then you get your ass on a plane. I want you in El Paso by tomorrow morning. I don't want any follow-ups this time like in Brownsville and Vegas. I'll handle it. See that you do, puto. Asshole. Ramon Cepedas was Hispanic, sure. But he didn't buy into all of Carrillo's bullshit. The guy thought himself to be some sort of great spokesman for the Spanish people. Whatever. If the guy wanted to consider himself a revolutionary, Sapedas wasn't going to argue the point with him. The truth of the matter was that he dealt with Carrillo's kind on so many occasions, it no longer impressed him. As a matter of fact, he didn't give a shit one way or the other. The guy was nothing special, just another mindless hothead with a loud mouth, loud clothes, and so much cash he didn't have the good sense to know what to do with it. But that was okay, because as long as Carrillo kept that cash flowing, Sapedas would act the stoolie. He sort of liked his role as the poor American trying to survive on a cop's salary, and oh, wasn't it so good of the high and mighty Jose Panchos Carrillo to elevate Sapedas and free his poor, oppressed Mexican brothers and sisters. What a load of crap. Here and now was the important thing. Sapedas lived in the present, lived life to the fullest. He enjoyed his fancy cars. 
He enjoyed wearing nice clothes, like the silk shirt and $200 slacks he had on now. And he loved to spoil his wife with diamond rings and pearl necklaces. His kids attended the best private schools in El Paso. In a couple more years, his youngest son would be headed for a military academy. And then he and Carmen could retire to Bermuda, and they could fly the kids home in the summer and around the holidays. Yes, life would be real good then, and he would no longer have to do Carillo's bidding. Zapatos looked at his watch and smiled. Two minutes. That was all the time Mac Bolin had when he walked through the front door of the Mexicali police station and drew the Beretta. He pointed it at the ceiling, fired a warning shot, and immediately gained the attention of everybody in the room. There's a bomb in the building! Get out now! Everyone! Prisoners too! Move! Move! People responded with surprising swiftness, and they actually fled out in an orderly fashion. Granted, they were running their asses off, but they were moving out efficiently. He managed to get all of them across the street in time to escape the first blast. The explosion rocked the ground beneath them, and the thunderous report from its effects rolled down the street. It wasn't so large that it posed a disastrous effect outside. But had the building been occupied, there would have been many deaths and many more injuries, not to mention the number of potential criminals that would have been loosed on Mexicali and areas all along and perhaps on the other side of the border. Bolin used the commotion to escape the crowd and got around the block to where he'd left his car on the off chance he'd get away alive. The gamble had paid off because he was certain that nobody really thought to stop and get a good description of him in the aftermath. The executioner now concentrated on the task ahead. The guy from Hito's had mentioned that there were trucks headed through the border checkpoint. Bolin now understood Carrillo's plans, and he had to admit the guy was damn sharp. He had to give credit where it was due. Jose Carrillo had planned the perfect diversion. Sure, it all made perfect sense now. Turn over a few assets and let your conscience be your guide that there were acceptable losses for the greater good. The whole time, while the Kong Lok was trying to squeeze him out and Bolin was trying to shut him down, Carrillo was planning the smuggling operation that would secure his position as a man in complete control of all drug trafficking. Once word got around that it was Carrillo who had masterminded the diversion in Mexicali and bribed every high-ranking Border Patrol officer from Calexico to Brownsville, he'd be immortalized as monarch of the U.S.-Mexican border. Olin knew, probably just like Carrillo and Cepedas and all their allies, that the minute word of an emergency got out, the Border Patrol would close down the border station. Those big semis couldn't block the lanes in order to affect security, so they'd push them through in a hurry. After all, hundreds of trucks passed through that point every day, and the explosion didn't take place anywhere near the trucks, so who could possibly think there was any link between the two? So they would move the trucks through quickly, and then close up the port, and nobody would go anywhere. In the meantime, each truck carried a ton or more of drugs into the U.S., free to make deliveries to every major dope runner in the country. Profits would skyrocket, demand would be met, and Carrillo would become the ultimate in a drug distribution empire of monumental proportions. And every penny would go back into his pocket, so he could find more sick and twisted ways to smuggle his death-dealing junk across the border. Well, the executioner wasn't about to let that happen. One way or another, he was going to shut down Carrillo's operation, and he had some idea of what to watch for. He knew that Carrillo could no longer move the stuff down the highways and up into L.A. So the next best step was to get it into the hands of somebody who was connected on the other side. Bolin was certain he knew where that trail led. Based on the intelligence he'd gathered so far, Ramon Zapatas remained the one constant in an equation growing more complicated by the moment. It was more than likely the Border Patrol chief was either appointed to oversee the safe delivery of the shipments to their destinations, or they were planning to rally the trucks somewhere, and then they could do smaller distributions from there. The latter plan seemed to be the safest and most reliable, and it was a tactic commonly deployed by drug runners to prevent discovery of drugs at way stations or random state police checkpoints. Bolin was betting that rally point would be El Paso. It left the smallest margin of error, and with attention now focused on the activities in Mexicali, it was the last place anyone would think to look for major quantities of drugs. But one person came to mind, 
a dark-haired, dark-eyed firebrand who had believed from the beginning that El Paso would become a major point of focus in the whole sordid mess. And Rayero had been right. It all made sense now. Of course, Boland still hadn't figured the meeting of the politicians in West Palm Beach, but he was certain that the presence in country of Zim Mai and Zeng Chik Wan were sure signs that trouble had only begun. The executioner was feeling exhausted. He made a mental note that as soon as he was safely across the border, he'd have to catch a few hours rest before continuing to El Paso. He also needed to touch base with Stony Man and let them know of his suspicions about El Paso. And whatever Lao Ming Shui and the rest of the Kung Lok had planned, it was bigger than blowing up a couple dozen innocent civilians in order to move tons of drug product across the U.S.-Mexican border. They were hell-bent on eradicating the Carrillo drug cartel and manipulating the Colombian arms shipments in a tailor-made plan to further their foothold in the United States. But they were seemingly ignorant of the fact that the executioner had entered the fray. And he was hell-bent on eradicating the Kung Lok in a game where there could only be one winner. It was a game the executioner had played time and again, and he'd gotten damn good at it. Security would be tight at the border. People rarely brought weapons into Mexico, and an American headed into Mexicali wasn't considered nearly as suspicious by the Border Patrol as one headed the other way, especially at this time of night, when work traffic had pretty much died down. Many people traveled between Calexico and Mexicali, Americans living in the Baja while working in the U.S. and vice versa. It was another world, and since Baja California was ostensibly as much U.S. as Mexican territory, things were a bit more lax. So Mac Bolin was only less than five miles from the Border Patrol checkpoint, considering a plan to get through with his weapons, when the road ahead suddenly erupted in flames. Shit! Chunks of concrete rained onto the sedan, pebbling the windshield and denting the hood. Bolin jerked the wheel to his right, avoiding the gaping pothole left by the blast. With the windows down, he caught the familiar smell of plastique and high explosive. Someone had planted a cratering charge in the road. The executioner tried to weave his way around another obstacle, only to run into a third. Someone had covered all the bases, and the executioner was betting he knew who the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. This was one of the encounters Boland would have preferred on his terms, but sometimes a soldier didn't get to call the shots. Still, he'd planned for this eventuality all the same, and he was ready to answer their challenge to battle. The soldier grabbed two smokers from the bag next to him and lobbed them out the window to provide cover. He then snatched the bag as he popped the trunk and went EDA. Retrieving the M16 A2 M203 from under the spare tire, he headed for the hole his attackers had just blown in the road. Bullen reached the crater and jumped into it. It was the only decent cover on the street, and through the smoke and haze he couldn't see a better opportunity. It would also provide a clear field of fire. Bolin focused on the priority, realizing he had to take out the deafening machine gun the enemy was using to blanket the area with 50 caliber shells. The heavy rounds hadn't found their mark, but they were doing a good job of kicking up dust and debris. The smoke cleared just enough for him to see the muzzle flash. The gunners were on the second floor of a burned-out building, and Bolin already had the M203 loaded for action. The executioner adjusted the special range sight on the grenade launcher, aimed just above the muzzle flash, and squeezed the trigger. Bits of mesh wire, concrete, and rebar fell to the ground, but there was very little left of the two bodies that had occupied the emplacement. Bolin knew as the air began to clear, the enemy would either use snipers to pick him up, or simply flood his position with auto fire. He climbed from the crater and headed for the area he'd just destroyed. There was still enough of the first floor of the building remaining to provide adequate cover. Bolin needed time to regroup, reload, and get an estimate on his odds. The auto fire he'd been expecting came immediately, eating a hot trail behind him as he sprinted to shelter. He dived through an open window, shredding his shirt front on some glass shards still lodged in the frame. The fragments missed his flesh by centimeters. As he landed on the floor inside, Bolin could feel the stitches tear again. He reached into his bag, loaded another grenade, then converted it to a satchel and tied it around his waist. His black suit was inside, along with one remaining smoker and plenty of magazines. He'd left most of the 40 millimeter grenades stashed at a hotel room in Calexico, but still had enough to mount a decent defense. 
Olin moved to the edge of the window frame and risked a glance onto the street. He marked three soldiers, barely visible in the light of a full moon, on the roof of a hotel directly across from his position. Another pair was positioned at the corner of a deserted bar. The street was otherwise devoid of people or activity. From what was visible in the darkness, it looked as if this particular block was composed of a mixture of local businesses and a few apartment buildings. Bolin surmised this part of town had been condemned long ago, abandoned as the result of destitution or social depredation. Some of the structures were unkempt or neglected, while others were broken down altogether. If it had been occupied by human civilization, those occupants were long gone. And with the police and emergency services focused on the bombed processing center, it was the perfect place for an ambush. In any case, the executioner knew he'd be run to ground unless he started taking the offensive. He changed positions, edging carefully to a neighboring window, and carefully sighted on the area of the roof where he'd spotted the trio of FARC troops. An orange ball of flame took out the parapet of the building, and Bolin spotted the shadow of a body as it fell from the hole. He retreated to the rear of the building and found a doorway leading onto a gravel path overgrown with weeds. He kept his back to the adobe wall as he moved along the building perimeter. He reached the corner a minute later and peered around it, spotting the other pair of bark soldiers. They had emerged from cover and were headed in his direction, but they obviously didn't see him. He also noted that two more took their place. Bolin guessed that there were additional troops, and they probably had the idea he was trapped, which wasn't far from the truth. The executioner knew that a frontal assault wouldn't be possible, so a flanking maneuver was his best option. He turned and moved back along the edge of the building, passing the doorway, and continuing until he reached the other corner. The street appeared to be clear. He made a quick study of his surroundings. A large statue of a Mexican bandit on a horse stood next to the building on this side. Bolin advanced on it, sprinting the length of the building and coming to a crouch behind its base. He spotted four pairs of soldiers moving on his last known position, and they were armed to the teeth. They wore jungle camouflage fatigues and military equipment suspenders. Grenades dangled from their harnesses, and they were toting AK-74s. The executioner grimaced. He'd been up against greater odds, but reminded himself that these were combat-hardened FARC soldiers, and not just terrorists. Bolin raised the M16 A2 M203 pressed the stock to his cheek and sighted on the closest pair. Bolin broke cover and beelined across the street. The other soldiers were moving for cover, and he triggered another salvo to keep their heads down until he could make his goal. He reached a low adobe porch wall of a single-story house and vaulted over it. AK-74 fire resounded a moment later, a hail of 5.45mm slugs peppering the wall. The ricochets couldn't be heard over the cacophony of gunfire, and Bolin's ears rang as the remaining quartet of Park soldiers flooded his position with steel-jacketed bullets. There was a lull, and Bolin took a moment to load another 40mm HE shell, and then yanked the pin from the last smoker and tossed the grenade over the wall. He counted off ten seconds as the firestorm started again, then got to the door of the house without compromising his cover. The smoke might have disguised his movements, but it wasn't bulletproof. The door opened freely, albeit on rusted hinges, and the soldier crawled through the opening. The interior of the house was as black as night. He knew he had about a minute to find an exit before the FARC troops advanced on his position. He kept low, moving slowly as his eyes adjusted to the gloom. He quickly located a half-open door and eased through it noiselessly. The rear of the house opened onto a dusty backyard, overgrown with bushes and sagebrush. Bolin moved to the corner perimeter and spied a wooden ladder mounted against the neighboring building. The ladder had probably served as a makeshift fire escape. He crossed the alleyway from the yard and tested the ladder with his weight. Satisfied it would support him, the soldier slung his M16 A2M203 and quickly scaled the rickety structure. He reached the top of the building and charged to the front of the roof. He drew near the gaping hole created earlier by the 40mm grenade he'd used to take out the enemy troops, and it was still smoking from the heat of the HE shell. Bolin knelt and peered over the parapet. The four FARC troops, now joined by an additional dozen, leapfrogged toward the porch he'd been using as cover. The executioner aimed his M203 and waited. When about a half dozen reached the outside of the porch wall, he triggered a shell into their midst. The entire porch erupted with the explosion and the overhang collapsed. 
The soldiers were decimated by the blast. Dust and smoke rose in the aftermath of the fireball produced by the PETN-filled grenade. The remaining troops scattered for cover, and Bolin realized he now had the advantage he needed. He adjusted his selector switch to full auto and began to rain 5.56 millimeter bursts on them. The troops were unable to find cover, and one after another began to fall under the executioner's assault. Bolin conserved his firepower by switching to single shot, aiming carefully with the sniper precision that had earned him his name and reputation. Only two managed to find cover and escape Bolin's fire. The executioner broke position and headed for the rear of the building. He looked over the edge and spotted a shed attached to it about five feet below. Bolin knew the jump might be risky in the dark, particularly since he had no idea if the roof would hold him. But now wasn't the time to be choosy. <laughs> Another leap, and he was on the ground. Bolin moved along the back of the hotel until he reached an adjoining building, then crouched in the darkness and waited. The place seemed like a ghost town now, and he didn't hear any further activity. The road ahead was blocked, but the executioner was counting on eventual escape. He knew that his only options at this stage would be making the border on foot. It was only a couple of clicks to the border, give or take, and he knew of some areas where he could get through. But then he would have to get into Calexico find transportation, and then try to locate the trucks that were probably crossing through the border patrol checkpoint at that very moment. Still, he felt strange about just leaving the FARC troops to wreak havoc on unwary civilians, or leaving this situation where it was at. And he especially didn't want to risk having them pick up his trail and trip him up later when he had his hands full with the Triad or Carrillo's people. Unfortunately, he'd eliminated somewhere near 40 of the Colombian guerrillas. And while he had no viable intelligence on the actual numbers, he knew that his battle plan called for a tactical retreat. He was probably still outnumbered and outgunned, and he saw no point in aggravating the situation when a more serious one took place on the border right at that moment. There would be other opportunities to deal with the FARC, better opportunities. For now, he needed to get to the border and stop the drug shipments before they got through. Stony Man Farm, Virginia. Price dropped her handheld electronic organizer on the war room table as she shrugged out of her pantsuit jacket and draped it over the back of a chair. We've got trouble with a capital T, guys, and it's related to Uncle Sam. Rognola shoved aside the intelligence briefs he and Kurtzman had been assessing. What's going on? Price sat and crossed her legs. About six months ago, a meeting was held between several known members of the Scarlet Dragons and an undercover DEA agent in Miami. The deal was for guns, which the Dragons agreed to supply. In exchange for what, cash? No, drugs. They wanted a piece of Carrillo's drug action in Miami. The problem is Carrillo has no drug connections there, at least none worth speaking of, so they still went ahead and agreed to supply the guns, but they asked for some new incentive. Let me guess. This is where these people within the government come into it. Yes, unfortunately. Apparently, the dragon the DEA agent dealt with knew all along he worked for the DEA. When the offer came about like it did, the DEA was naturally suspicious, but they decided to go ahead and recruited some agents from the BATF to help them. They got blown. Both agents from the BATF and the DEA officer who had initially made contact were killed in a bombing of the building where the meet was supposed to happen. Any suspects? Well, my contacts at the NSA and FBI both have their suspicions. Naturally, the DEA and BATF aren't working together on it. Each is conducting a separate investigation in a sort of hostile peace, and there's more concern at this stage about assigning blame than actually finding out the real source behind it. Nobody wants to admit that maybe they blew it. Well, that's teamwork for you, the way these federal agencies look out for one another. My God, Hal, you'd have thought they'd have learned something by now, considering the change in American policy on terrorism and federal crimes in the past few years. I understand the frustration, but that's just the way it is. Sometimes it seems there's no tragedy large enough to overcome the bureaucracy and politics that seem to override good common sense. That aside, we still have this other problem. Go ahead, Barb. We're all ears. What anybody fails to see about this whole thing is the other side of the coin. Price pulled a black-and-white still from a folder she'd brought 
and placed it in front of Brognola. That picture was taken several months ago by INS agents. The man in the picture is Ying Kao Chu, who is a known illegal Chinese alien and overall head of the Scarlet Dragon gangs all through the country. There are some splinter factions and wannabe outfits, but for the most part, the group has an extensive network, as we already know, that answers to this man. He works for Shui, right? Exactly right. Very good, Hal. I get one right every now and then. We can't all have that steel trap mind like the bear here. So what does any of this have to do with the meeting in West Palm Beach? It has everything to do with it. Kao Chu's last known location was in Miami, but he hasn't been seen operating in the area for at least a month. There are some reports he was spotted in Toronto a couple of weeks ago, but that's unconfirmed. Where it gets interesting is that every single one of these agencies has a major stake in capturing Jose Carrillo, and the same kind of stake in capturing the Kung Lok Triad leaders. And when they hold an open meeting in our own backyard, nobody moves a muscle. Right. And I think that's because we have a traitor within the government who's pulling the strings on both ends. You know something, Hal? I think she's on to something. I remember a recent set of financial reports on known Kung Lok bank accounts. Dim Mai, Yi Chang Shun, Lao Shui, and some Hong Kong politicians have all made recent withdrawals, and the cash just disappeared. We don't have any record of payments being made or checks being cut. No transfers to other accounts. Just simple withdrawals, and that's it. Money's gone and nobody sees it again. You think they're paying somebody inside the government to help them out, Barbara? That's exactly what I think. And what is really amazing is that nobody seems to know who this mysterious person might be or what affiliations he or she might have within the U.S. government. Well, let's try first ruling out who we know couldn't possibly be involved. Nobody high profile. Agreed. Too risky for both sides. That rules out cabinet officers, representatives, senators, the president, and heads of federal intelligence agencies. It's interesting that this all occurred within federal agencies at a local level, though. I'm not sure I follow, Bear. What are you getting at? Well... It just seems that a blatant and open move by agents within the Miami area would be too heavily scrutinized. Somebody would figure something was up, and they'd catch their proverbial rat. However, that doesn't mean we couldn't be dealing with someone who works with all of these agencies. I see what you're saying. In every instance since Stryker first hit the drug shipment in Brownsville and stumbled onto the Kung Lok's plan, there have not been less than two federal agencies involved with closely related cases at one point or another. The DEA and BATF at the Brownsville hit, the FBI and Border Patrol in El Paso, the FBI and DEA in Las Vegas, FBI and NSA in West Palm Beach, and DEA and CIA in Ciudad Juarez. Rognola nodded now that he was beginning to understand. Somebody has to have access to all of this information. There must be some way to link all of these agencies back to a single person or agency. And we've already ruled out a member of Congress or the presidential cabinet. What about judicial branch? Doubtful. Justices and court officials don't have much of a clue about what happens outside the world of the courtroom. And there's also no viable motive I can think of when considering any of those currently on the bench. What if we factor out geographical locations not in border areas? Bear? Kurtzman turned to his computer and began typing faster than they could keep up with the words and search volumes pressing across the screen. He finished making his entries and then pushed a button. The built-in projection system suddenly lit up a screen with the map of the United States. Even as it focused and sharpened into view, red circles peppering every state were slowly fading. Eventually, the dissipation stopped, leaving only a few along the Canadian border, a few more along the eastern and western seaboards, and the highest concentration in Florida and the Southwest. Okay, let's eliminate any along either Pacific or Atlantic shores, since it's highly unlikely an official involved in this would be able to effectively run the operations in this particular arena from a coastal station. Kurtzman complied, and that left just those in Miami and the Southwest. Now let's filter out all those that are not multi-jurisdictional. The computer expert put in the information and a considerable more disappeared the majority in the southwest. It didn't look as formidable as it had a few minutes earlier, and it seemed the entire mood in the room began to brighten. Price began to feel there was hope. It really seemed that they were onto something, but there was still a lot of work ahead. 
Kurtzman punched up a printer on Stony Man's secured network and sent the information to begin compiling the source documents he knew would be necessary to launch their investigation. No question about it. We've got our work cut out for us. Maybe. And maybe we'll get a feel for many more of them right away and be able to chop that list further until we have a few solid leads. There's still going to be a considerable amount of work, Hal. I'm not trying to sound pessimistic. I'm just trying to be realistic. This is going to take a while. Especially since you probably don't want to involve anyone else in it at this stage of the game. Well, that's because if we bring in an armload of investigators and start combing through files, records, email, and telephone logs, we're more than likely to spook our spook. You mean our traitor. Right. What's eating at you, Hal? I'm upset that the President is forcing us to sit here on our hands while Stryker is out risking everything. Hey, listen, Hal. The big guy knew what he was getting into from the beginning. We've never bemoaned the fact that on some occasions the powers that be tie our hands. Bear's right, Hal. We actually have a considerable amount of latitude. Rognola waved a dismissive hand. I know. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that sometimes, when it really counts, we can't just go all out and show our hand in a way these bastards will remember. I hear where you're coming from, Chief, but I think you're forgetting something. And that is, if Stryker's on to them, they won't soon forget it. Amen. Calexico, California. Conrado Diaz knew that he had arrived too late to stop Belasco from ruining the boss's plans. He'd first missed his opportunity in Las Vegas, then Los Angeles, and now he was hearing that someone had evacuated the processing facility in Mexicali just in time. Diaz was betting it was Belasco. But it didn't matter, because as fate would have it, he realized he could just hang out near Cepedas and wait for the guy to show himself. And Diaz knew he would eventually show himself, because the dude was a pain in the ass and never gave up. In some respects, Diaz had to admire him. Lesser men would have thrown up their hands in defeat by now, but this guy just kept returning like the common cold virus. Diaz also realized he was going to have to extend special caution. He'd investigated Belasco's previous movements, gathered intelligence on his methods and resources. The guy got around, and he was dangerous. Diaz hadn't survived this long because he considered himself better than everyone else. He'd survived because he considered himself inferior to everybody else. And by thoroughly studying his enemy and taking necessary precautions, Diaz had produced a 100% success rate and lived to tell the tale. Diaz knew that in some respects he was considered a ruthless killer by his peers. Perhaps that was true in some cases, because Diaz believed if he was going to kill a man, he had to have some personal stake in it. Wasting a bunch of kids with a machine gun or charging into a school with a bomb strapped to your ass was neither an honorable nor a smart way to die. It was stupid, and he would leave that kind of dramatic showiness to the crazies and fanatics of the world. No, Conrado Diaz just liked to be methodical. He liked to take his own sweet time and study his enemy, so when it came time to do the actual deed, he'd left no margin for error. That was how he chose to do things, and that was how he stayed alive. So he wasn't at all worried or feeling hurried when he found Ramon Zapatas looking over the trucks that had rallied at a truck stop on the edge of Calexico. Diaz climbed from his rented sports car and crushed a cigarette beneath his heel. He strolled over to Sapedas and shook hands with him. Diaz tried to act amicable toward the guy, but the truth was, he really didn't like the Border Patrol chief at all. He'd argued with Carrillo more than once about keeping an idiot like Sapedas around. He was just a waste of good cash, in Diaz's opinion. So, what do you know, Khan? And that was another damn thing he didn't like. The fact that Cepedas had taken the liberty of giving him a nickname, as if they were old friends or something. He'd even told the guy on a couple of occasions to either call him Conrado or Diaz, but not Khan. So in addition to being stupid, Cepedas was also ignorant and had a hearing problem. Are all the drugs accounted for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The shit's all here. Well, except for that one truck that I'm still waiting on. Alarm bells immediately went off in Diaz's head. He couldn't believe it. Carrillo had trusted the guy to do something as simple as get the trucks across, and he couldn't even manage to get them all in one place. It had been at least three hours since the bomb went off in Mexicali, and now he decided to unload this little bit of news on Diaz. Carrillo's right-hand man wasn't happy at all about that. When were you planning to tell me about that? I didn't figure it was any big deal. 
I talked to my guy at the border station just a few minutes ago, and he said the truck cleared easily. It'll be here. Dumb shit driver you hired probably just got lost. I'm sure he'll get here quickly enough, although I don't know how we can trust the entire load is intact. What do you mean? Well, all you need is one of our drivers here to figure out he could make some considerable cash on his own. The next thing you know, you got a whole crap load of product missing. I don't think you're aware that I personally selected and vouched for each of these men. They are loyal to me and Mr. Carrillo, so it is neither your worry nor concern. Zapatos tapped Diaz's chest with the clipboard he was holding. Oh, it's my concern when I'm the one who has to unload this stuff. It's my ass if it doesn't get where it's supposed to go. Yes, it is, and you've been well compensated for your efforts. Now it's time to start earning the money Mr. Carrillo has paid you. There was a long and uncomfortable silence between the two men as they stood there in the shadows of the parking lot and stared daggers at each other. Diaz wasn't the least bit concerned because he knew he could easily take the older man, and Zapatos knew it as well. Diaz was younger, faster, and not softened by years of family life, expensive dinners, and holidays spent lying around the house. Diaz doubted that Zapatos even mowed his own lawn anymore. The Border Patrol chief suddenly broke into a grin. Listen to us, fighting with each other. We should be working together. We're on the same team, remember? Let's not quibble over stupid shit. I'll make sure the truck gets to El Paso so your team can get them out, okay? Diaz nodded and then went to personally inspect the trucks. He wanted to make sure the trip to El Paso came off without a hitch. Each rig was marked differently, actually bearing false markings of several major commercial companies. Small enough that they wouldn't draw too much attention, but obvious enough that they would be a normal sight on the highways, day or night. The logbooks were doctored, but in good order. Arrangements had been made to switch drivers every five hours, and the upcoming drivers would have their own logbook to mark their departure time. They were also instructed to make sure that plenty of witnesses saw them, so that any arrival or departure time could be verified easily enough in the event of encounters with the police. The idea was to get the drugs to El Paso without incident. Any contact with law enforcement was to be avoided at all costs, but if detained, the drivers were not to resist. If the drugs were discovered, they had the instructions to cooperate to the fullest and give the cover stories supplied by Carrillo's men. Ultimately, however, if trouble got out of hand, they were to respond with deadly force as necessary and escape. And every one of the soldiers, both those waiting at the truck stop assigned to protect the shipments and the driving teams, had orders to shoot Belasco on sight. There was no way in hell they were going to let him screw up their plans. Diaz was hoping that he'd have an opportunity to kill Velasco himself, but his ultimate job was to protect the shipment. The second priority was to find Velasco and kill him. The only thing that made those tasks less difficult was that wherever the drugs were headed, Velasco was sure to follow, and Diaz was pretty sure the guy wouldn't make a move until he knew there was no risk to civilians. That was something Diaz had noticed almost immediately about Velasco. He actually cared about innocent bystanders. He'd proved that point when making the choice to evacuate the processing center in Mexicali over stopping the drugs from crossing the border. After Carrillo's chief enforcer had finished inspecting the trucks, he returned to Cepadas. Everything looks good except for the missing truck. Well, fine. I'll make sure we get out of Calexico and then head for the airport in San Diego. Ponchos wanted me to make sure I was in El Paso by tomorrow morning so I can start rallying our mules. Diaz didn't trust Zapatas, but he nodded. He would put aside his differences for the sake of his boss, but when this was over, he was going to ask permission to kill the little weasel, and he doubted there would be any trouble doing that job personally. The executioner sat parked in the lot of a hotel, directly across the street from where Carrillo's people had rallied their semi-trucks filled with drugs. All but the one the executioner had managed to acquire just after it pulled away from the border patrol station. The soldier had managed to escape Mexicali and slip across the rugged terrain undetected, probably because he'd done it so close to the station. It had then just been a matter of climbing into the sleeper part of the cab until the truck cleared customs, and then he took the driver by surprise. Poland could still hardly believe that they had allowed these trucks to go by so easily, but he could understand the reasoning. Apathy ran high in organizations like the U.S. Border Patrol, unfortunately, 
Even with heightened awareness about national security and the susceptibility of the American public to terrorist attacks, Bolin realized the reality of the situation. American border agents were some of the best in the world, but they were overworked, underpaid, and sorely unappreciated. It was the kind of job that could leave the right type of person with a sense of honor, and the wrong type with either putrid prejudices or a very slanted view of professional objectivity. He studied the situation through binoculars, watching the movements and estimating troop strength. There were a total of six trucks, each carrying a load of one type of merchandise or another. Most of the tractor trailers were marked with licenses from various states, which Bolin knew were probably forged, and the trailers themselves had separate markings. The entire operation looked legitimate, and Carrillo had obviously made a painstaking effort to negate any possible relationship between the trucks. Even if one or two were intercepted, that would still mean high profits and a considerable amount of drugs. But that was if the guy from the bar had told Bolin the truth. The executioner had no reason to believe otherwise, and no evidence to contradict anything the guy had said. Bolin had executed him because of his involvement in attempting to kill dozens of innocents. The guy had been paid to plant that bomb, of that Bolin was sure. The soldier considered making his move, but he was concerned about the size of his targets and the threat to bystanders. An attack in a truck stop as busy as that one had too much potential for accidental death of the unwary patrons. He spotted a couple of minivans crammed with a family and one sedan carrying a young man and a very pregnant woman. A second option might be to take them individually once they got on the road, but again there was the risk of high-speed collisions or accidents. There was also the off chance of bringing the law down on him and Bolin couldn't imagine any reason worth that kind of risk. Especially when he considered his near run-ins with the cops so far on this mission. So that left only one option. He'd have to get inside and take them down once an opportunity presented itself. He couldn't wait until they had reached their destination. The risk they might split up was still too high. The stuff was already processed and packaged for distribution, and that meant they could take off on divergent courses. The executioner was good, but even he couldn't be everywhere at once. Nonetheless, something in his gut told him Carrillo was much smarter than that. The Mexican drug lord wouldn't risk breaking apart his team quite so soon, especially with the Kong Lok triad looking to cut into his profits. Carrillo knew, as Bolin did, that there was safety in numbers, and he hadn't generated such an elaborate plan just to watch it go down the tubes because he was impatient. No, it made sense to set up a staging area where they could break the deliveries into smaller, more manageable sizes. That would cut down on losses if the triad decided to hit the shipments, and it would certainly decrease the attention. After all, it was only a matter of time before word got out about the operation and then the police would be looking for the semis with a fury. But Bolin knew that by then it would be too late. So it again came back to move now or lose a possible opportunity to take them. The following day wouldn't be good enough. It had to be now. And the executioner suddenly formulated a plan that just might work. He started the engine of the truck and turned so that he entered the road from the direction the truck would have come off the highway. He put it in second and began to give it more gas and then less gas. He was doing little short of giving himself whiplash, but that was the least of his problems. The important thing here was to make a lasting impression, and he was going to do that without any doubt. Diaz and Zapatas turned as they heard the whining, roaring, and banging of a semi-truck. They saw it was their rig, and it appeared the driver was either asleep or drunk. What the hell is he doing? You see? I told you he'd show up. Well, it took him long enough. Diaz squinted, trying to see what was causing all of the problems. From that point, it looked as if the truck was having serious mechanical problems. The cab was visibly jolting, as if the engine couldn't get enough gas. All of the trucks were diesels, topped off before their departure for the border, so it couldn't be low fuel. Diaz had spent much of his earlier life as a mechanic, so he knew it was too hot for the fuel to have gelled. Contamination was unlikely, since all the rest of the trucks had made it without a problem. Well, if necessary, they could probably offload the drugs onto another truck or split the shipments. Once they had the stuff, they didn't care about all the furniture and other stuff on board. They could leave the semi park right in the lot, and nobody would probably notice the truck parked there day after day for at least a week or better. One of the reasons they had chosen this particular truck stop 
was that it was one of the busiest. That allowed them to be inconspicuous, parked next to 80 other semi-trucks at any one given time. By the time anyone noticed the truck was abandoned, the intended targets would be tying up their arms, legs, and other body parts and injecting Carrillo gold into their veins. The truck was within 100 yards when it suddenly stopped chugging and jerking and abruptly the engine roared into full power. The truck lurched forward and began to gain speed, heading directly toward Diaz, Zapatas, and the other semi-trucks. Jesus fucking Christ! Everyone get your weapons and get clear! Now, goddammit! They reached into the truck cabs and grabbed for weapons, assault rifles, pistols, whatever they could lay their hands on, as the truck plowed a murderous path directly for them. Diaz watched as a dark-haired man, dressed head to toe in black, leaped from the truck at the last minute. The semi plowed into the rear of one of their trucks and the whole trailer shifted. The force of the impact slammed the truck into another one, effectively neutralizing the two vehicles initially involved in the impact and possibly making the third unworthy of the road. Diaz could feel the fury as he watched all of Jose's plans go down the tubes. He was the second in command of the Carrillo Drug Empire, next to the Carrillo Nevas Alliance, and now he was watching it all go to hell. Diaz turned from the destruction and watched the driver moving for a cover position. The guy was big, toting an assault rifle with a grenade launcher and wearing combat rigging that bristled with all kinds of weapons of war. Based on the description he had, and something else Diaz couldn't identify, the drug enforcer was certain he was looking at none other than Velasco. Bystanders were doing everything they could to evacuate the area quickly, as the FARC escorts and Diaz's drivers took up positions to defend themselves. Diaz realized he was going to quickly be enveloped in the firefight if he didn't find some cover of his own. He yanked his pistol from beneath his jacket and looked to find some sort of protection. He'd barely reached the dual tires of one of the trailers when the first shots rang through the night. The bullets missed their intended target, and Velasco returned fire immediately. He started with a heavy hitter, popping from cover long enough to launch a grenade. The enforcer's ears rang immediately with the tremendous blast, and he turned his head to avoid completely losing his night vision. Not that it wasn't going to be much brighter and much hotter. Several of the FARC soldiers tried to advance on Velasco, figuring he was probably reloading a grenade. The guy did the exact opposite of what Diaz would have expected himself, and he broke cover and took the FARC troops head on. Diaz watched with a mixture of fascination and horror as Velasco took down the other pair in similar fashion. The enforcer couldn't understand what sense there was in all of it. These guys were supposedly trained soldiers, but they didn't wear any body armor or helmets. The Bark soldier's partner suffered a worse fate, the rounds drilling holes through his body from crotch to sternum. Diaz jumped from the fire for a moment, lined the sights of his pistol on Belasco, and steadied his breath. The lashing of superheated gases and explosive force threw off his shot and slammed him to the ground. Velasco had obviously launched another grenade, this one in the enforcer's direction, or at least a lot closer than the first. Diaz suddenly realized they had made a fatal error. They were trying to use the semi-trucks for cover. What they needed to do was move away from them. Otherwise, Velasco could destroy both his men and the trucks in a linear assault. I want these soldiers away from the trucks, now! The only one to stay with the trucks are his drivers! Soldiers away from the trucks! We've got to blow this guy out! The soldier turned to comply and Diaz decided to break for open ground. There was a large field behind the semi-lot and he weaved his way through the trucks as the sounds of battle started to fade behind him. He hoped his message got through. If it didn't, he would just have to hope that everyone was either dead or had disappeared before police arrived. This Velasco was hard. He was obviously well trained and moreover, he was damned experienced. In all his work as an enforcer, Diaz had never seen anyone quite that good. The guy didn't fight like a normal enemy. He didn't cower and hide and pop off an occasional shot if he got the opportunity. He was able to kill from up close using grenades as effectively as he'd snipe two of Diaz's best friends when they were making the delivery in Brownsville. The truth was that Velasco killed just like Diaz did. He did it quickly, professionally, and without remorse. 
Velasco was obviously not afraid to fight up close no matter what the cost. The rumors that Diaz had thought were just that had turned out to be true. They weren't bad dreams or figments of superstitious imagination. This guy was just what Diaz had been told he was. He was dangerous, and he was as formidable an opponent as the Mexican enforcer had ever known. Diaz didn't want to run like a coward, and he wasn't a coward. But he realized that there was a time and place, and this wasn't it. He was going to have to pick his battle with Belasco on his own terms. He couldn't afford to get Jose's whole shipment blown to hell. He needed to find a way to protect the product at all costs. There was only one way to do that, as he saw it, and that was to retreat from the maelstrom going on behind him. Diaz managed to get around the semi-trucks and back to his car, which was parked out of Belasco's view. He climbed behind the wheel and was about to pull out when someone opened the door. Get us out of here! Diaz wanted to shoot the coward right in the face, but he knew that wouldn't go over well with Jose, and he didn't have time to argue with the guy. Zapatas, wanting to split and fight the battle another day, just meant he was probably a little brighter than Diaz had given him credit for. But he still didn't trust the man. And he knew Zapatas was probably running not because it was the tactical thing to do, but because he was just a cowardly bastard. Was that Velasco? Yeah, fuck yeah, that was him. That bastard is something else. He's one scary son of a bitch. You hear what I'm saying, Colin? Yeah, I hear what you're saying. And before this night is over, I'm going to make sure he's one dead son of a bitch. I swear it. El Paso, Texas. The noonday sun beat mercilessly upon every unprotected surface of El Paso and rendered unforgivable heat. Settlers throughout the 1800s had said that if the Old West was God's country, then Texas was his desert. While not as unforgiving as its Sonora neighbor, Texas was not just a dry, arid climate as its residents might have tried to convince outsiders. This part of the state had a miserable heat during the summer, the humidity fed by Gulf currents, and there was nothing about it that Lisa Rayero could admit she liked. Having come from Maine, she didn't like this weather and never had. Although this thought had never occurred to her when joining the Drug Enforcement Administration. Not to mention, she was exhausted from her drive straight through the night. When she got into town, she checked into a hotel about a mile from the Border Patrol office. It wasn't where she planned to start. She actually wanted to get the guy where he lived. She wanted to talk to someone who knew Cepedas better than anyone. It was time to have a woman-to-woman -woman talk with Cepedas' wife. Rajero quickly checked the dossier file and wrote down the street address, then climbed in her rental and started across town. As she drove, the areas got to be nicer and nicer, and pretty soon she was cruising down the shaded lanes embedded between million-dollar homes situated on half-million-dollar landscapes. The place was a veritable paradise in the desert. The people who lived in this area didn't know what dust was. Rajero seriously began to wonder if she'd made a mistake, and then the address she was looking for suddenly hove into view at the top of the small incline. She turned into the drive and was stopped short by a gate. Rayero pressed a button on the small speaker attached to the pole of an adobe-style archway. A clear female voice came through the speaker. Yes? Yes, uh, hi. I'm looking for Ramon Cepedas. I'm sorry he's not here. He's sort of town. You'll have to call again. Um, is this Mrs. Cepedas? Hello? Yes? Mrs. Cepedas, my name is Lisa Rajero, and I'm with the DEA. Listen, I really need to talk to you about your husband. It's important. Please. There was another long silence, and Rajero wondered if she was going to get anywhere. Abruptly, a buzzer sounded, and the gate swung aside. Rajero drove slowly up the driveway. It took her nearly two minutes to reach the house. A servant helped Rayero from her car and escorted her through the front entrance. The foyer was huge, lined with marble trim and some sort of glazed stone floor. Please wait here. Rayero risked a glance into an adjacent room. It looked like a living room or oversized sitting area. Hell, oversized was an understatement. The room alone was almost as big as her whole apartment. Steps led to a second floor near the entrance and Rayero guessed a set of closed oak doors off the foyer probably led to either a study or formal dining room. 
Rayero looked at her watch and realized it was past lunchtime. The servant finally returned and showed Rayero through the living room, a formal breakfast kitchen, and onto a sun porch. The back lawn was scattered with large trees that swayed and cooled the entire green landscape with shade. One entire corner of the yard was occupied by an apple orchard, and the red of the fruit was visible from where Rayero was seated. A moment passed before a dark-haired woman, slender and good-looking, arrived and seated herself across from Rayero. She was actually quite beautiful. Her skin was golden brown, hair and eyes as dark as chocolate, and she was immaculately dressed. The white slacks and pink silk shirt stood out in stark contrast to her almost bronzed skin. Thank you for seeing me, Mrs. Cepedas. You said you have something to tell me about Ramon. Is he dead? Oh, no, nothing like that. I, I wasn't trying to imply that anything bad had happened to him. I hope I didn't frighten you. She waved at Rayero with almost mock indifference. You didn't frighten me. Is he in trouble? What did he do? Rayero shook her head with disbelief. She'd come to interrogate this woman, but it now seemed that she was the one being interrogated. That didn't sit well with Rayero, but she was trying to be patient. She tried to keep Metzger's warnings of false accusations in the back of her mind at all times, and she just remembered forgetting to check in with him upon her arrival at the hotel. Well, she'd call him right after this, and take the ass chewing. She knew he'd dole out to her. What makes you think he's done anything? <laughs> You're kidding me, right? Do you honestly think I believe a U.S. Border Patrol officer can afford all of this? I may be from the ghettos of New York, Agent Rajero, but I'm not an idiot. You can call me Lisa. I'm Carmen. You said your husband was out of town. Yes. You have no idea where he went? Some sort of operation. Ramon doesn't discuss his every move with me, and especially not when it has to do with work. I worry about him, but I'm a good and faithful wife. I've never cheated on him, never been unfaithful in any way. He's always kept us well, been good to his kids. She paused, shook her head, then lit a cigarette. <sighs> he really is a good man, Lisa. He's just into something bad, and I'm afraid if he doesn't get out of his soon, that I'm going to lose him altogether. Rajero couldn't help but feel a pang of guilt for Carmen's sake. But she had a job to do, and couldn't let personal feelings get in the way. It always saddened Rajero when she saw families torn apart by drugs. She'd seen this kind of thing in the slums of Philadelphia and the poor parts of Los Angeles. She'd seen junkies waste away on the crap pushed by neighborhood bullies. The same bullies who hung out in schoolyards and extorted local businesses. They got business people hooked on cocaine, teenagers on methamphetamines, and hookers on heroin. They perverted, ordinarily, good people. I don't know what he's into, Carmen, if he's into anything at all. But now that you mention it, there are some suspicions and rumors floating around. On your ear to check them out. Yes, but I'm also here to help you if you'll let me. I'll be honest and admit that I'm very suspicious of your husband. However, I would like nothing better than to be able to clear him of any wrongdoing. Believe me, it would be much easier to say I was wrong than to find out I wasn't and have to arrest another cop. For a long time, Carmen Cepedas just stared at Rayero. The DEA agent was beginning to wonder if maybe she'd made a mistake and the woman was just going to toss her out on her ear. She wanted Carmen to be on her side, and despite what she'd told Metzger, she wanted, yes, really wanted, to believe that Ramon Sapedas was innocent. She didn't derive pleasure from uncovering the sins of fellow law officers. She just had a talent for it. That wasn't something for which she would ever feel the need to apologize. What is it you think my husband has done? Well, we're not sure, but we think he might have ties with a man named Jose Carrillo. Have you heard of him? I know of this man. He's a drug dealer. My husband may be a lot of things, but he does not deal drugs. Well, I'm afraid we already have evidence to the contrary. My husband hates drugs. Does he hate his lifestyle, too? Does he hate his fancy house and nice cars? Does he hate providing a decent life for you and sending his children to the best private schools? <sighs> he's always telling me that his parents give him money. His father is dead and his mother is an invalid in a nursing home. I know that. He told me he's already received a portion of his inheritance. 
He deposits a check every six months that is sent to him by his parents' attorney. Come on, Carmen. There's got to be something else. Carmen fell silent, and the tears began to run down her cheeks. It occurred to Rajero as she stopped berating the woman that Carmen realized it was the truth. The facts were what they were, and nobody could dispute them. Ramon Sapedas was obviously getting money from somewhere, lying to his family about the source of the income, and then living like a king in the sight of God and country. It was actually quite a bold and brash move on the part of the Border Patrol chief. The hardest thing for Cepedas' wife to admit was that the guy really was doing something crooked, even if she'd suspected it. She'd obviously grown accustomed to enjoying the things in life he had to offer and not questioning him about it. Who knew how long Cepedas had been working for Carrillo? But Belasco had mentioned at one point he thought it was some time, and Rayero had to agree. The file indicated Sapedas's family had lived at this address for some time, and his kids attended various schools in the same area. One was even going to college next year, and Sapedas had worked his way through the ranks of the El Paso office, so it wasn't as if he'd transferred into his position there. That was strange in and of itself. Normally, when a federal law officer was promoted, he was transferred to another office. The greatest reason for this was that leaders were less effective if they were appointed to command those people who had once been peers and associates. There tended to be politics, favoritism, and a sort of cliquish environment that took hold of the administration. This caused hard feelings and unrest among those commanded, so a promoted officer was usually sent somewhere else immediately to discourage anything like that among local officers. Cepedas had somehow managed to avoid that process, and Rayero guessed it was due to Carrillo's influence. Listen, Carmen, it's like I've already told you. I'm not looking to put your husband in jail. I want to help clear his name. But I make no bones about this when I say that if he is involved with Jose Carrillo, I'm going to make it my personal business to put him in jail. I think it's time you should go, Agent Rayero. I'm a God-fearing woman, despite what you may think of me or my husband, and I don't want to say anything else. If you feel Ramon has done something awful or broken the law in some way, I welcome you. No, I challenge you to prove it. But for the time being, I think you should go. Carmen nodded, then crushed her cigarette out and stood. Senora? The two women turned to see the servant. Yes, what is it, Raul? Senora Zapera's just telephoned to let you know he was back in town. He says he is bringing a guest to stay the night. He has asked you to prepare for his homecoming. A hard edge suddenly came to Carmen's eyes. Thank you, Raul. As I said, I think it is time for you to go. Until you have proof of wrongdoing on the part of my husband, I have nothing more to say to you, and I will not help you. If you believe that Ramon has done something wrong, then bring the proof back to me. If it is solid enough, I will help you in whatever way I can. I will help you. Not for your sake, or Ramon's, or even mine. I will help you for the sake of my children. I understand. I'll bring you proof. You do that. Now get out of my house. Rajero knew it was no time to argue. She surely didn't want to get caught in the crossfire when Cepedas arrived, although she was intrigued by the announcement he was bringing company. Rajero entertained the idea just for a moment that it was Jose Carrillo, but Rayero knew the drug lord wouldn't dare risk coming to the United States quite so boldly after his little run-in with the American justice system in Houston. Lee Teng Hawk waited in the van with several of his best troops. The Chinese Special Forces commander was not only one of Deng Jiquan's most trusted officers, but also his only nephew. His orders had been quite clear. They were to locate the U.S. Border Patrol agent working for Jose Carrillo, and then they were to eliminate him. While Ten Hock never questioned orders, he knew these weren't coming directly from his uncle. Ten Hock assumed this mission was either the work of their new American ally or at the request of one of the triad leaders. The idea of using professional soldiers to further the aims of a criminal organization did nothing short of sicken Ten Hock. But then it didn't matter what he thought, because his job was to follow orders, and that's what he would do. It didn't mean he had to agree with it, though, and he considered speaking to his uncle upon completion of his mission. Nothing had really happened thus far. The house had been quiet that morning, and Teng Hock wanted nothing more than to be active. They were soldiers, 
and it shouldn't have been their job to watch the house and wait for their target to return. Tang Hawk had no idea who their target was. He didn't have a name, just the glossy black and white photograph of the man in a U.S. Border Patrol uniform. Thus far, statistical analysis run on the house didn't reveal anything out of the ordinary. Their van was parked in the drive of another house a few doors down. The vehicle looked like one of the local telephone company vans, so they wouldn't look a bit out of the ordinary parked where they were. They were watching the house through side mirrors. Getting in and out wouldn't be a problem. It was a standard security system. His commandos would penetrate the perimeter of the house, accomplish their mission, get out, and be practically out of El Paso by the time American police arrived. Then they would return to Florida, and perhaps finally be sent back to Beijing where they belonged. He desperately wanted to get home and see his wife. He didn't like America. He didn't like running military operations in America. It was beneath him to creep around peaceful neighborhoods and kill unarmed civilians like some hoodlum. Yes, he would have to speak with Deng. The car that had arrived earlier with a lone female occupant was now leaving, probably a visitor to the target's spouse. When they had completed their job here, Jik Wan had ordered them to find the border patrol officer's children and take care of them as well. But on that point, Teng Hock had adamantly refused. He did not condone the murder of children unless it was in a gross military action where there were acceptable losses. Surprisingly, Jik Wan didn't argue the point with him. What he didn't know was that his refusal would prompt the Kung Lok Triad to send Scarlet Dragons to El Paso. The dragons were nothing more than gangsters in Tang Hock's way of thinking. They killed without remorse, committed warring acts without honor, and carried themselves without the slightest bit of dignity. Tang Hock hoped he didn't encounter them while on this mission. He might not have been able to refrain himself from shooting each and every one of them dead. Tang Hock's driver and second in command suddenly sat up straight. There is a car coming. Hmm, I see it. No, another one. And he's slowing down. Tang Hock turned his attention from the woman in the sedan waiting for the gate to open and looked in the direction of his lieutenant. The sapphire blue sports car was definitely slowing. Two men rode in it. The one behind the wheel was a Mexican native, but he didn't match the description of the man they were looking for. The passenger was a completely different story. It took Tang Hock only a moment to realize that the man was coming right into their laps. Hey, Jim, you ready? It had been murder sitting inside that van without air conditioning. At least they had been allowed to keep the windows down, but his men were bordering on heat exhaustion. Well, Tang Hock knew it would be easy now. We will have to kill the woman? Yes, we cannot have any witnesses. We cannot be seen by anyone. We will not make our move until the gate is open. If we can get behind our target's car after the woman is gone, that will be as well. But I do not think that is a realistic expectation. Understood. The sports car started to turn into the drive and nearly ran into the sedan. The woman raised her hands and apologized, and the driver moved the sports vehicle over just a few feet to allow her to pass. Tang Hock watched patiently as both of the men in the sports car watched her drive past. The driver suddenly stuck his hand out the window, and there was a pistol in it. The woman saw the weapon and ducked in her seat. The driver stopped the sports car. He said something to the passenger, and the look on the man's face was one of complete surprise. They both stood up in the seat of the sports car and were taking aim at the woman's sedan. They were apparently going to riddle the vehicle with gunfire. Teng Hawk didn't care if they killed the woman, but this had provided a great distraction. It would be very easy to eliminate their target. We move, now! Teng Hawk and his commandos exited the back of the van. The two men were just taking up firing positions and ready to destroy the woman when Tang Hock's men moved toward the position in pairs, approaching in a fire and maneuver pattern until they were sufficiently close to implement their operation. Just as the men in the sports car opened fire, Tang Hock felt heat that licked at his urban camouflage. He turned in time to see their van erupt into a fireball. The two gunmen downrange stopped shooting and turned to see Tang Hawk's forces approaching their vehicle. Most of the commandos had hit the ground upon hearing the explosion, so none was in an effective position to fire on the sports car. The driver put the vehicle in gear and spun the tires, screaming up the drive and disappearing into the trees that surrounded the house. Look at the van! We stormed the mansion! The soldiers started to move out, but a new enemy had arrived, emerging from the hedges like a black-garbed titan. 
the newcomer was dressed in a skin-tight black suit and toted an M16 A2 M203. Kill him! Kill him! The leader of the Chinese commando unit dived for cover. The soldiers were now a little confused at the appearance of a new combatant. They had last understood their orders to be the execution of a border patrol officer and his wife. Now they were faced with an adversary carrying automatic weapons and grenade launchers. Something didn't make sense about that. The aggressor used the delay to his advantage. He pulled the woman from her car and disappeared up the driveway before the gate could close. He also took a moment to trigger a few hasty rounds at the Chinese commando. And Ten Hock knew that this probably hadn't been something foreseen by his superiors. This was just a damnable coincidence. And now he had two problems on his hands. Teng Hock refused to leave the area without accomplishing his mission, and he planned to make sure that his men didn't either. Forward! Over the wall! The commandos immediately complied, moving forward and scaling the seven-foot wall surrounding the property with practiced ease. Teng Hock decided to join them rather than wait. Their only means of transportation was destroyed, so perhaps escape in the two sedans would be possible. This would also allow them to split up. Teng Hock was furious and saddened simultaneously as his best soldier had died in the van. Only six remained, and that wasn't acceptable. He tried to swallow back his rage, knowing it couldn't get the better of him or he would be dead as well. Yes, he would accomplish his mission first and kill the targets assigned him. The execution of the stranger and the woman would be sheer pleasure, and Teng Hock would do everything in his power to make sure he got to make the kill personally. The executioner was at war. After demolishing the drugs in Calexico and rendering the resistance there ineffective, Bowen had contacted Stony Man. They arranged transportation on a small military jet, utilized by the commander of San Diego Air Station, to fly Bowen to El Paso. The executioner knew with the drugs destroyed, it was the only logical place for Zapatas to go. From there, he would probably try to contact Carrillo, so it was vital Bowen get there first. The soldier had seen all of the players as they moved into position like pieces on a chessboard. First there was the arrival of the van, probably loaded with FARC soldiers or maybe reinforcements. Then the half dozen passes performed by some Mexican gangbanger lookalikes who were probably spies for Carrillo. By now news of the destruction of the shipment had probably reached the drug kingpin and he might possibly have sent some of his own men to terminate the relationship with Zapatas. Then the last person Bolin had hoped to see, Lisa Rayado. She'd arrived just a few minutes before 1300 hours, and that wasn't good. The executioner knew timing was everything, and he had no idea what Rayero was doing here. Maybe she had come to talk to Cepedas, but Bolin wasn't betting on it. The woman was too smart for that. She'd find a way to take the secondary route, and probably had come to appeal to the better senses of Cepedas' wife. Whatever the reason, Bolin could only hope to hell she got in and out before the trouble started. But nothing could be that easy, and Bolin knew it was time to make his move when the trouble went down in Cepedas' driveway. The executioner had fired the grenade from nearly 150 yards away, then broke cover from his observation post in a tree above the property fence line he'd climbed before daybreak. He'd moved along the perimeter of the wall, using the shrubbery for cover, and extracted Rogero from her car just before the fireworks began. Bolin now shoved her up the driveway and left it for the cover of a large grove. What are you doing here? I should ask you that. You told me to find out about Cepeda's... Yeah, but I didn't expect you'd come knock on his door for the answer. Uh, look, Belasco, I... This is no time for conversation. Get up to the house and find Cepeda's. Try to take him alive. What are you going to do? Never mind that now. Move! Bolin turned and entered the thickest part of the trees as the first movements of the soldiers appeared. Based on their movements and dress, Bolin was guessing these were probably Chinese special forces. They weren't Scarlet Dragons, and they damn sure didn't work for Nevas or Carrillo. That left Chinese military types, and Bolin was betting their orders had come straight from Deng Jikwan. That meant they wouldn't stop until he was dead, or they had come to accomplish whatever they'd been sent to accomplish. The executioner was planning to make sure neither one of those things happened. <laughs> Bolin vaulted into a tree, positioned himself so he was obscured by the foliage, but had a perfect view of the immediate landscape, and then sighted on his first target. The M16 M203 wasn't the ideal weapon for snipering, 
but it would have to do. Boland had acquired this variant from Kissinger with the hardball ammunition known by NATO as the SS-109. It had better accuracy, a greater maximum effective range, and was nearly twice as accurate as its predecessor, the M109 standard. Boland knew he couldn't put down any sustained fields of fire, or they would detect him. He let fly with the first round. The 5.56 millimeter NATO slug left the barrel of the M16A2 at a velocity of 950 meters per second. Boland lifted his cheek from the stock and watched a moment. The guy recovered and rose behind the cover of heavy bushes nearby. His enemy was wearing body armor. The executioner realized he couldn't take them from a distance. He'd have to get closer, engage his opponents one-on-one. -on -one. That wasn't going to be easy, but it was the only way to ensure success. Boland changed positions, moving from one tree to another while his target recovered. He could at least attempt to snipe a few of them before trying CQB tactics. That would keep their heads down and put them on edge. Cautious soldiers were more dangerous, sure, but they could also be affected psychologically by sniper attacks. The warrior lined up the rifle again, this time waiting for a clean headshot. He finally got a commando who poked his head over a tree trunk. Bolin settled the pinpoint sight post on the man's cheek, adjusted the height by tenths of an inch, then squeezed the trigger. The bullet landed right on target tearing off the commando's jaw. His weapon flew from numbed fingers, and he dropped from sight behind the bush. Bolin was already panning the area with his rifle. Chichi! Bolin recognized the shout as being Chinese. It confirmed the ethnic origin of his enemy, but it still didn't tie together their whole purpose for being here. This didn't make a bit of sense, and the executioner knew he now had more questions than answers. If Jik Wan was behind this, and these weren't mercenary types hired by Mai or Shui. It didn't make any sense for them to be after Sepedas. The guy was just a pawn in a much larger game, yet it seemed he was still their target. Unless the Chinese had something else planned, or possessed some piece of intelligence the executioner didn't. Still, Bolin wasn't going to concern himself with anything more at this point than survival. He rallied every combat instinct and soon found his second target. The guy was trying to crawl through the underbrush, but he was unaware he was making enough noise that it was audible by the man who lay on a thick tree branch directly above him. The executioner simply lowered the muzzle of the M16A2, steadied it, and squeezed the trigger. Several rounds of auto fire zipped over his head, and the executioner knew he no longer had the advantage. He dropped to the ground and rolled out of the fall heading into another thicket of trees and angling back toward the wall to try a flanking maneuver. He came up to the wall, then moved along its edge until he found the driveway. Bolin quickly crossed the open expanse, continuing along the other side until he had an uphill view of the entire estate. Only a minute passed before Bolin spotted two more commandos as they converged on the southwest corner of the mansion. The executioner raised his rifle, took careful aim and waited until they stopped. The pair halted at a tree, keeping it between them and the front of the house, completely unaware that Bolin had them dead to rights. He waited another few seconds, and just before they started to move, he squeezed the trigger. The second commando got lucky, jumping back and taking the SS-109 hardball slug in the side instead of the forehead. The round knocked him down, and he managed to get behind the tree before Bolin could follow up with another shot. The executioner sprinted for a large stone block hewed into a rectangle. As he dived behind it, he could see it was actually a decorative planter. From that position, he had excellent cover, but he still couldn't see his opposition. Bolin wondered if they had split their forces and were now heading for the house. He was only a secondary target. Real professionals wouldn't be deterred from their goal, and the soldier was beginning to wonder if this game of cat and mouse was really what he was playing. If he got his numbers correctly, there were seven of these guys. He'd scratch three, which meant four remained in the game. One was behind the tree, and Bolin doubted he could move from that position without being seen. That meant there were still three others who could be headed for the house. He knew that neither Cepedas nor Rajero was any match for hardened combat veterans. They weren't trained for that kind of fight, and they weren't armed for it. Bolin cursed himself for having sent Rayero out of the frying pan and into the fire. Now he was pinned down, having pinned down his enemy, and there was no way out of it. 
he'd have to take the Chinese commando before moving to the house and engaging the remaining opposition. The executioner turned just in time to see one of the commandos rushing him, a pistol in his hand. The guy was going to shoot him at point-blank range, but Bolin had other ideas. He swung the stock of the M16A2 in an arc and clipped the guy's wrist. The weapon was jarred from his grip. His would-be assailant never missed a step as he yanked a combat knife from his webbing and leaped on Bolin. The warrior grabbed the Chinese commando's left wrist with both hands, then maneuvered his body so he was on his right side. He twisted away from him and forced the knife blade away from his throat. The executioner was much larger than his opponent, but the man was wiry, deaf, and surprisingly strong. The commando managed to ram a knee into Bolin's thigh. <coughs> Bolin ignored the numbing pain in his thigh and pushed forward even harder on his adversary's wrists. <coughs> he swung into a kneeling position, lodging one knee at a point between the man's armpit and shoulder joint. He kept his right hand on the fractured wrist and wrapped the left around the man's throat. Bolin squeezed the guy's throat and watched as his eyes began to bulge. Something rough caught the side of his face, scraping skin from his jaw and cheekbone. The impact from the sole of his opponent's boot was enough to daze the soldier, and he relaxed his grip on the commando's throat. It was nothing more than a distraction, but enough for the man to escape certain death. Bolin rolled away as the guy sprang to his feet and tried to launch a sidekick to his head. This one intended to crack his skull. The soldier spun and landed a leg sweep at just the right moment. His enemy's balance was good enough to keep him upright, but not so good the sweep didn't have an effect. It was all the time the executioner needed. He saw the knife had been dropped in the grass, the oily blade gleaming in the sun. It lay there forgotten by its owner, and Bolin seized the advantage. He jumped forward and latched onto the weapon just as his opponent realized the intent. The Chinese military specialist tried to stop Bolin, but he was a moment too late. Ah! Bolin's first slashing movement caught the enemy's outstretched arm, cutting deep into the skin, ripping through veins and tendons. The man leaped backward, but the distraction proved fatal. The executioner fainted toward the stomach, then sidestepped at the last moment and caught the side of the guy's neck. The man clamped his hands around the gaping wound, trying to stop the spurting blood as it collected beneath his hands and began running down his chest and arms. Bolin quickly and efficiently stepped forward and drove the knife through the base of the commando's neck, severing the spinal nerve. The guy collapsed and died within seconds. Bolin retrieved his M16A2 and sprinted toward the mansion. As soon as he reached the house, he spotted the fire team of three remaining commandos converging on the structure. They shot off the lock on the front door, then tossed smokers through the front windows, followed by a couple of flash-bang grenades. The threesome went through the door like the hardened experts they were. They weren't expecting the executioner to appear behind them. He came through the door under the cover of their own smoke, knelt so he could get better position, and then cut down the first man at the hips. More volleys of automatic fire went over the executioner's head. He rolled out of the foyer and into some sort of living area. He popped a magazine from his weapon, loaded the fresh one, and returned the auto fire with a corkscrew pattern burst of his own. The rounds didn't hit either of the remaining pair, but it kept their heads down. Bolin decided it was no time to get creative. He needed to neutralize the remaining commandos and do it quickly before Sapedas got away. The executioner popped in a fresh 40mm HE grenade and locked back the breach. The weapon was primed for action. He stuck the weapon around the corner into the hallway and squeezed the trigger. The explosion rocked the foyer, sending deadly shards of crystal glass and wood fly. Bolin barely retracted the M16A2 in time to avoid losing his hands. The grenade singed hairs as it was and cracked the foregrips of the weapon. Bolin rolled from his position with his back against the wall and readied himself for opposition. A large scorch mark and what looked like human remains were burned into a stairwell. A fire had started. Bolin climbed to his feet and began to search the lower level. He knew that Cepedas and whoever had been with him were probably still on the grounds, and it was time to either find the last of his enemy and put them down or get out while he could before the police arrived. He could no longer afford detainment by law enforcement. It was time to finish the job he'd started. He tossed aside the M16A2, unable to trust the fact it was still safe, and drew his 44 Magnum Desert Eagle. The executioner moved off in search of his enemy. Lisa Rayera was upstairs. 
Despite the firing below, she continued to search each room carefully, her Glock 19 held at the ready. She was a little angry with Velasco. For the second time in a row, he'd abandoned Rayero to her own devices. It wasn't that she couldn't function without him, but it seemed that when she needed him the most, he would up and disappear on her. Fortunately, she recognized Cepedas and the man with him, Conrado Diaz. Diaz was well known to DEA officers all over the country. He was Jose Carrillo's chief enforcer and wanted in connection with at least a dozen murders of DEA agents. Now she was close to getting him, and she had no idea where they were hiding or if they were even in the house. The arrival of the Asians wearing body armor and combat fatigues had been a surprise as well. Yeah, things exploded quickly and violently in Velasco's world. She'd probably been maimed, shot at, and nearly incinerated more times in the past week than in her entire career. She also couldn't help but wonder about Carmen Cepedas. There was no question now Ramon Cepedas was working for Carrillo. The evidence spoke for it. What Rayero didn't want was for Carmen to get caught in the crossfire. She hoped the woman had enough sense to get the hell out while she could. The sound of the closet door rolling aside saved Rayero. She dived away from the noise moments before bullets thudded into the carpeting where she stood. She came up behind the bed and aimed her weapon at her would-be assassin, coming face to face with none other than Carmen Cepedas. What the hell are you still doing here? Trying to stay alive! Get out of here! But this is my home! It's also going to be your gravesite if you don't get out of here! Where is Ramon? I don't know where he is. When I find him, you'll be the first to know about it. Now get out of here! Carmen raised the pistol and pulled back on the hammer. Rajero was completely speechless. She hadn't realized the power of love. Carmen Cepedas obviously loved her husband greatly, so much she would risk jail or death for him. But it would be a senseless death. Cepedas wasn't worth such devotion in Rayero's mind. I asked you a question! Where is my Ramon? I don't know. All I know is he tried to kill me. I do not believe you. I don't care. Carmen, listen to me. You can still walk away from this. You can still go on with your life. There's no reason to die here, not like this. I will be with Ramon! Put it down, lady. Velasco stood in the doorway of the master bedroom, a gleaming desert eagle clutched in his hands. He had the muzzle leveled on Carmen, and there was a look in his eyes that told Rayero he was about to blow her to pieces. At first, Rayero thought she might not stop the guy, but she knew that the woman was an innocent in all of this. She couldn't let Velasco cap her without at least trying to explain the situation. It wasn't fair. The woman had a right to a second chance. She didn't have to die. Velasco, listen. This is Carmen Cepedas, Ramon's wife. She thought I was here to hurt him. So? Olin didn't lower his weapon. He pinned the woman with icy blue eyes. You have any idea what kind of man your husband is, lady? You know how many people he's killed. He's been responsible for the deaths of hundreds. Every dope pusher who unloaded bad junk on a now-dead teenager probably got the stuff through arrangements made by your husband. I don't believe it. Really? You think Rajero came here on a whim? I was the one who first approached him. He lied to me about guns used in multiple drug deals where DEA agents got killed. He was bribed by Jose Carrillo and this alliance he's formed with the Colombian Revolution. All in the name of greed, lady. You still think he's worth saving? Carmen looked down the barrel of the pistol another moment. Then her body began to quiver, and she finally dropped the weapon. Rayero rushed forward and snatched it up catching the woman in the nick of time before she collapsed onto the bed. Carmen's body trembled in Rayero's arms as she wept. Rayero swallowed hard, unable to understand what had caused such a horrific tragedy. Fifteen minutes earlier, this woman was a proud, decent sort. Now she was weeping for the loss and suffering she knew would come about. Rayero knew that Velasco wanted to kill Cepedas, but she warned him off with a pleading look. I want to take him alive, Mike. You owe me that much. I don't owe you anything, Lisa, but I understand what you're saying. You take him alive. Do whatever you think you have to. What about the guy with him? His name is Conrado Diaz. He works directly for Carrillo. I know him well enough to know he's ruthless and dangerous. That's who you really want, Velasco. You need to find him and kill him. He doesn't deserve anything less for all the people he's killed. Many innocent people, not to mention law enforcement officers. You think he'll stick with Cepedas? Not likely. He'll probably make for the border. Try to get word back to Carrillo. Olin nodded, then moved suddenly to a window and looked out onto the property. The police are here. I have to go. 
Why are you worried about the cops? I'm not worried about them. It's just time for me to go. Get her out of here and start combing the place for Sapitas. The guy's hiding somewhere on the grounds. He probably figures it's safer than trying to run. Maybe he can convince the locals he's a victim. Not a chance. They'll find slugs from his gun in my car. And I'm sure there's enough evidence here now to hold him. Good luck. Bolin turned to leave. Hey, soldier. What? Thanks. He nodded and then left the room. And Rajero whispered a silent prayer of good fortune for him. Bolin hit the first floor landing of the back stairwell and looked out a window. El Paso police were arriving in droves, scouring the front lawn and moving along the sides of the property, preparing themselves to do battle. The executioner knew that Cepedas would approach them immediately, but if Rajero was right about this Conrado Diaz, he would try to find a way out the back. Bolin had the same idea, and he hoped he could catch Diaz in the process. Fate or some other luck was shining on Bolin as he exited through the rear patio and quickly spotted movement on the far end of the drive where it terminated in a large outbuilding. Bolin followed the movement in the trees and soon realized it was a man scrambling to find a way over the huge hill that bordered a better part of Cepedas' property. Bolin had already reconnoitered the area before taking up his observation and he knew it better than his quarry. The executioner picked up the pace, moving past the sports car Diaz had driven. The outbuilding was actually a separate garage with several covered bays for vehicles. Most of the spots were empty, but they probably had used them for guests. Cepedas wouldn't get far. Bolin decided not to chase him on foot. Another idea struck him and he returned to the sports car. The keys were in it. Bolin jumped into the seat and keyed the ignition. He put the sports car in a 180 degree turn and gunned the engine tapping to second and then third. Bolin was ready to pop it into fourth by the time he edged around the house and was on the main drive, headed for the exit. The police were taken completely by surprise, and Bolin caught just a glimpse of Carmen and Rayero as he drove past. Weapons came up, but no one got off a shot as the executioner weaved between the unmarked squad and radio cars scattered along the wide driveway. Bolin cleared the front gate whipping the wheel left to avoid the sedan still jammed to one side and the squad car parked immediately in front of them. He turned suddenly, burning rubber as he executed a sharp turn and began climbing the hilly road. Olin was about to put an end to Diaz's run. The guy wasn't going to get far. He started to slow the vehicle when he reached the area that seemed most likely an exit point and Diaz appeared a moment later. The guy's eyes grew wide when he spotted the executioner. A moment later, he grabbed cover behind a parked car and popped a few shots at both. Bringing the sports car to a stop and popping the clutch to kill the engine. Then he was out of the car and moving up the sidewalk on the opposite side. The Desert Eagle up and ready for action. Diaz capped off a couple more hasty shots. The Cadillac Bolin had seen earlier filled with Mexican gang members roared into view. The executioner realized that they posed a real threat as they jumped from the vehicle with automatics in hand. The hoods immediately opened fire, not terribly concerned with hitting Bolin, as much as they were looking to keep him on the move. The soldier found himself forced to apply. The 44 Magnum was no match against the half-dozen machine pistols. Bolin leaped into a thick stand of fern bushes and emerged to face a wall. He climbed to the top to find a monstrous backyard in a ravine below. The place was gigantic, but the fact it was secured in such a cavernous alcove hadn't been visible to the outside eye. The swimming pool was probably a good ten yards below Bolin. He knew he could make the jump, provided the water was deep enough and he would survive the fall. The executioner ducked as several of the nine millimeter rounds buzzed past his head. He aimed the Desert Eagle in the general direction of the hoods and triggered two rounds. The automatics suddenly ceased and Bolin hesitated a split second. He holstered his weapon, then turned and readied for the jump into the pool. Bolin felt a sudden burn of pain in his back, but it wasn't his body toppling forward and landing in the pool that was the last sensation the executioner felt. It was the rush of chlorinated water into his nostrils as darkness overcame him. The heart-stopping action.